Chapter One of Number Seventeen by Lewis Tracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter One The Outcome of Artistic Curiosity. Taxi, sir? Yes, sir. Number Four will be yours. A red-faced, loud-breathing commissioner engaged in the lucrative task of pocketing sixpences as quickly as he could summon cabs, vanished in a swirl of mackintoshes and umbrellas. People who had arrived at the theatre in fine weather were emerging into a drizzle of rain. All London, as the phrase goes, was flocking to see the latest musical comedy at Daly's, but all London, regarded thus collectively, is far from owning motor-cars or even affording taxicabs. So the majority of the playgoers were hurrying on foot towards the tube railways and omnibus routes. Still, a popular light opera could hardly fail to draw many patrons from the upper ranks of society, and in the crush at the main exit, Francis Barold Faden, hesitating whether to walk or wait the hazard of a cab, deemed himself fortunate when a panting commissionaire promised to secure a taxi in half a minute. Automobiles of every known variety were snorting up to the curb and bustling off again as promptly as their users could enter and bestow themselves in dim interiors. Being a considerate person, wishful also to light a cigarette, Thaden moved out of the way. In so doing, he was cannoned against by an impetuous footman, whose cry, Your car, sir, led him to follow the man's alert eyes. He saw a tall, elderly gentleman, with clean-shaven, shrewd, and highly intelligent features of the type which finance or the law or a combination of both, seems to evolve only in big cities, escorting a young lady from the vestibule. Then Thaden remembered that he had noticed this self-same girl's remarkable beauty, as she was silhouetted in white against the dark background of a first-tier box. He had even speculated, idly, as to her identity, and had come to the conclusion, on catching her face in profile, that she must be the daughter of the man seated by her side, but half hidden behind a heavy curtain. The likeness was momentarily lost now, while the two neared him, yet discovered anew when they halted for a second at his elbow. Oddly enough, the man was carrying an umbrella, which he proceeded to open, and his daughter's astonished question put their relationship beyond doubt. Dad she said, with a charming smile in which there was just a hint of a pout. Aren't you coming home with me? No, I think I must look in at the Constitutional Club. It's only a step. I'll take no harm. This sleet looks worse than it is when every drop shines in the glare of so many lamps. Now in with you, Evelyn. Tell Downs to come back, and don't forget which club. Anyhow, I'll tell him myself. "'Shall I wait up for you?' "'Well, uh, I shan't be late. "'I'll be free by the time Downs returns.' "'Number four, taxi,' came a voice, "'and Thaden saw his commissionaire perched on the step of a cab, "'swinging in deftly behind the waiting car. "'The girl, gazing at her father, "'happened to look for an instant at Thaden.' who, fearful lest his candidly admiring glance might have been a trifle too sustained, pretended a hurried interest in an unlighted cigarette. That was all. The three crossed the pavement almost simultaneously. The next moment, the unknown goddess was gone, though Thaden snatched a final glimpse of her, faintly visible, yet no less radiantly lovely, as she leaned forward from the depths of the limousine and waved a white-gloved hand to her father, 
through a window jewelled with raindrops. There was nothing in the incident to provoke a second thought. Assuredly, Frank Thaden, as his friends called him, was not the only man in the vestibule of Daly's Theatre who had found the girl well worth looking at, and it was the mere accident of propinquity which enabled him to overhear the quite commonplace remarks of father and daughter. A score of similar occurrences had probably taken place in the like circumstances that night in London, and the maddest dreamer of fantastic dreams would not have heard the fluttering wings of the spirit of romance in connection with any one of them. It was by no means marvellous, therefore, but rather in obedience to the accepted law of things as they are, when contrasted with things as they might be, if Thaden both failed to attach any importance to that chance meeting, and proceeded forthwith to think of something else. He did not forget it, of course. His artist's eyes had been far too interested in a certain rare quality of delicate femininity in the girl's face and figure, and his ear, too quick to appreciate the music of her cultured voice, that he should not be able to recall such pleasant memories later. Indeed, during those fleeting moments on the threshold of the theatre, he had garnered quite a number of minor impressions, not only of the girl, but of her father. In some respects they were singularly alike. Thus each had the same proud, self-reliant carriage, the same large, brilliant eyes, serene brow and firm mouth, the same repose of manner, the same clear, incisive enunciation. Neither could move in any company, however eclectic, without evoking comment. They held in common that air of refinement and good breeding, which is, or should be, the best marked attribute of an aristocracy. It was impossible to imagine either in rags, but given such a transformation, each would be notable because of the amazing difference that would exist between garb and mien. It must not be imagined that Thaden indulged in this close analysis of the physical characteristics of two complete strangers while his cab was wheeling into the scurry of traffic in Cranburn Street. Rather did he essay, a third time, to light the cigarette which he still held between his lips. And yet a third time was his intent balked. A policeman stopped the eastbound stream of vehicles, somewhat suddenly, at the corner of Charing Cross Road. Owing to the mud, the taxi skidded a few feet beyond the line. A lamp was torn off by a heavy wagon coming south, and a fierce argument between taxi driver and policeman resulted in numbers being demanded for future vengeance. Then Thaden took a hand in the dispute, poured oil on the troubled waters by tipping the policeman half a crown and the driver half a sovereign, these sums being his private estimate of damages to dignity and lamp, and the journey was resumed with a net loss to the person who had absolutely nothing to do with the affair of twelve and sixpence in money and nearly ten minutes in time. Thaden was not rich, as shall be seen in due course, but he was generous and impulsive. He hated the notion of any one suffering for having done him a service, and the taxi man might reasonably be deemed a real benefactor on that sloppy night. So far as he was concerned, the delay of ten minutes was of no consequence. It only meant a slightly deferred snuggling down into an easy chair in his flat with a book and a pipe. That is how he would have expressed himself if questioned on the point. In reality, it influenced and controlled his future in the most vital way, because once the cab had crossed Oxford Street and turned into the quiet thoroughfare on which the first block of Innesmore Mansions abutted, he passed into a new phase of existence. The cigarette, 
lighted at last after the altercation, had filled the cab with smoke to such an extent that Thaden lowered a window. At that moment, the driver was slowing down to take the corner of the even more secluded road, which contained Innismore mansions and the gardens appertaining thereto, and nothing else. Necessarily, Thaden was looking out, and he was very greatly surprised at seeing the unknown gentleman of the theatre walking rapidly round the same corner. He could not be mistaken. The stranger tilted back his umbrella and raised his eyes to ascertain the name of the street, as though he was not quite sure of his whereabouts, and the glare of a lamp fell directly on his clean-cut, almost classical face. Being thus occupied, he did not glance at the passing cab, or recognition might possibly have been mutual, possibly, though not probably, because during that brief pause on the steps of the theatre he stood beside Thaden. Hence he was half turned towards his daughter while they were discussing the night's immediate program. In itself, the fact that he had gone in the direction of Innismore Mansions, rather than toward the Constitutional Club, was in no wise remarkable. Nevertheless, he had deceived his daughter, deceived her intentionally, and the knowledge came as a shock to his unsuspected critic in Thaden. He did not look the sort of man who would stoop to petty evasion of the truth. It was as though a statue of Praxiteles, miraculously gifted with life, should express its emotions, not in Attic Greek, but in the up-to-date slang of the Strand. "'Well, I'm dashed,' said Thaden, or words to that effect." and his cab sped on to the third doorway. Innismore Mansions arranged its roomy flats in blocks of six, and he occupied number eighteen. He held a florin in readiness. The rain, now falling heavily, did not encourage any loitering on the pavement. For all that, he saw, out of the tail of his eye, that the other man was approaching, though he had paused to examine the numbers blazoned on a lamp over the first doorway. "'Good night, sir, and thank you,' said the taxi driver. The cab made off as Thaden ran up a short flight of steps. Innismore Mansions did not boast elevators. The flats were comfortable but not absurdly expensive, and their inmates climbed stairs cheerfully. At most, they had only to mount to a second story. Each block owned a uniformed porter, who, on a night like this, even in May, needed rousing from his lair by a bell, if in demand. Thaden took the stairs to at a stride, opened the door of number 18, which, with number 17, occupied the top landing. He was valeted and cooked for by an ex-sergeant of the Army Service Corps and his wife, an admirable couple named Bates, and the male of the species appeared before Thaden had removed coat and opera hat in the tiny hall. "'Bring my tray in fifteen minutes, Bates, and that will be all for tonight,' said Thaden. "'Yes, sir,' said Bates.' Remarkable change in the weather, sir. Rotten. Who would have expected this downpour after such a fine day? Bates took the coat and hat, and Thaden entered his sitting room, a spacious square apartment which faced the gardens. He had purposely prevented Bates from coming immediately with his nightly fare, which consisted of a glass of milk and a plate of bread and butter. Truth to tell, the artistic temperament contains a spice of curiosity, which is, in some sense, an exercise of the perceptive faculties. Thaden wanted to raise a window and look out, an unusual action, and one which, therefore, would induce Bates to wonder as to its cause. For once in his life, a man who bothered his head very little about other people's business was puzzled 
and meant to ascertain whether or not the unknown was really calling on some resident in Innismore Mansions. It was a harmless bit of espionage. Thaden scarcely knew the names of the other dwellers in his own block, and his acquaintance did not even go that far with any of the remaining tenants of forty-eight flats all told. Still, to a writer, the vagaries of the tall stranger were decidedly interesting. So he did open a window, and did thrust his head out, and was just in time to see the owner of the limousine, which would call at the Constitutional Club in a quarter of an hour, mount the steps leading to numbers 13 to 18. Somehow the discovery gave Thaden a veritable thrill. Could that pretty girl's father by any chance be coming to visit him? A wildly improbable development had been whittled down to a five-to-one chance. He closed the window and waited, yes, actually waited, for the bell to ring. The sitting-room door was open, and it faced the hall door. Footsteps sounded sharply on the slate steps of the stairway. When Thaden heard someone climbing to the topmost landing, he was almost convinced that... As usual, the unexpected was about to happen. It did happen, but took its own peculiar path. The unknown rang the bell of number 17, and after a slight delay, was admitted. Faden smiled at the anticlimax. A trivial mystery had developed along strictly orthodox lines. A rather good-looking and distinctly well-dressed lady, a Mrs. Lester, occupied number 17. She lived alone, too, he believed. At any rate, he had never seen any other person, except an elderly servant, enter or leave the opposite flat, and he had encountered the tenant herself so seldom that he was not quite certain of recognizing her apart from the environment of the staircase, which provided their occasional meeting place. Then he sighed. Romance evidently denied her magic presence to one who wooed her assiduously by his pen. He was yet to learn that the alluring sprite had not only favored him with her attentions during the past twenty minutes, but meant to stick to him like his own shadow for many a day. And he frowned, too. He did not approve of that pretty girl's father visiting the attractive Mrs. Lester in conditions which savored of something underhanded and clandestine. The man had deliberately misled his daughter. He left her with a lie on his lips. Yet never were appearances more deceptive, for the stranger had the outward aspect of one whose word was his bond. "'Oh, dash it all! What business is it of mine, anyhow?' growled Thaden, and he laughed sourly as he sat down to write a letter which Bates could take to the post, thus himself practicing a slight deceit intended solely to account for the deferred bringing of the tray. It was apparently an unimportant missive, which could well have been postponed till the morning, being merely an announcement to a firm of publishers that he would pay a business call later in the week. In less than five minutes, it and another, making an appointment for Wednesday, this being the night of Monday, were written, sealed, directed, and stamped. He rang. Bates came with laden hands, thinking the tray was in demand. Kindly post these for me, said Thaden, glancing at the letters. Better take an umbrella. It's raining cats and dogs. The man had found the door open and left it so when he entered. Before he could answer, the door of number 17 was opened and closed, with the jingle inseparable from the presence of many small panes of glass in leaden casing, and footsteps sounded on the stairs. For some reason probably because of the unusual fact that anyone should be leaving Mrs. Lester's flat at so late an hour, both men listened. Then Bates recollected himself. 
"'Yes, sir,' he said. Oddly enough, the man's marked pause suggested a question to his employer. "'Mrs. Lester's visitor didn't stop long,' was the comment. "'He came up almost on my heels.' "'I thought it must have been a gentleman,' said Bates. "'Why, a gentleman?' laughed Thaden. "'I mean, sir, that the step didn't sound like a lady's.' "'Ah, I see.' Vaguely aware that he had committed himself to a definite knowledge as to the sex of Mrs. Lester's visitor, Thaden added, I didn't actually see anyone on the stairs, but I heard an arrival and jumped to the same conclusion as you, Bates. Tacitly, master and man shared the same opinion. It was satisfactory to know that Mrs. Lester's male visitors, who called at the unconventional hour of 11.30 p.m., were shown out so speedily. Innesmore mansions were intensely respectable. No lady could live there alone whose credentials had not satisfied a sharp-eyed secretary. Further, Thaden was aware of a momentary disloyalty of thought towards the distinguished-looking father of that remarkably handsome girl, and it pleased him to find that he had erred. Bates went out, closing the door behind him. He donned an overcoat, secured an umbrella, and presently descended to the street. Yielding again to impulse, Thaden reopened the window and peered down. The stranger was walking away rapidly. A policeman, glistening in cape and overalls, stood at the corner near a pillar box. The tall man, who topped the burly constable by some inches, halted for a moment to post a letter. Whether by accident or design, he held his umbrella so that the other could not see his face. Then he disappeared. Bates came into view. He dropped Thaden's letters into the box, but he and the policeman exchanged a few words, which his employer guessed must surely have dealt with the vagaries of the weather. For an author of repute, Thaden's surmises had been wide of the mark several times that night. The policeman had seen the unknown coming out from the doorway of numbers 13 to 18, and had noted his stature and appearance. "'Who's the toff who just left your lot?' he said when Bates arrived. "'Dunno,' said Bates. "'Someone calling on Mrs. Lester, I fancy. Why?' "'Oh, nothing. Only, if I was togged up regardless on a night like this, I'd blew a cab fare.' I didn't see him myself, commented Bates. My boss heard him come, and both of us heard him go. He didn't stay more than five minutes. Wish I was in his shoes. I've got to stick round here till six in the morning, grinned the policeman. Well, cheero, mate. Cheero. Bates looked in on his master before retiring for the night. What time shall I call you, sir? he said. Thaden was in the pipe-and-book stage, having exchanged his dress coat for a smoking jacket. He was reading a treatise on aeronautics, and, like every novice, had already formulated a flying scheme which would supersede all known inventions. "'Not later than eight, he said. "'I must be out by nine. "'And, by the way, I may as well tell you now after lunch, tomorrow, I am going to Brooklands. I return to Waterloo at 6.40, and as I have to dine in the West End at 7.30, and my train may be a few minutes behind time, I want you to meet me with a suitcase at the hairdresser's place on the main platform. I'll dress there and go straight to my friend's house. It would be cutting things rather fine if I attempted to come here. I'll have everything ready, sir. Bates was eminently reliable in such matters. He could be depended on to the last stud. The storm which had raged overnight must have cleared the skies for the following day, because they never enjoyed an outing more than his trip to the famous motor track. His business there, however, lay with aviation. 
A popular magazine had commissioned him to write an article summing up the progress and practical aims of the airmen, and he was devoting afternoon and evening to the quest of information. A couple of experts and a photographer had given him plenty of raw material in the open, but he looked forward with special zest to an undisturbed chat that night with Mr. James Creighton Forbes, millionaire and philanthropist, whose peculiar yet forcible theories as to the peaceful conquest of the air were, for the hour, engaging the attention of the world's press. He had never met Mr. Forbes. When, on the point of writing for an appointment, he had luckily remembered that the great man was a lifelong friend of the professor of physics at his, Thaden's, university, and a delightfully cordial introductory note was forthcoming in the course of a couple of posts. This brought the invitation to dinner. On Tuesday evening, I am dining off a me, wrote Mr. Forbes. So, if you are free to join us, come at 7.30, and we can talk uninterruptedly afterwards. The train was not late. Bates, erect and soldierly, was standing at the rendezvous. With him were two men whom Satan had never before seen. One, a bulky, stalwart, florid-faced man of forty, had something of the military aspect. The other supplied his direct antithesis, being small, wizened, and sallow. The big man had a round bullet head, prominent blue eyes, and the cheekbones, chin, and physical development of a heavyweight pugilist. His companion, whose dark and recessed eyes were noticeably bright too, could not be more than half his weight, and Thaden would not have been surprised if told that this diminutive person was a dancing master. Naturally, he classed both as acquaintances of his valet, encountered by chance on the platform at Waterloo. He was slightly astonished, therefore, when the two faced him together with Bates. A dramatic explanation of their presence was soon supplied. These gentlemen, sir, are Chief Inspector Winter and Detective Inspector Furneaux of Scotland Yard, said the ex-sergeant in the awed tone which some people cannot help using when speaking of members of the Criminal Investigation Department. Though daylight had not yet failed, it was rather dark in that corner of the station, and Thaden saw now, what he had not perceived earlier, that the usually sedate Bates was pale and harassed-looking. "'Why, what's up?' he inquired, gazing blankly from one to the other of the ominous pair. "'Haven't you seen the evening papers, Mr. Thaden?' said Winter, the giant of the two. "'No, I've been at Brooklands since two o'clock. But what is it?' "'You don't know, then, that a murder was committed in Innismore Mansions last night or early this morning?' "'Good Lord, no. Who was killed?' "'A uh, Mrs. Lester, the lady—' "'Mrs. Lester, who lives in number seventeen? "'Yes.' "'What a horrible thing! Why, only the day before yesterday I met her on the stairs.' It was a banal statement, and Thaden knew it, but he blurted out the first few crazy words that would serve to cloak the monstrous thought which leaped into his brain, and a picture danced before his mind's eye, a picture not of the fair and gracious woman who had been done to death, but of a sweet-voiced girl in a white satin dress, who was saying to a fine-looking man standing by her side, "'Dad, aren't you coming home with me?' His blurred senses were conscious of the strange medley produced by the familiar noises of a railway station blending with the quietly authoritative voice of the chief inspector. "'Mr. Furneaux and I have the inquiry in hand, Mr. Thaden,' the detective was saying. "'We called at your flat, and Bates told us of the sounds you both heard about 11.30 last night. "'I'm afraid we have rather upset you by coming here. 
but Bates was unable to say what time you would return home, so I thought you would not mind if we accompanied him in order to find out the hour at which it would be convenient for you to meet us at your flat. This evening, of course. You certainly have given me the shock of my life, Thaden gasped. That poor woman, dead, murdered. It's too awful. How was she killed? She was strangled. Oh, this is dreadful. Shall I wire an apology to the man I'm dining with? No need for that, Mr. Thaden, said Winter, sympathetically. I'm sorry now we blurted out our unpleasant news. But you had to be told, and it was essential that we should get your story some time tonight. Can you be home by eleven? Yes, yes, I'll be there, without fail. Thank you. We have a good many inquiries to make in the meantime. Goodbye for the present. The two made off. Winter had done all the talking, but Thaden was far too disturbed to pay heed to the trivial fact that Furneaux, after one swift glance, seemed to regard him as a negligible quantity. It was borne in on him that the detective evidently believed he had something of importance to say, and meant to render it almost impossible that he should escape questioning, while his memory was still active with reference to events of the previous night. And he had so little, yet so much to tell. On his testimony alone, it would be a comparatively easy matter to establish, beyond doubt, the identity of Mrs. Lester's last known visitor, and what would be the outcome. He dared hardly trust his own too lively imagination. Whether or not his testimony gave a clue to the police, the one irrevocable issue was that, somewhere in London, there was a girl named Evelyn who would regard a certain young man, Francis Beryl Thaden, to wit, as a loathsome and despicable Paul Pry. Bates, somewhat relieved by the departure of the emissaries of Scotland Yard, recalled his master's scattered wits to the affairs of the moment. It's getting on for seven, sir, he said. I've engaged a dressing room. Tell you what, Bates, said Thayton abstractedly, it is my fixed belief that you and I could do with a brandy and soda apiece. That would be a good idea, sir. The good idea was duly acted on. While Thaden was dressing, Bates told him what little he knew of the tragedy, which was discovered by Mrs. Lester's maid when she brought a cup of tea to her mistress's bedroom at ten o'clock that morning. Bates himself was the first person appealed to by the distracted woman, and he had the good sense to leave the body and its surroundings untouched until a doctor and the police had been summoned by telephone. Thenceforth, the day had passed in a whirl of excitement, active in respect to police inquiries, and passive in its resistance to newspaper interviewers. He saw no valid reason why his employer's plans should be disturbed, so made no effort to communicate with him at Brooklands. "'Them texts were very pressin', sir,' said Bates, rather indignantly. "'Very pressin', especially the little one. He almost wanted to know what we had for breakfast.' At that, Thaden laughed dolefully. And, as it happened, Bates's grim humor prevented him from ascertaining the exact nature of Furneaux's pertinacity. Moreover, the time was passing. At 7.15, Thaden called a taxi and was carried swiftly to Mr. Forbes's house in Belgravia, while Bates disposed himself and the dressing case on top of a northbound omnibus. The mere change of clothing, aided by the stimulant, had cleared Thaden's faculties. Though he would gladly have foregone the dinner, he realized that it was not a bad thing that he should be forced, as it were, to wrench his thoughts from the nightmare of a crime with which such a man as Evelyn's father might be associated, even innocently. 
At any rate, he was given some hours to marshal his forces for the discussion with the representatives of Scotland Yard. He knew well that he must then face the dilemma boldly. Two courses were open. He could either share Bates's scanty knowledge, no more and no less, or avow his ampler observations. And why should he adopt the first of these alternatives? Was he not bringing himself practically within the law? Why should any man be shielded, no matter what his social position, or how beautiful his daughter, who might possibly have caused the death of the pleasant-mannered and ladylike woman, fated now to remain forever a tragic ghost, in the memory of one who had dwelt under the same roof with her for five months? It was a thorny problem, yet it permitted of only one solution. Duty must be done, though the heavens fell. This conviction grew on Thaden as his cab scurried across the Thames and along birdcage walk. A petty conceit could not be allowed to sweep aside the first principles of citizenship. Indeed, so reassuring was this reasoned judgment that he felt a sense of relief as he paid off the cab and rang the bell of the Forbes mansion. He gave his name to a footman, who disposed of his overcoat and hat, and led him to an upstairs drawing-room. Even the most fleeting glances at hall and staircase revealed evidences of a highly trained artistic taste, gratified by great wealth. The furniture, the china, the pictures, were each and all rare and well-chosen. Mr. Thaden announced the man, throwing wide the door. A lady, bent over some prints spread on a distant table, turned at the words, and hastened to greet the guest. "'My father is expecting you, Mr. Thaden,' she said. "'He was detained rather late in the city, but will be here now at any moment.' Thaden was no neurotic boy, whose surcharged nerves were liable to crack in a crisis, demanding some unusual measure of self-control. Yet the room and its contents, and not least the graceful girl advancing with outstretched hand, swam before his eye, because this was Evelyn, and it was certain, as the succession of night to day, that Mrs. Lester's mysterious visitor must have been Evelyn's father, James Creighton Forbes. End of chapter 1《ハプトゥーオフナンバーセブンティーンバイルウィス・トレイシー》「ディス・リブヴァックス・レコーディング・イズ・イン・ザ・パブリック・ドメイン」「ザ・コンパクト」So petrified was Thaden by coming face to face with the last person breathing whom he expected to meet in that room that he stumbled over a small chair which lay directly between him and his hostess. At any other time The gaucherie would have annoyed him exceedingly. In the existing circumstances, no more fortunate incident could have happened, since it brought Evelyn Forbes herself, unwittingly, to the rescue. I have spoken twenty times about chairs being left in that absurd position, she cried as their hands met. But you know how wooden-headed servants are. They will not learn to discriminate. People often sit at that very place of an afternoon because anyone seated just there sees the canaletto on the opposite wall in the best light. When the lamps are on, the reason for the chair simply ceases to exist, and it becomes a trap for the unwary. You are by no means the first who has been caught in it. Thaden realized with a species of irritation that the girl was discoursing volubly about the offending chair merely in order to extricate an apparently shy and tongue-tied young man from a morass of his own creation. That an author of some note should not only behave like a country bumpkin, but actually seem to need encouragement so that he should feel at home in a London drawing-room, 
was a fact so ridiculous that it spurred his bemused wits into something approaching their normal activity. I have not the excuse of the canaletto, he said, compelling a pleasant smile. But may I plead an even more distracting vision? I came here expecting to meet an elderly gentleman of the class which flippant Americans describe as highbrow, and I am suddenly brought face to face with a Romney portrait of a lady in real life. Is it likely that such an insignificant object as a chair, and a small one at that, would succeed in catching my eye? Evelyn Forbes laughed with a joyous mingling of surprise and relief. Most certainly, Mr. Thaden's manner of speech differed vastly from the disconcerting expression of positive bewilderment, if not actual fright, which marred his entrance. Do I really resemble a Romney? Which one? she cried. An admitted masterpiece. Ah, uh, but people who pay compliments deserve to be put on the rack. I insist on a definition. Lady Hamilton as Joan of Arc. He drew the bow at random and was gratified to see that his hearer was puzzled. I don't know that particular picture, she said, but I cannot imagine any model less adapted to the subject. Romney immortalized the best qualities of both, he answered promptly. Please, may I look at the canaletto which indirectly waylaid me? She turned to cross the room, but stopped, and faced him again with a suddenness that argued an impulsive temperament. Now I remember, she said, Dad told me you had written novels and some essays. Have you ever really seen Romney's portrait of Lady Hamilton as Joan of Arc? Those fine eyes of hers pierced him with a glance of such candid inquiry that he cast pretense to the winds. No, he said. Then you just invented the comparison as an excuse for colliding with the chair? Yes. At the same time, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. It was rather clever of you. He laughed, and their eyes met at very close range. May I share the joke? said a voice, and Thaden knew before he turned that the man he had last seen disappearing around the corner of Innesmore Mansions in a heavy rainstorm was in the room. "'Why did you tell me that Mr. Thaden was a serious scientific person?' cried the girl. "'He is anything but that. He can talk nonsense quite admirably.' "'So can a great many serious scientific persons, Evelyn. "'Glad to see you, Mr. Thaden.' Professor Scarth's letter paved the way for something more than a formal meeting, so I thought you wouldn't mind giving us an evening. My wife is not in town. She is a martyr to hay fever, and has to fly from London to the sea early in May to escape. If caught here in June, nothing can save her. Tonight, as it happens, you're our only guest." but my daughter is going to a musicale at Lady de Winton's after dinner, so you and I will be able to soar into the Empyrean through a blaze of tobacco smoke. Standing there in that delightful drawing-room, made welcome by a man like Forbes, and admitted to a degree of charming intimacy by a girl like Forbes's daughter, Thaden tried to believe that his meeting with these ill-omened detectives at Waterloo Station was in some sort a figment of the imagination. But he was instantly and effectually brought back to a dour sense of reality by Evelyn Forbes' next words. She, by chance, looked at Thaden just as she had looked at him the previous night. "'Were you at Daly's Theatre last night?' she inquired suddenly. "'Yes,' he said. Then, finding there was no help for it, he went on. You and I have hit on the same discovery, Miss Forbes. We three stood together at the exit. 
I was waiting for a taxi and saw you get into your car. Now you know just why I fell over the chair. Forbes glanced up quickly. Don't tell me Tomlinson forgot to move that infernal chair again, he cried. Really, I must get rid either of our butler or of the canaletto, yet I prize both. Don't blame Tomlinson, Dad, laughed the girl. If Mr. Faden hadn't made an unconventional entry, we would have talked about the weather or something equally stupid. At that moment, Tomlinson himself, imperturbable and portly, announced that dinner was served. The three descended the stairs, chatting lightly about the musical comedy witnessed overnight. It was no new revelation to Thaden that truth should prove stranger than fiction, but the trite phrase was fast assuming a fresh and sinister personal significance. He believed, and not without good reason, that no man living had ever undergone an experience comparable with his present adventure. When he left that house, he was going straight to two officers of the law, whose bounden duty it would be to call upon Mr. Forbes for a full and true explanation of his visit to Mrs. Lester, provided, that is, he, Thaden, told them what he knew. Talk about a death's head grinning at a feast. At that bright dinner table, he was prey to keener emotion than ever shook a Borgia entertaining one whom he meant to poison. In sheer self-defense, he talked with an animation he seldom displayed. Evelyn was evidently much taken by him, and, fired by her manifest interest, he indulged in fantastic paradox and wild flights of fancy. Seemingly, his exuberance stimulated Forbes, himself a well-informed and epigrammatic talker. An hour sped all too soon. The girl rose with a sigh. "'It's too bad that I should have to go,' she said. "'I shall be bored stiff at Lady de Winton's, but I can't get out of it, except by telling a positive fib over the telephone. Dad, next time you ask Mr. Thaden to dinner, please let me know in good time, and neither of you will be rid of me so easily.' She shook hands with Thaden. While she was giving her father a parting kiss, the guest moved to the door and held it open. As she passed out, she smiled and her eyes said plainly, I like you, come again soon. Then she was gone, and the pleasant room lost some of its glow and color. Don't sit down again, Faden, said Forbes, rising. We'll have coffee brought to my den. What is your favorite liqueur? Or shall we tell Tomlinson to send along that decanter of port? It's a first-rate wine. Another glass won't hurt you, or me, for that matter. Thaden had hardly dared to touch the champagne supplied during the meal. Abstemious at all times, because he found that wine or spirits interfered with his capacity for work, he felt that a clear head and steady nerves were called for that night more than any other night in his life. Following the lead given by his host, therefore, he elected for the port. "'You are right, too,' said Forbes. "'You remember Dr. Johnson's dictum, "'Claret is the liquor for boys, port for men, "'but he who aspires to be a hero must drink brandy. "'Tonight, not aspiring to the heroic, will stick to port.' It is a curious fact that on my return from Brooklands today, I took a glass of brandy, confessed Thaden. I seldom, if ever, drink any intoxicant before dining, but I needed a stimulant of a sort, and some unknown tissue in me cried aloud for brandy. He hoped, vaguely, that the comment would lead to something more explicit, and thus bring him without undue emphasis, so to speak, to the one topic on which he was now resolved to obtain a decisive statement from the man chiefly concerned, 
before he faced the representatives of Scotland Yard. But Forbes, motioning to an easy chair in a well-appointed library and flinging himself into another, gave heed only to the one word, Brooklands. Did you fly? he asked. No, I was soaking in theory, not practice. Ah, theory. It would indeed seem to be true that, folded away in some convolution of our brains, are the faculties of the fish and the bird. Those latent powers are expanding daily. The submarine has already gone far beyond the practical achievement of aerial craft. But why, in the name of humanity, should every such development of man's almost immeasurable resources be dedicated to warlike purposes? I am sick at heart when I hear the first question put in these days to each inventor. Can you enable us to kill more of our fellow men than we can kill with existing appliances? Is it a new engine, a new amalgam of metals, a new explosive, a new field of electrical energy? One hears the same vultures cry. How many, how far, how safely can we slay? I regard this lust for destruction as contemptible. It is a strange and ignominious feature of modern life. Forgive me, Mr. Thaden, if I speak strongly on this matter. The men who spread the bounds of science today are, nominally at any rate, Christians. They tell of peace and goodwill to all, yet prepare unceasingly for some awful Armageddon. Footnote. This story was written before the outbreak of war in 1914. We teach Christ's gospel in pulpit and schoolhouse, strive to express it in our laws, obey it in our lives and social relations, yet we are armed to the teeth and ever arming, adding strength to the plates of our warships and distance to the range of our guns, constantly riveting and welding and forging monsters which shall shatter men and cities and states. It was not the younger man now who talked brilliantly and forcibly, Thaden frankly abandoning the effort to twist the conversation to that enigma which the more he saw and heard of Forbes, the more incredible it became, listened, enthralled, to one who spoke with the conviction of an earnest prophet. Don't imagine that I am framing an indictment against Christianity, went on Forbes passionately. The Sermon on the Mount inspires all that is great and noble in our everyday existence, all that is eternally beautiful in our dreams of the future. But why this din of war, this smoke of arsenals, this marching and drilling of the world's youth? Nature's law appears to have two simple clauses. It enforces a principle in the struggle for existence, a test in the survival of the fittest. Great heavens, are these not enough without having our ears deafened by powder and drumming? That is why I am devoting a good deal of time and no small amount of money to an international crusade against the warlike idea and I see no reason why a beginning should not be made with the airship and the airplane. We are too late with the submarine, but before the golden hour passes, let us stop the navigation of the air from forming part of the equipment of murder. Surely it can be done. England and the United States, Italy, France, and the rest of Europe, the founts of civilization, can write the edict, with all the blazonry of their glorious histories to illuminate the page, there shall be no war in the air. Thaden was carried away in spite of himself. You believe that the airship might develop along the unemotional lines of the parcel post? he inquired. Forbes laughed. Exactly, he said. I like your simile. 
No one suggests that we Britons should endeavour to destroy our hated rivals by sending bombs through the mails. Why, then, in the name of common sense, should the first, I might say the only, use of which the airship is commonly supposed capable, be that of destruction? Don't you see the instant result of a war-limiting ordinance of the kind I advocate? Suppose the peoples and the rulers declared in their wisdom that soldiers and war material should be contraband of the air. And suppose that airships do become vehicles of practical utility. What a farce would soon be all the grim fortresses, the guns, the giant steel structures, now designed as floating hells. Humanity has yet time to declare that the flying machine shall be as harmless and serviceable as the penny post. I believe it can be done. Come now, Mr. Thaden, I think you've caught on to my scheme. Will you help? Help! Here was a man expounding a new evangel, which might indeed be visionary and impractical, but was nonetheless essentially noble and Christian in spirit. Yet Thaden was debating whether or not he should give testimony which would bring to that very room a couple of detectives whose first questions would make clear to Forbes that he was suspected of blood guiltiness. The notion was so utterly repellent that Thaden sighed deeply. His host not unnaturally looked surprised. Of course, such a revolutionary idea strikes you as outside the pale of common sense, he began, but the younger man stayed him with a gesture. Here was an opportunity that must not be allowed to pass. No matter what the cost, if he never saw Evelyn Forbes or her father again, he must dispel the waking nightmare which held him in such an abnormal condition of uncertainty and foreboding. Now that your daughter is gone, I may venture to speak plainly, he said. I told you that I felt the need of a brandy and soda at Waterloo. As a matter of fact, I did not leave the Brooklands track until six o'clock, and as Innismore Mansions, where I live, lie north, and I was due here at 7.30, I had my man meet me at the station with a suitcase, meaning to change my clothes in the dressing-room there and come straight here. Guess my astonishment when I found Bates, Bates is the name of my factotum, in the company of two strangers whom he introduced as representing the Criminal Investigation Department. He paused. He had brought in his own address skillfully enough and kept his voice sufficiently under control that no tremor betrayed a knowledge of Forbes's vital interest in any mention of that one block of flats among the multitude. Now, for the first time, it is more mansions figured as his abode, the correspondence which led to the dinner having centered in his club. But not a flicker of eyelid nor twitch of mobile lips showed the slightest concern on Forbes's part. Rather did he display at once a well-bred astonishment on hearing Thaden's concluding words. "'Do you mean detectives from Scotland Yard?' he cried. "'Yes.' Forbes smiled and commenced filling a pipe. "'Evidently they did not want you as a principal,' he said. His tone was genial but slightly guarded. Thaden realized that this man of great wealth and high social position had reminded himself that his guest, though armed with the best of credentials, was quite unknown to him otherwise, and that perhaps he had acted unwisely in inviting a stranger to his house without making some preliminary inquiry. The reversal of their roles was a conceit so ludicrous that Thaden smiled, too. At any rate, he meant now to pursue an unpleasing task, and have done with it. No, he said slowly, 
It seems that I am the worst sort of witness in a murder case. I may have heard, I may even have seen, the person suspected of committing the crime, or, if that is going too far, the person whom the police have good reason to regard as the last who saw the poor victim alive and in ordinary conditions. But my testimony, such as it is, is so slight and inconclusive that, of itself, no one could hang a cat on it. Good gracious, that sounds interesting. Though you have my sympathy, it must be rather distressing to be mixed up in such an affair, even indirectly. Forbes struck precisely the right note of friendly inquiry. He wished to hear more, and was at the same time relieved to find that Professor Scarth had not introduced a notorious malefactor in the guise of a young writer seeking material for an article on airships. Thaden could have laughed aloud at this comedy of errors, but the fact that, at any moment, it might develop into a tragedy exercised a wholesome restraint. I happen to live at number 18 in his more mansions, he said. Opposite, on the same floor, I mean, lives, or did live, a Mrs. Lester. I did not... Are you telling me that a Mrs. Lester of number 17 in his more mansions is dead? Has been murdered? Forbes's voice rang out vibrant, incisive. His ordinarily pale face had blanched, and his deep-set eyes blazed with the fire of some fierce emotion. But beyond the slight elevation of tone and the change of expression, he revealed to Thaden's quietly watchful scrutiny no sign of the terror or distress which an evildoer might be expected to show on learning that the law's vengeance was already shadowing him even in so remote a way as was indicated by the presence under his roof of a witness regarded by the police as an important one. Yes, stammered Thaden, quite taken aback by his companion's vehemence. Do you know the lady? If so, I, I am sorry. I spoke so unguardedly. Good heavens, man, don't apologize for that. I am not a child or weakling that I should flinch in horror from one of life's dramatic surprises. But are you sure of what you are saying? Mrs. Lester murdered? When? About midnight last night, the doctor believes. That is what Bates told me. I was so shaken on hearing the news, which was confirmed by the two detectives, that I really gave little heed to details. She was strangled, a peculiarly atrocious thing, where an attractive and ladylike woman is concerned. I have never spoken to her, but have met her at odd times on the stairs. I was immeasurably shocked, I assure you. In fact, I was on the point of telegraphing an excuse to you for this evening, but the chief inspector, Winter, I think his name is, said it would suffice for his purpose if I met him at my flat about eleven o'clock, as he was engaged on other inquiries which would occupy the intervening hours. But if the news of this dastardly crime only reached you tonight at Waterloo Station, and you have no personal acquaintance with Mrs. Lester, what evidence can you give that will assist the police? Mrs. Lester received a visitor last night, an incident so unusual that I, who heard him arrive, and Bates, who was in my sitting-room when we both heard him depart, commented on the strangeness of it. That, I suppose, is the reason why I am in request by Scotland Yard. You say him? How did you know it was a man? Did you see him? Er, uh, that was impossible— we were in my flat, behind its closed door. Bates and I deduced his sex from the sound of his footsteps. Again, Thaden nearly stammered. 
Events had certainly turned in the most amazing way. Instead of carrying himself almost in the manner of a judge, he was figuring rather as an unwilling witness in the hands of a skilled and merciless cross-examining counsel. Did the police officers supply any theory of motive for the crime? Was this poor woman killed for the sake of her few trinkets? By this time, Thaden was stung into a species of revolt. It was he, not Forbes, who should be snapping out searching questions. I regret to say that my nerves were not sufficiently under control at Waterloo that I should listen carefully to each word, he said almost stiffly. Bates had picked up such information as was available, but he, though an ex-sergeant in the army, was so upset as to be hardly coherent. When I meet the detectives in the course of another hour, I shall probably gather something definite and reliable in the way of details. Forbes laid the pipe, which he had filled but not lighted, on the table. He poured out a glass of port and drank it. Try that, he said, pushing the decanter toward Thaden. They cannot trouble you greatly. You have so little to tell. No, thanks. Nothing more for me tonight, until the Scotland Yard men have cleared out. Forbes rose as he spoke and strode the length of the room and back with the air of a man debating some weighty and difficult point. Mr. Thaden, he said at last, halting in front of the younger man and gazing down at him with a direct intensity that was highly embarrassing to one who had good cause to connect him with the actual crime. I want you to do me a favor, a great favor. It was in my mind at first to ask you to permit me to go with you to Innismore Mansions and to be present during the interview with the detectives. But a man in my position must be circumspect. It would perhaps be unwise to appear too openly interested. I don't mind telling you in confidence that I have known Mrs. Lester many years. The shock of her death, severe as it must have been to you, is slight as compared with my own sorrow and dismay. More than that I dare not say, until better informed. I remember now hearing the newsboys shouting their ghoulish news, and I saw contents bills making large type display of murder of a lady, but little did I imagine that the victim was one of whom, one whose loss I shall deplore. Are you on the telephone? Yes, said Thaden, thoroughly mystified anew by the announcement that Forbes had ever contemplated, or so much as hinted at, the astounding imprudence of visiting Innismore Mansions that night. Ring me up when the detectives have gone. I shall esteem your assistance during this crisis as a real service. For the life of him, Thaden could not frame the protest which ought to have been made without delay and without hesitation. Yes, he said, I'll do that. You can trust me absolutely. Thus was he committed to secrecy. That promise sealed his lips. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Number 17 by Lewis Tracy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Toils Thaden, though blessed or cursed with an active imagination, which must surely be the prime equipment of a novelist, was shrewd and level-headed in dealing with everyday affairs. It was no small achievement that the son of a country rector, aided only by a stout heart, a university education, and an excellent physique, good recommendations each and all, but forming the stock in trade of many a man on whose subsequent career failure is writ large, 
should have forced himself to the front rank of the most overcrowded among the professions before attaining his twenty-sixth year. It may be taken for granted, therefore, that he was not lacking in the qualities of close observation and critical analysis. He would, for instance, be readier than the majority of his fellows to note the small beginnings of events destined to become important. Often, of course, his deductions would prove erroneous, but the mere fact that he habitually exercised his wits in such a way rendered it equally certain that his judgment would be accurate sometimes. One such occasion presented itself a few seconds after he left the Forbes mansion. A taxi, summoned by a footman, was in waiting, and Thaden was crossing the pavement when he noticed a grey landelette car at rest beneath the trees at some distance. Mr. Forbes's house stood in a square, and the grey car had been drawn up on the quiet side of the roadway, being stationed there, apparently, to await its owner's behest. Grey cars are common enough in London, but they are usually of the touring class. Not often does one see a grey painted landelette. Hence, the odd, though hardly remarkable, fact occurred to Thaden that a precisely similar grey automobile had occupied the centre of the station yard at Waterloo when he took a taxi from the rank. Admittedly, he was in a nervous and excited state. It could hardly be otherwise, after the strain of that astounding conversation with Forbes, and there was no prospect of the tension being relaxed until the close of the interview with the detectives, which he now regarded as the worse ordeal of the two. But this subconscious neurasthenia in no wise affected the reflex action of his ordinary faculties. When, on leaving the square, and while his cab was rattling along an aristocratic thoroughfare leading to Knightsbridge, he peered through a tiny observation window in the back of the vehicle, and ascertained that the grey car was stealing along quietly about a hundred yards in the rear, he began to believe that its presence both at Waterloo and outside Mr. Forbes's residence could not be wholly accidental. When he had watched its persistent treading on his heels along Piccadilly, its intent became almost unmistakable. The route to Innismore Mansions traversed some of London's main arteries, but despite the rush of traffic due to the first flight of homeward-bound playgoers, the grey car kept steadily on his track. Amused at first, he became angry because of a notion which grew out of the wonderment of finding himself the object of this persistent espionage. To make sure, and at the same time discover the sort of person who was spying on him, he adopted a ruse. Leaning out, when about to cross Oxford Street into Tottenham Court Road, he said to his driver, Turn sharp to the right in Store Street and pull up. I'll tell you when to go on again. The man obeyed. Thaden posted himself at the outer window, and in a space of time so short that the excellence of the grey car's accelerator was amply demonstrated, the pursuer swung into sight. A stolid-faced chauffeur at the wheel did not appear discomfited at coming on his quarry thus unexpectedly. He whirled past, seemingly quite oblivious of Thaden's fixed stare. Though the weather was mild, he wore an overcoat with upturned collar, so that between its protecting flaps and a low-peaked cap his face was well hidden. Still, Thaden received an impression of a curiously wooden physiognomy. 
The man might have been an automaton for all the heed he gave to the taxi or its inquisitive occupant, but his aspect was almost forgotten in the far stranger discovery that the car was empty. Both windows were open, and the bright lights of a corner shop flashed into the interior, yet not a soul was visible. Moreover, the car sped on unhesitatingly, stopping some two hundred yards ahead. So far as Thaden could tell, no one alighted. He jotted down the number XY1314 on his shirt cuff. "'Did you happen to see that car waiting near the house I came from?' he said to the taxi-man, who, of course, provided an interested audience of one. "'Yes, sir,' was the ready answer. "'It's not a London car. I've never seen them letters afore. "'In other words, it may be a faked number?' "'Likely enough, sir, but rather risky. "'The police are quick at spotting that sort of thing.' "'Can you take a hand in the game? "'I want to know where that car goes to.' "'The man grinned. "'I wouldn't like to humbug you, sir. "'That there machine can lose me quicker than a derby winner could pass a cab horse. "'Didn't you hear the hum of the engine as it went by?' "'Thanks. Now go ahead to Innismore Mansions.' He was paying the driver when the grey car stole quietly past the end of the street, and that was the last he saw of it. "'There it goes again, sir,' said the man. "'Tell you what. Give me your name and address. I'll make a few inquiries, and keep me eyes open as well, and if I hear anything, I'll let you know.' Thaden scribbled the number of his flat on a card. There you are, he said. Even if I happen to be out, I'll leave instructions that you are to be paid half a crown for your trouble, if you call. By the way, what is your name? Evans, sir. There was really little doubt in Thaden's mind as to the reason why he had been followed. He was fuming about it when Bates met him in the hall of number 18 with the whisper, "'Them two are waiting here, sir.' Thaden glanced at his watch. The hour was ten minutes past eleven. "'Sorry I'm late, gentlemen,' he said on entering the sitting-room and finding the detectives seated at his table, seemingly comparing notes, because the chief inspector was talking while Furneaux, the diminutive, was glancing at a notebook. "'We have no reason to complain of being kept waiting a few minutes in such comfortable quarters,' said Winter pleasantly. "'Oh, I fancy I was detained by some zealous assistance of yours,' said Thaden, determined to carry the war into the enemy's territory. At that, Furneaux looked up quickly. "'Will you kindly tell me just what you mean, Mr. Thaden?' said Winter. Why, is it news to you that a grey limousine car stopped me from Waterloo to, to my friend's house, waited there three hours or more, and has carefully escorted me home? I dislike that sort of thing. Moreover, it strikes me as stupid. I didn't kill Mrs. Lester. It will save you and me a good deal of time and worry, if you accept that plain statement as a fact. "'Won't you sit down?' said Winter quietly. "'And may I smoke?' "'I didn't like to ask Bates for permission to light up in your absence.' Thaden was not to be outdone in coolness. He opened a corner cupboard and produced various boxes. "'The cigars are genuine Havanas,' he said." a birthday present from a maiden aunt, who is wise enough to judge the quality of tobacco by the price. Here, too, are Virginian, Turkish, and Egyptian cigarettes. Winter inspected the cigars gravely. By Jove, he cried, his blue eyes bulging in joyous surprise. 
last year's crop from the Don Juan y Herrero plantation. Treasure that aunt of yours, Mr. Thaden. None but herself can be her equal. Thaden saw that the little man did not follow his chief's example. Don't you smoke, he said. No, but if you'll not be horrified, I would like to smell one of those Turks. Smell it? Yes, that is the only way to enjoy the aroma and avoid nicotine poisoning. My worthy chief dulls a sound intellect by the cigar habit. What is worse, he excites a nervous system which is normally somewhat bovine. You also, I take it, are a confirmed smoker, so both of you are at cross-purposes already. Furno's voice was pitched in the curious piping note usually associated with comic relief in a melodrama, but his wizened face was solemn as a Red Indian's. It was Thaden who smiled. His preconceived ideas as to the appearance and demeanor of the London detective were shattered. Really, there was no need to take these two seriously. Winter, while lighting the cigar, grinned amiably at his colleague. Furno passed a cigarette to and fro under his nostrils and sniffed. Thaden reached for a pipe and tobacco jar and drew up a chair. Well, he said, it is not my business to criticize your methods. I have very little to tell you. I suppose Bates... The really important thing is this car, which followed you tonight, broke in Winter. The details are fresh in your memory. What type of car was it? Did you see the driver and occupants? What's its number? They then had not expected these questions. He looked his astonishment. Ha! cackled Furneaux. What did I tell you? Oh, shut up growled Winter. I am asking just what you yourself are itching to know. May I take it that the car has not been dogging me by your instructions, said Thaden. He was inclined to be skeptical, yet the chief inspector seemed to have spoken quite candidly. Yes, said Winter, meeting the other's glance squarely. We have no reason on earth to doubt the truth of anything you have said, or may say, with regard to this inquiry. The car is not ours. This is the first we have heard of it. We accept your word, Mr. Thaden, that you were dining with a friend. Perhaps you will tell us now what his name is and where he lives. Thaden hesitated the fraction of a second. That, he knew instantly, was a blunder, so he proceeded to rectify it. I was dining with Mr. James Creighton Forbes of number 11 Fortescue Square, he said. Probably you are acquainted with his name, so you will realize that if my evidence proves of the slightest value, I will not like any reference to be made to the fact that I was his guest tonight. I don't see how that can possibly enter into the matter, except in its bearing on this mysterious car. Though Winter was taking the lead, Thaden was aware that Furneaux, who had given him scant attention hitherto, was now looking at him fixedly. He imagined that the queer little man was all agog to learn something about the automobile which had thrust itself so abruptly into the affair. Exactly, he agreed. I visited Mr. Forbes tonight for the first time. We are mutually interested in aviation. That is why I went to Brooklands today, and the invitation to dinner was the outcome of a letter of introduction given me by Professor Scarth. Then, thinking he had said enough on that point, he described the grey car and its stolid-faced chauffeur to the best of his ability. He told of the brief chat with the taxi driver and its result. Good, nodded Winter. I'm glad you did that. It may help. I am doubtful of any information turning up, 
but you can never tell. The number plate, at any rate, is certainly misleading. Now about last night. Try and be as accurate as possible with regard to time. Can you give us the exact hour when you returned home? I happened to note by the clock on the mantelpiece that I came in at 11.35. Winter compared the clock's time with his watch. You had been to a theater, he said. Yes, dailies. It was raining heavily. Did you take a cab? Yes. Were you delayed? The piece ended at 11.05. My cab met with a slight accident. What sort of accident? Thaden explained. In all likelihood, you can discover the driver, he smiled, and he will establish my alibi. His tone seemed to annoy Furneaux, who broke in. Don't you write novels? Yes. Sensational? Occasionally. Then you ought to be tickled to death as the Americans say, at being mixed up in a first-rate murder. This is no ordinary crime. Several people will be older and wiser before the culprit is found and hanged. What Mr. Furneaux has in mind, purred Winter cheerfully, is the curious habit of some witnesses, when questioned by the police, they arm themselves against attack, as it were, you see, Mr. Thaden, we suspect nobody. We try to ascertain facts and hope to deduce a theory from them. Over and over again, we are mistaken. We are no more astute than other men. Our sole advantage is a wide experience of criminal methods. The detective of romance, if you'll forgive the allusion, simply doesn't exist in real life. I accept the rebuke, said Thaden. I suppose the grey car was still rankling in my mind. From this moment I start afresh. At any rate, the man who brought me from the theatre might check my recollection of the time. Winter nodded. He was evidently pleased that Thaden was inclined to share his view of the difficulties Scotland Yard encountered in its fight against malefactors. Did you see or meet anyone in particular while your car approached these mansions, or when you ascended the stairs? No, said Thaden. He perceived intuitively that if the detectives found the driver of the taxi which brought him from the theatre, it was possible the man might have noticed Forbes, who had certainly been scrutinized a few minutes later by a policeman. So he hastened to add, You said anyone in particular. I did see a tall, well-dressed gentleman at the corner of the street, but there is nothing remarkable in that. Which way was he heading? In this direction. Then it is conceivable that he might be the man who called on Mrs. Lester. Yes. Aren't you pretty sure he was the man? Thaden permitted himself to look astonished. I, he said, how can I be sure? If you mean that, judging from the interval of time between my seeing him at the corner and the sound of footsteps on the stairs, followed by the opening of the door at number 17, it could be he, I accept that. Winter nodded again. Apparently he was content with Thaden's correction. As the weather was bad, you probably hurried in when your cab stopped, he said. That is equivalent to saying you credit me with sense enough to get in out of the wet, smiled Thaden. Just so. And you wore an overcoat, which you removed on entering your hall? Yes. And Thaden's tone showed a certain bewilderment at these trivialities. Then, if you paid no special heed to the movements of the tall gentleman you've mentioned, why did you open one of these windows and look out soon after Bates went to the post? 
Faden flushed like a schoolboy caught by a master under circumstances which youth generally describes as a clean cop. How on earth do you know I looked out? He almost gasped. I'll tell you willingly. The discovery was Mr. Furneaux's, not mine. When we came here this morning and ascertained that you had been out at a late hour last night, we asked your man if he could enlighten us as to your movements. He did so. To the best of his belief, you dined at a club and occupied a stall at Daly's Theatre subsequently. He was sure, too, you had not walked home through the rain, so it was easy to draw the conclusion that you returned in a covered vehicle. Mr. Furneaux requested Bates to produce the clothes you had worn, which, owing to the uproar created by the news of the murder, had not been brushed and put away. As a consequence, the silk collar and part of the back of your dress coat bore the marks of raindrops. How had they got there? The only logical deduction was that you had thrust your head and shoulders through a window, and the time of the action is established almost beyond doubt because you had changed the coat when Bates came from the pillar box. It was either directly after you came in or while Bates was absent. Of course, you may have looked out twice. Did you? Whether once or twice, why did you do it? Thaden's feelings changed rapidly while Winter was delivering this very convincing analysis of a few simple facts. He had passed, at a bound, from the detected schoolboy stage to that of a man forcing his way through a thicket who finds himself on the very lip of a precipice. He remembered hazily that Bates had said something at Waterloo with regard to the manner in which the detectives, especially Furneaux, had questioned him. But it was too late to apply the warning thus conveyed. If he faltered now, he was forever discredited. These men would read his perplexed face as if it were a printed page. In his distress, he was prepared to hear Winter, or that little satyr Furneaux, say mockingly, why are you trying to screen James Creighton Forbes? What is he to you? What matter his fame or social rank? We are here to see that justice is done. Out with the truth, let who may suffer. But neither of the pair said anything of the sort. Furneaux only interjected a sarcastic comment. You will observe, Mr. Thaden, that even in a minor instance of deductive reasoning, such as this, the man who smells rather than the man who smokes tobacco solves the problem promptly. Thaden threw out his hands in token of surrender. He thought he saw a means of escape and took it unhesitatingly. I'm vanquished, he said. You force me to admit that I do know a little, a very little, more than I have confessed hitherto about the man who visited Mrs. Lester's flat last night. I have said nothing about the matter thus far because I didn't want to be convicted of a piece of idle curiosity worthy of a gossip-loving housemaid. I noticed the man I have described staring at the name tablet of the street as my cab turned the corner i did not know him i had never seen him before last night but he was of such distinguished appearance and his face of so rare a type that i was interested and wished to ascertain if possible on whom he meant calling if as it seemed he was searching for an address in these flats. Therefore I did look out and saw him enter the doorway beneath. In due course, I heard him arrive at Mrs. Lester's door, that is, I assume it was he. Five minutes later, Bates and I heard him depart. To make sure, I looked out a second time, 
If you ask me why I behaved in that way, I cannot tell you. I have occupied this flat during the past five months, and I have never previously, within my recollection, lifted a window and gazed out to watch anybody's comings and goings. The thing is inexplicable. All I can say is that it just happened. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. Thaden gave the assurance readily. It was beyond credence that either detective should put the one question to which he was now firmly resolved to give a misleading answer, and in this belief he was justified, since not even Furneaux's uncanny intelligence could suggest the fantastic notion that the man who walked through the rain in the previous night and the man with whom Thaden had dined that evening were one and the same person. I don't blame you for adopting a policy of partial concealment, said the chief inspector, spryly. You are not the first, and you certainly will not be the last witness from whom the police have to drag the facts. Now that we have reached more intimate terms, can you help by describing this stranger? Thaden complied at once. He drew just such a general sketch of forms as a skilled observer of men might be expected to formulate after one direct glance close at hand, supplemented by a view into a lamp-lit street from a second-story window on a rainy night. "'So far, so good,' said Winter. You have contrived to fill in several details lacking in the description supplied by a policeman who chanced to be standing at the corner when Mrs. Lester's visitor posted a letter. Did you notice that? Yes, indeed, I believe that, whether intentionally or not, he held an open umbrella at an angle which prevented the constable from seeing his face. "'In fact, it's marvellous what you really do know when your memory is jogged,' snapped Furneaux. Thaden did not resent the sarcasm. He smiled candidly into the little detective's eyes. "'I suppose I deserve that,' he said meekly. "'Why did you hide your knowledge of Mrs. Lester's visitor from your man Bates?' I was rather ashamed of the subterfuge adopted in order to get him out of the room while I opened the window the first time. That was understandable last night, but I failed to follow your reasoning for a policy of silence when we told you at Waterloo that Mrs. Lester had been killed. I was utterly taken aback by your news. I wanted time to think. I never meant to hide any material fact at this interview. You have certainly contrived to delay and hamper our inquiry for twelve hours, twenty-four in reality. I can't make you out, Mr. Thaden. You would never have said a word about your very accurate acquaintance with this mysterious stranger's appearance, had not last night's rainstorm left its legible record on your clothes. Do you now vouch for it that the man was completely unknown to you? You are pleased to be severe, Mr. Furneaux, but, having placed myself in a false position, I must accept your strictures. I assure you, on my honor, that the man I saw was an absolute stranger. Happily, Thaden was under no compulsion to choose his words. He met the detective's searching gaze unflinchingly. Fate, after terrifying him, had been kind. If Furneaux had expressed himself differently, if, for instance, he had said, Had you ever before seen this man, or have you now any reason for believing that you know his name, he would have forced Thaden's hand in a way he was far from suspecting. It may surprise you to hear, piped the shrill, cracked voice, 
that there are dozens of policemen walking about London who would arrest you on suspicion had you treated them as you have treated us. Then I can only say that I am fortunate in my inquisitors, smiled Faden. Winter held up a massive fist in deprecation of these acerbities. You have nothing more to tell us, he queried. Nothing. Then we need not trouble you further tonight. Of course, if luck favors us, and we find the gentleman with the classical features, the most unlikely person to commit a murder I have ever heard of, we shall want you to identify him. I am at your service any time. But before you go, won't you enlighten me somewhat? What did really happen? I have not even seen a newspaper account of the crime. Would you care to examine number 17? It was Furneaux who put the question, and Thaden was genuinely astonished. Do you mean, he began, but Furneaux laughed almost savagely. I mean Mrs. Lester's flat, he said. The poor woman's body is at the mortuary. If you come with us, we can reconstruct the crime. It occurred about this very hour, if the doctor's calculations are well-founded. Thaden rose. I shall be most interested, he said. By the way, Mr. Furneaux, yours is a French name. Are you a Frenchman, may I ask? A Jersey man. You think I am adopting some of the methods of the French juge d'instruction, eh? No, I cannot bring myself to believe that you regard me as a murderer. The three passed out into the hall. Mr. and Mrs. Bates immediately showed scared faces at the kitchen door. It's all right, Bates, said Thaden airily. I'm not a prisoner. I'll be with you again in a few minutes. But Bates was profoundly disturbed. What beats me, he said to his wife when they were alone, is why that little ferret wanted to see the governor's clothes. I looked them over carefully afterwards. There wasn't a speck on them, except some spots of rain on the collar. It's a queer business, no matter how you look at it. Mr. Thaden's manner was strange when he came in last night. He seemed to be listening for something I don't know what to make of it, Eliza. I really don't. In effect, since no man is a hero to his valet, what would Tomlinson, butler at number 11 Fortescue Square, have thought of his master if told that Mrs. Lester's last known visitor was James Creighton Forbes? End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Number Seventeen by Lewis Tracy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Telephonic Talk and Its Consequences. Thaden's journalistic experiences had been, for the most part, those of the special correspondent or descriptive writer. He had never entered one of those fetid slums of a great city in which too often murder is done, never sickened with the physical nausea of death in its most revolting aspect, when some unhappy wretch's foul body serves only to further pollute air already vile. It was passing strange, therefore, that Winter had no sooner opened the door of number 17 then the novice of the party became aware of a heavy, pungent scent which he associated with some affrighting and unclean thing. At first he swept aside the fantasy. Strong as he was, his nervous system had been subjected to severe strain that evening. He knew well that the mind can create its own spectres, that the five senses can be subjugated by forces which science has not as yet either measured or defined. Moreover, he was standing in a hall furnished with a taste and quiet elegance 
that must surely indicate similar features in each room of a suite which in other respects bore an almost exact resemblance of his own apartments in sheer protest against the riot of an overwrought imagination he brushed a hand across his eyes the chief inspector noted the action you will find nothing gruesome here i assure you he said quietly beyond a few signs of hurried rummaging of drawers and boxes there is absolutely no indication of a crime having been committed mr thayden came prepared to see ghosts squeaked furneaux evidently he is not acquainted with the peculiar smell of a joss stick thayden turned troubled eyes on the wizened little man who seemed to have the power of reading his secret thought a joss stick he repeated isn't that some sort of incense used by chinese in their temples yes said furneaux lots of ladies burn them in their boudoirs nowadays explained winter off-handedly the chinese burn them to propitiate evil spirits murmured furneaux the tao gods are mostly deities of a very unpleasant frame of mind the mere scowl of one of them from a painted fan suggests novel and painful forms of torture i've seen shang ti grinning at me from a porcelain vase otherwise exquisite and felt my hair rising i do wish you wouldn't talk nonsense charles said winter frowning heavily am i talking nonsense mr thayden demanded furneaux didn't your flesh creep when that queer perfume assailed your nostrils which are not yet altogether atrophied by the reek of thousands of rank cigars stop it commanded winter throwing open a door and they christened him leander leander who swam the hellespont for love of a woman muttered furneaux thayden began to believe that both detectives were cranks of the first order furneaux whose extraordinary insight he actually feared was obviously an excellent example of the alliance between insanity and genius in a word he failed and not unreasonably to understand that when the jersey man was mouthing a strange jargon of knowledge and incoherence and winter was inclined to be snappy with his subordinate and each was more than rude to the other they were then giving tongue like hounds hot on the trail winter's christian names were james leander the latter being conferred for no more classical reason than his father's association with a famous boating club but the fact supplied furneaux with material for many a quip these things thayden learnt later at present he was giving all his attention to winter who led the way into a dainty furnished bedroom the electric lights were governed by two switches a pair of lamps occupied the usual place in front of a dressing table a third was suspended from a canopy over the bed and was controlled also by an alternate switch behind the bolster winter turned on all three lights so the room was brilliantly illuminated any place less likely to become the scene of a brutal crime could hardly be imagined it looked exactly what it was the bedchamber of a refined and well-bred woman whose trained sense of color and design was shown by the harmony of carpet rugs wallpaper and furniture winter pointed to a slight depression on the side of the bed a white linen coverlet was rumpled as though someone had sat there that is where ann rogers the maid found her mistress at ten o'clock this morning he said as you see the bed has not been slept in indeed mrs lester was fully dressed my belief is that she was pounced on the instant she entered the room probably to retire for the night 
strangled before she could utter a sound, and flung here when dead. Again, Faden was aware of the subtle, penetrating, and not wholly unpleasing scent which Furneaux had attributed to the burning of a joss stick, but his mind was focused on the detective's words, which suggested a queer discrepancy between certain vague possibilities already flitting through his brain and the terrible drama as it presented itself to a skilled criminologist. But, he said almost protestingly, from what I have seen of Mrs. Lester, she was a strong and active woman. It is inconceivable that the man who came here last night could have murdered her while I was writing two brief notes. I am positive he did not remain five minutes, and Bates or I or both of us must have heard some trampling of feet, some indications of a struggle. Moreover, you think she was about to retire. Doesn't that opinion conflict with the known facts? What known facts? Well, or those I have mentioned. The brief visit, the open nature of the arrival and departure, the posting of a letter, which, by the way, may have been written in his presence. It was. Faden positively jumped. He would not be surprised now if Forbes's name came out. "'How do you know that?' he asked. "'Mrs. Lester wrote to an aunt in Oxfordshire, a lady who lives in the village of Ifley, near the first lock on the Thames below Oxford. As it happened, this aunt, a Miss Beale, was lunching with a friend in Oxford to-day, and someone showed her an early edition of a London evening paper containing an account of the murder. Instead of yielding to hysteria and passing from one fainting fit into another, Miss Beale had the rare good sense to go straight to the police station. One of our men has interviewed her this evening, and she is coming here tomorrow, but in the meantime the Oxford police telephoned the gist of the letter, which is headed Monday, 11.30 p.m. The hour is not quite accurate, but near enough, since the context shows that a, quote, friend had just called and given certain information which had determined the writer to leave London tomorrow, meaning today, or Wednesday at latest. So, you see, Mr. Thaden, if the unknown is an honest man, he will soon hear of the hue and cry raised by the murder and declare himself to the police. Indeed, for all I know, he may have reported himself to the yard already. In that event, you will probably meet him again quite soon. An electric bell jarred at the end of the main passage. It smote on their ears with the loud emphasis of a pistol shot. Even the detectives were startled, and Winter said, in a tone of distinct annoyance, "'Go and see who the deuce that is, Furneaux.' Furneaux returned promptly with Bates, pallid and apologetic. "'Beg pardon, sir,' said the intruder, addressing Thaden, but allowing his eyes to roam furtively about the room, as though he expected to see something ghoul-like and sinister." Mr. Forbes has rung up. Faden's voice literally quavered. For the first time in his life, he knew why a woman shrieks in the stress of sudden excitement. Tell Mr. Forbes I am still engaged with the gentleman from Scotland Yard, he gasped. I'll give him a call the moment I'm free. He will understand. Anyhow, I can't explain further now. Yes, sir and Bates disappeared. "'Mr. Forbes, the gentleman you were dining with?' inquired Winter. "'Yes,' said Thaden. He knew he ought to add something by way of explanation, but his heart was thumping madly, and he dared not trust his voice. "'You told him, I suppose, that Scotland Yard was worrying you, and he wants to know the result?' Then Thaden saw an avenue of escape and took it eagerly. 
"'I spoke of the murder, of course,' he said. "'But Mr. Forbes was hardly interested. "'He had seen the newspaper placards, and that was all he knew of it. "'The truth is he is wholly wrapped up in a scheme for reforming mankind "'by excluding airships and aeroplanes from warlike operations, "'and found me a somewhat preoccupied listener. "'He wants my help, such as it is, and I have no doubt the present call is a preliminary to another meeting tomorrow. Why not go to him? We'll wait. We can do nothing more tonight after leaving here. Speaking candidly, I am not in a mood to discuss such visionary projects. I shall be glad if Mr. Forbes has gone to bed when I do ring him up. Winter shook his head. "'Excuse me, Mr. Thaden, but I am older than you, and may venture on advice,' he said. "'A writer who has his way to make in the world cannot afford to slight a man of Mr. Forbes's standing. Go to him at once. It will please him. Don't hurry.' Thaden realized that a continued refusal would certainly set Furneaux's wits at work, and he dreaded the outcome. He went, without another word. When the outer door had closed behind him, Winter turned to Furneaux. Well, he said. For answer, Furneaux waved a hand and tiptoed into the hall. Waiting until he had heard the door of number 18 slam, he opened the latch of number 17 so cautiously that no sound was forthcoming. Soon he had an ear to Thaden's letterbox and was following attentively a one-sided conversation. Now, Thaden had thought hard during the few strides from one flat to the other. His telephone was fixed close to the party wall, dividing the two sets of apartments, and he was not certain that in the absolute quietude prevailing in Innismore Mansions at that late hour, a voice could not be overheard. True, he did not count on Furneaux's playing the eavesdropper at the slit of the letter-box, but he resolved to take no risks, and say nothing that any one could make capital of. So when he had asked the exchange to reconnect him with the caller who had just rung up, and he was put through, this is what Furneaux heard. "'That you, Mr. Forbes?' "'Sorry, I sent my man just now with a message that must have sounded rather curt, "'but the Scotland Yard people kindly excused me, so I can give you a minute or two. "'No, I'm sorry, but I cannot come to luncheon tomorrow, nor go to Brooklands again this week. "'You see, this dreadful murder which I spoke of will necessitate my presence at an inquest.' and the police seem to attach much significance to the visit to Mrs. Lester last night of a man whom I saw in the street, and whom Bates and I heard entering and leaving the poor lady's flat. Bates? Oh, he is my general factotum. He and his wife keep house for me. Yes, I'll gladly let you know the earliest date when I'll be free, then you and I can go into the flying proposition thoroughly. No, the detectives have apparently not got any clue to the murder, nor even discovered any motive for the crime. They have taken me into number 17. In fact, I was there when your call was made. The murderer ransacked the place thoroughly, but did not touch money or jewelry, I understand. The only peculiar thing, if I may so describe it, about the place is the scent of a burnt joss stick. It clings to the passage and the bedroom in which the body was found. Ah, by the way, Mrs. Lester wrote a letter which her visitor posted, and the addressee, her aunt, is in communication with the police. The text tends to clear the man of suspicion, Yes, if by chance I find myself at liberty tomorrow, I'll phone you at your city office. I'll find the number in the directory, of course. Oh, thanks. I'll jot it down. 
0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-
Mrs. Lester had been done to death in a horrible and insensate way, and no matter who suffered, be he millionaire or pauper, the wretch who committed the crime should be made to pay the penalty of the law. In that moment he forgot Evelyn Forbes, and thought only of the fair and gracious woman whose agonized spirit had taken flight under the compulsion of the tiger grip of some human brute now moving among his fellow creatures, unknown and unsuspected. It was inconceivable that Forbes should be guilty, but why should he not avow his acquaintance with the victim and thus aid the police in their quest? He glowered savagely at the tell-tale stain and vowed to rid his conscience of an incubus. He would wait till the morrow and force Forbes to come out into the open. Otherwise, you wish you had the murderer here now? Furneaux spoke softly and with no trace of his wonted irony, but Thaden was aware that once more the little detective had peered into his very soul. Yes, he said, and there was a new gravity in his tone. I do wish that. I have never before been brought in contact with a crime of this magnitude. It conveys a sort of personal responsibility. To think that I was in my room reading about aviation while a woman's life was being choked out of her within a few feet of where I was seated. Oh, it is monstrous. Let me tell you to here and now that if I can do anything to bring Mrs. Lester's slayer to justice, you can count on me, no matter what the cost. I'm sure you mean what you say, Mr. Thaden, said Winter soothingly. Well, I suppose we can do no more tonight. I have little else to tell you. The skull, the ivory skull, put in Furneaux. For an instant, an expression of annoyance flitted across the chief inspector's good-humoured face. Thaden did not see it, because Furneaux's odd-sounding words caused him to look with astonishment at the man who uttered them. "'An ivory skull?' he cried. "'What has an ivory skull to do with the murder of Mrs. Lester?' "'We cannot even begin to guess at its meaning yet,' said Winter." who, after one fierce glance at his colleague, had recovered his poise. That is why I did not mention it. I hate the introduction of bizarre features into an inquiry of this sort, but now that the thing has been spoken of, I may as well state that when the medical examination was being made at the mortuary, a tiny skull, not bigger than a pea, and made of ivory, was found inside Mrs. Lester's under-bodice. The curious fact is that it was loose. Had it been attached to a cord, or secured in some way, one might regard it as a charm or amulet, because some women, even in the London of today, are not beyond the reach of superstition in such matters. But, as I say, it was not safeguarded at all, so we may reasonably assume that it was not carried habitually. Of course, Furneaux readily evolved a far-fetched theory that it is a sign or symbol and was thrust out of sight among the clothing on the dead woman's breast by the man who killed her. But that is idle guesswork. We of the yard seldom pay heed to theatrical notions of that kind. Here is the article. I don't mind letting you see it, but kindly remember that its existence must not be made known. I must have your promise not to mention it to a living creature. Furneaux chuckled derisively. That is precisely the sort of thing anybody would say who attached no importance to the exhibit, he piped. Winter so nearly lost his temper that he repressed the retort on his lips. He contented himself, however, with producing a small white object from his waistcoat pocket and handed it to Thaden. It was a bit of ivory, hollow and very light, and fashioned as a skull. 
Yet it was by no means an ordinary creation. The artist who fashioned it had gratified a morbid taste by imparting to the eyeless sockets and close-set rows of teeth a malign and threatening grin. Wickedness, not death, was suggested, but the craftsmanship was faultless. A collector would have paid a large sum for it, while the average citizen would refuse to have it in his house. "'What an extraordinary thing,' said Thaden, turning the curio round and round in his fingers. "'It's wonderfully well carved,' agreed Winter. "'From that point of view it's a masterpiece, but what I meant was the astounding fact that it should have been discovered on the dead woman's body. Was it placed over her heart?' "'Why do you ask that?' came the sharp demand. "'Because, if it is a token of some vendetta, "'if the murderer wished to signify that he had glutted his vengeance. "'Oh, you're as bad as Furneaux,' cried Winter impatiently. "'Give it to me. I must be off. "'The hour is long past midnight, "'and I have a busy day before me tomorrow. "'Back in the seclusion of his own rooms,' Thaden debated the question whether or not he should endeavor to communicate with Forbes again that night. Somehow it seemed to him that Forbes would be most concerned at hearing of the gray car. And what of the ivory skull? Suppose he knew of that. But a certain revulsion of feeling had come over Thaden since the sheer brutality of the murder had been revealed. He failed to see now why he should be so solicitous for Forbes' welfare. No matter what private purpose the man might serve by concealing his visit to Mrs. Lester, it ought to give way before the paramount importance of tracking a pitiless and callous criminal. So Thaden hardened his heart and went to bed, and, being sound in mind and constitution, slept like a just man wearied. Nevertheless, the last thing he saw before the curtain fell on his tired brain was an ivory skull dancing in the darkness. Greatly as the many problems attached to Mrs. Lester's death bewildered him, he would have been even more perplexed if he had overheard the conversation between Winter and Furneaux when they entered a taxi and gave Scotland Yard as their destination. "'Look here, Charles,' began Winter firmly, but the other stayed him with a clutch of thin nervous fingers on an arm strong enough to fell an ox. "'Listen first, James. Lecture me afterwards,' pleaded Furneaux. "'I can't help yielding to impulse. And why should I strive to help it anyhow?' How often has impulse led me to the goal when, by every known rule of evidence, I was completely beaten? That is my plea. That is why I brought that young fellow into number 17 and watched the story of the tragedy reshaping itself in his imagination. That is why, too, I spoke of the ivory skull. Think what it means to one with the writer's temperament. The skull will never leave his mind's eye. It will focus and control his thoughts and actions. And I feel it in my bones that only by keeping in touch with Mr. Francis Thaden shall we solve the Innesmore Mansion's mystery. I can't explain why I think this no more than the receiver of a wireless message can account for the waves of energy it picks up from the void and transmutes into the ordered sequences of the Morse code. All I know is that when I am near him, I am, as the children say, warm, and when I am away from him, cold. While he was examining the skull, I was positively hot, and was half inclined to treat him as a thought transference medium and order him sternly to speak. No, nope, be calm. I even bid you be honest. 
when have you ever before admitted an outsider to your councils and if you make an exception of thaden why are you doing it winter bit the end off a cigar with a vicious jerk of his round head he struck a match and created such a volume of smoke that verno coughed affectedly the real clue he said at last rests with the gray car what did you make of that that my bulky friend will figure in my memory as a reproach for many a year when if ever i am tempted to preen myself on some peculiarly close piece of ratiocinative reasoning i shall say little man pygmy remember the gray car you think that someone had the impudence to follow us watch us in waterloo and take up thaden's trail when we had revealed it aha uh -huh. it touched you too did it but why the someone in question wants to know that you mean they are anxious to find out what we are doing exactly winter laughed cheerfully before long i shall begin to enjoy this hunt charles i like to find originality in a felon it varies the routine at any rate it is something new that you and i should be shadowed by the very people we are in pursuit of oh i was nearly forgetting anything fresh in that telephone talk it seemed all right seemed well it was too straightforward faden puzzles me i admit it frankly he also worries me but let me handle him in my own way have no fear that he will use our material for newspaper purposes with regard to the ennismore mansions affair thaden will lie close as a fish why no use asking you of course you despise intuition when you die someone should begin your epitaph from information received but i'll stick to thaden see if i don't even if i have to go up with him in one of forbes's airships end of chapter four chapter five of number seventeen by lewis tracy this librivox recording is in the public domain a leap in the dark with the morning, Thaden brought a mature and impartial judgment to bear on his perplexities. The average man, if asked to form an opinion on any difficult point, will probably arrive at a saner decision during the first pipe after breakfast than at any other given hour of the day. Excellent physiological reasons account for this truism. The sound mind in a sound body is then working under the most favorable conditions. It is free from the strain of affairs. The cold, clear morning light divests problems of the undue importance, or, it may be, the glamour of novelty which they possess overnight. At any rate, Frank Thaden, clenching a pipe between his teeth and gazing thoughtfully through an open window, at the trees in Innismore Gardens, reviewed yesterday's happenings calmly and critically, and arrived at the settled conviction that his proper course was to visit Scotland Yard and make known to the authorities the one vital fact which he had withheld from their ken thus far. It was not for him to assess the significance of Mr. Forbes's desire to remain in the background. If the millionaire's excuse or explanation of his failure to communicate at once with the criminal investigation department was a sufficiently valid one, Scotland Yard would be satisfied and might agree to keep his name out of the inquiry. On the other hand, he, Faden, might be balking the course of justice by holding his tongue. There was yet a third possibility, one fraught with personal discredit. 
Mr. Forbes himself might realize that a policy of candor offered the only dignified course. Suppose he was minded to tell the detectives that he was the man who visited Mrs. Lester shortly before midnight, what would Winter and Furno think of the young gentleman who had actually dined with Forbes before they took him into their confidence, who heard with such righteous indignation how Mrs. Lester had met her death, yet brazenly concealed the fact that he had just left the house of one whom they were so anxious to meet and question. Of course, the radiant vision of Evelyn Forbes intruded on this well-considered and unemotional analysis, but Thaden resolutely shook his head. No, by Jove, he communed, you mustn't make an ass of yourself, my boy, because a pretty girl was gracious for an hour or so. Be honest with yourself, old chap. If there were no Evelyn, or if Evelyn were hair-lipped and squinted, you wouldn't hesitate a second, now would you? Yet he had given a promise. How reconcile an immediate call on Scotland Yard with the guarantee of secrecy demanded by Forbes? Well, he must put himself right with Forbes without delay. Tell him straightforwardly that the bond could not hold. Thaden was no lawyer, but he was assured that an agreement founded on positive wrong was not tenable, legally or morally. He would be adamant with Forbes, and decline to countenance any plea in support of continued silence. If Forbes's demand was reasonable, Scotland Yard would grant it. If justice compelled Forbes to come out into the open, no private citizen should attempt to defeat the ends of justice. So that settles it, announced Thaden firmly, if not cheerfully. I'll ring up Forbes and get the thing over and done with. I'll never see his daughter again, I suppose, but that can't be helped. Tis better to have seen and lost than never to have seen at all. He turned from the window, walked to the fireplace, tapped his pipe firmly on the grate, and was about to go into the hall and call up the telephone exchange when the doorbell rang. He was aware of a muffled conversation between Bates and a visitor. Then the valet appeared, obviously ill at ease. "'If you please, sir,' he announced, "'a lady, Miss Beale of Oxford,' who says she is Mrs. Lester's aunt, wishes to see you. Thaden was immensely surprised, as well he might be, but there was only one thing to be done. Show her in, he said. Miss Beale entered. She was slight of figure, middle-aged and grey-haired. The wanness of her thin features was accentuated by an attire of deep mourning, but the pallor in her cheeks fled for an instant when she set eyes on Thaden. "'Pray forgive the intrusion,' she faltered. "'I I expected to meet an older man.' It was a curious utterance, and Thaden tried to relieve her evident nervousness by being mildly humorous. "'I hope to correct my juvenile appearance in course of time,' he said, smiling. Meanwhile, won't you be seated? You are not quite unknown to me, Miss Beale. That is, I heard of you last night from the Scotland Yard people. She sat down at once, but seemed to be at a loss for words. Her lips trembled, and Thaden thought she was going to cry. Have you travelled from Oxford this morning? he said, simulating a courteous nonchalance he was far from feeling. If so, you must have started from home at an ungodly hour. Let me have some breakfast prepared for you. N no, no, she stammered. Well, a cup of tea, then. Come now, no woman ever refuses a cup of tea. You are very kind. He rang the bell. I would not have ventured to call on you if I had not seen your name in the newspaper, she went on. Miss Beale certainly had the knack of saying unexpected things. 
It was nothing new that Thaden should find his own name in print, but on this occasion he could not choose but associate the distinction with the crime in number 17. That he should be mentioned in connection with it was neither anticipated nor pleasing. At the same time, he realized the astounding fact that he had not even glanced at a newspaper during twenty-four hours. "'What in the world have the newspapers to say about me?' he cried. "'It, it, it said that Mr. Francis Barold Thaden, the well-known author, lived in number eighteen, the flat exactly opposite that which my unhappy niece occupied. I... I have read some of your books, Mr. Thaden, and I pictured you quite a serious-looking person of my own age. He laughed. Bates entered, and was almost shocked at finding his master in such a lively mood. Oh, and this lady has travelled from Oxford this morning. A cup of tea and some nice toast, please, Bates, said Thaden. Then, when the two were alone together again, he brushed aside the question of age as irrelevant. I assure you that since this time yesterday I have lost some of the careless buoyancy of youth, he said. I had not the honor of Mrs. Lester's acquaintance, but I knew her well by sight, and I received the shock of my life last evening when I heard of her terrible end. It is an extraordinary thing, seeing that we were such close neighbors, but I believe you got the news long before I did, because I left home early and heard nothing of what had happened till my man met me at Waterloo in the evening. You have seen the... the detectives in the meantime? Yes. Then you will be able to tell me something definite. I have promised to call at Scotland Yard at eleven o'clock, and the only scraps of intelligence I have gathered are those in the papers. I would have come to London last night, but was afraid to travel, lest I should faint in the train. Moreover, someone in London promised to send a detective to see me. He came, but could give no information. Indeed, he wanted to learn certain things from me. So after a weary night, I caught the first train and it occurred to me, as you lived so near, that you might be kind enough to... to... The long speech was too much for her, and her lips quivered pitifully a second time. I fully understand, said Thaden sympathetically. Now I'm positive you have eaten hardly anything today. Won't you let me order an egg? No, please... I'll be glad of the tea, but I cannot make a meal yet. Is it true that my niece was absolutely alone in her flat on Monday night? Seeing that Miss Beale was consumed with anxiety to hear an intelligible version of the tragedy, Thaden at once recited all, or nearly all, that was known to him. The only points he suppressed were those with reference to the grey car, and the ivory skull. The lady listened attentively, and with more self-control than he gave her credit for. Bates came in with a laden tray, on which a boiled egg appeared. Mrs. Bates had used her own discretion, and decided that anyone who had set out from Oxford so early in the day must be in need of more solid refreshment than tea and toast. Thus cozened, as it were, into eating, Miss Beale tackled the egg, and Thaden was glad to note that she made a fairly good meal, being probably unaware of her hunger until the means of sating it presented itself. But she missed no word of his story, and when he made an end, put some shrewd questions. "'I take it,' she said, that the strange gentleman who visited my niece on Monday night posted the very letter which I received by the second delivery yesterday? That is what the police believe, replied Thaden. Then it would seem that she resolved to come to me at Ifley as the result of something he told her. Why do you think that? Because I heard from her only last Saturday 
and she not only said nothing about coming to Oxfordshire, but she asked me to arrange to spend a fortnight in London before we both went to Cornwall for the summer. "'Ah, that is rather important, I should imagine,' said Thaden thoughtfully. "'It is odd, too, that you and the detectives should have noticed the smell of a joss stick in the flat,' went on Miss Beale. "'Edith, my niece, you know, could not bear the smell of joss sticks. They reminded her of Shanghai, where she lost her husband.' Thaden looked more startled than such a seemingly simple statement warranted. He had realized already that the ivory skull was the work of an oriental artist, and the mention of Shanghai brought that sinister symbol very vividly to his mind's eye. "'Mrs. Lester had lived in China, then?' he said. "'Yes. She was out there nearly six years.' Her husband died suddenly last October. He was poisoned, she firmly believed, and, of course, she came home at once. What was Mr. Lester's business or profession? He was a barrister. I do not mean that he practiced in the consular courts. He was making his way in England, but was offered some sort of appointment in Shanghai, the post was so lucrative that he relinquished a growing connection at the bar. I have never really understood what he did. I fancy he had to report on commercial matters to some firm of bankers in London, but he supplied very little positive information before Edith and he sailed. Indeed, I took it that his mission was highly confidential, and about that time there was a lot in the newspapers about rival negotiators for a big Chinese loan. So I formed the opinion that he was sent out in connection with something of the sort. Neither he nor Edith meant to remain long in the Far East. At first their letters always spoke of an early return. Then when the years dragged on, and I asked for definite news of their homecoming, Edith said that Arthur could not get away until the country's political affairs were in a more settled state. Finally came a cablegram from Edith. Arthur dead, sailing immediately, and my niece was with me within a few weeks. The supposed cause of her husband's death was some virulent type of fever, but, as I said, Edith was convinced that he had been poisoned. Why? That I never understood. She never willingly talked about Shanghai or her life there. Indeed, she was always most anxious that no one should know she had ever lived in China. Yet she had plenty of friends out there. I gathered that Arthur had left her well provided for financially, and they were a most devoted couple. Edith was the only relative I possessed. It is very dreadful, Mr. Thaden, that she should be taken from me in such a way. Her hearer was almost thankful that she yielded to the inevitable rush of emotion. It gave him time to collect his wits, which had lost their poise when that wicked-looking skull was, so to speak, thrust forcibly into his recollection. In a word, he said at last, you are Mrs. Lester's next of kin, and probably her heiress. Yes, I suppose so, though I was not thinking of that, came the tearful answer. Yet the relationship entails certain responsibilities, said Thaden firmly. You should be legally represented at the inquest. Are your affairs in the hands of any firm of solicitors? Yes, at Oxford. I contrived to call at their office yesterday, and they recommended me to consult these people, and Miss Beale produced a card from a handbag. Thaden read the name and address of a well-known West End firm. Good, he said. I recommend you to go there at once. By the way, was anyone looking after Mrs. Lester's interests? Surely she had dealings with a bank or an agency? Y yes I do happen to know the source from which her income came. 
she made a secret of it in a measure. Pray don't tell me anything of that sort. Your legal adviser might not approve. But what does it matter now? Poor Edith is dead. Her affairs cannot help being dragged into the light of day. She had some railway shares and bonds, some of which were left to her by her father, and others which came under a marriage settlement, but the greater part of her revenue was derived from a monthly payment made by the bank of which Mr. James Creighton Forbes is the head. Miss Beale naturally misinterpreted the blank stare with which Thayden received this remarkable statement. I don't see why anyone should wish to conceal a simple matter of business like that, she said nervously. May I explain that I have an impression, not founded on anything quite tangible, that Mr. Forbes was largely interested in the syndicate which sent Arthur Lester to China. So it is very likely that the payment of an annuity or pension to Arthur's widow would be left in his care. I do not know. I am only guessing. But that matter, and others, can hardly fail to be cleared up by the police inquiry. Thaden recovered his self-control as rapidly as he had lost it. He glanced at the clock, 10.15. Within half an hour or less, Miss Beale would be on her way to Scotland Yard. He must act promptly and decisively, or he would find himself in a distinctly unfavorable position in his relations with the Criminal Investigation Department. "'I happen to be acquainted with Mr. Forbes,' he said, striving desperately to appear cool and methodical, when his brain was seething. "'Would you mind if I just rang him up on the telephone? A few words now might enlighten us materially.' "'Oh, you are most helpful,' said the lady, blushing again with timid gratitude. "'I am so glad I summoned up courage to call on you. I was so terrified at the idea of going to the police headquarters, but I shall not mind it at all now.' Soon Thaden was asking for zero zero four zero zero bank. He had left the door of his sitting room open purposely. No matter what the outcome, he no longer dared keep the compact of silence into which he had entered with Forbes. But the millionaire was not at his office. In response to a very determined request for a word with someone in authority on a matter of real urgency, the clerk who had answered the call, brought Mr. Forbes' secretary, a Mr. MacDonald, to the telephone. "'It is important, vitally important, that I should speak with Mr. Forbes within the next few minutes,' said Thaden, after giving his name and address. "'Do you expect him to arrive soon, or shall I try and reach him at Fortescue Square?' "'Mr. Forbes will not be here till midday.' came a voice with a pronounced Scottish intonation. "'I'm doubtful, too, if you'll catch him at home. Can I give him a message? "'Do you know where he is? Well, I cannot say. But do you know? "'I'll be glad to give him a message. "'It will be too late, then. Please understand, Mr. MacDonald, "'that I am making this call at Mr. Forbes's express wish.' It is, as I have said, vitally important that I should get in touch with him without delay. Scottish caution was not to be overcome by an appeal of that sort. I cannot go beyond what I have said, was the reply. If you like to ask at his house... Oh, ring off, cried Thaden, who pictured the secretary as a lanky, hollow-cheeked Scot, a model of discretion and trustworthiness, no doubt, but utterly unequal to a crisis demanding some measure of self-confident initiative. In reality, Mr. MacDonald was short and stout, and quite a jovial little man. After an exasperating delay, he got into communication with the Forbes mansion in Fortescue Square. I'm Mr. Frank Thaden, he said, striving to speak unconcernedly. Is Mr. Forbes in? 
No, sir. Is that you, Tomlinson? Yes, sir. Can you tell me where I can find Mr. Forbes at once? Isn't he at his office, sir? No, he will not be there till twelve o'clock. A pause of indecision on Tomlinson's part, then a possible solution of the difficulty. Would you care to have a word with Miss Evelyn, sir? Oh, yes, yes. Faden blurted out this emphatic acceptance of the butler's suggestion without a thought as to its possible consequences. He was racking his brain in a frenzy of uncertainty as to how he should frame his words when he heard quite clearly a woman's footsteps on the parquet flooring and caught Evelyn Forbes's voice saying to Tomlinson, "'How fortunate!' Mr. Thaden is the very person I wish to speak to, but I simply dared not ring him up. The slight incident only provided Thaden with a new source of wonderment. Why should Evelyn Forbes want speech with him at that early hour? Perhaps she would explain. He could only hope so, and trust to luck in the choice of his own phrases. That you, Mr. Thaden? came the girl's voice, "'sweet in its cadence, yet ominously eager. "'How nice of you to anticipate my unspoken thought. "'I have been horribly anxious "'ever since I read of that awful affair at Innesmore Mansions. "'That poor lady's flat is next door to yours, is it not?' "'Yes, but... "'Oh, you cannot choke off a woman's curiosity quite so easily. "'You see, I happen to know that Mrs. Lester's sad death affects my father in some way, "'and I realize now that you two were just on pins and needles to get rid of me last night "'so that you might talk freely. "'Miss Forbes, I assure you, wait till I've finished, "'and you will not be under the necessity of telling me any polite fibs.' You men are all alike. You think the giddy feminine brain is not fitted to cope with mysteries, and that is where you are utterly mistaken. A woman's intuition often peers deeper than a man's logic. I do forgive me, broke in Thaden despairingly, but I am really most anxious to know how and where I can get a word with your father. I would not be so rude as to interrupt you if I hadn't the best of excuses. Tell me where to find him now, and I promise to give you a call immediately afterwards. He's at the home office. At the home office? Some hint of utter bewilderment in Thaden's tone must have reached the girl's alert ear. Ah, touché, she cried. Now will you be good and tell me why Dad should receive a little ivory skull by this morning's post? Thaden knew that he paled. His very scalp tingled with an apprehension of some shadowy, yet nonetheless affrighting, evil. But he schooled himself to say, with a semblance of calm interest, "'What exactly do you mean, Miss Forbes?' She laughed lightly. Thaden was so flurried that he did not realize the possibility of Evelyn Forbes being as quick to mask her real feelings as he was himself. "'Dad and I make a point of breakfasting together at nine o'clock every morning,' she said. "'We were talking about you, and he told me of the dreadful thing that happened to Mrs. Lester. "'I was reading the account of the tragedy in a newspaper when I happened to glance at him. "'He was going through his letters, and I was just a trifle curious to know what was in a flat box which came by registered post.' He opened it carelessly, and something fell out and rolled across the table. I picked it up and saw that it was a small piece of ivory, carved with extraordinary skill, to represent a skull. Indeed, it was so clever as to be decidedly repulsive. I was going to say something when I saw that the letter, which was in the same box, had alarmed him so greatly that for a second or two I thought he would faint. But he can be very strong and stern at times, and he recovered himself instantly, was quite vexed with me because I had examined the ivory skull, and forbade my going out until he had returned from the home office. 
Tomlinson and the other men have orders not to admit any one to the house, no matter on what pretext. And I'm sure the letter and its nasty little token are bound up in some way with Mrs. Lester's death. Won't you let me into the secret? I shan't scream or do anything foolish, but I do think I'm entitled to know what you know if it affects my father. I really fail to see why you should assume some connection between the crime which was committed here on Monday night and the arrival of a somewhat singular package at your house this morning, he said reassuringly. Like every other woman, I jump at conclusions, she answered. Why should this crime in particular have worried my father? Unfortunately, the newspapers are full of such horrid things "'Yet he hardly ever pays them any attention. "'No, Mr. Thaden, I am not mistaken. "'He either knew Mrs. Lester and was shocked at her death, "'or saw in it some personal menace. "'Then comes the letter with its obvious threat, "'and I am ordered to remain at home under a strong guard "'while he hurries off to Whitehall. "'You have met my father, Mr. Thaden.' Do you regard him as the sort of man who would rush off in a panic to consult the Home Secretary without very grave or weighty reasons? But you can hardly be certain that a wretched crime in this comparatively insignificant quarter of London supplies the actual motive of Mr. Forbes's action, urged Thaden. The girl stamped an impatient foot. He heard it distinctly. "'Of course I am certain,' she cried. "'Why won't you be candid? "'You know I am right. "'I can tell it from your voice "'and your guarded way of talking.' "'An inspiration came to Thaden's relief in that instant. "'Pardon the interruption,' he said, "'but I must point out that both of us "'are acting unwisely "'in discussing such matters over the telephone. "'Really?' "'Neither must say another word except this. "'When I have found your father, "'I'll ask his permission to come and see you. "'Perhaps we three can arrange to meet somewhere for luncheon. "'That is absolutely the farthest limit "'to which I dare go at this moment. "'Oh, very well.' "'The receiver was hung up in a temper, "'and the prompt ringing off jarred disagreeably in Thaden's ear.' If he was puzzled before, he was thoroughly at sea now. But he took a bold course, and cared not a jot whether or not it was a prudent one. The mere sound of Evelyn Forbes's voice had steeled his heart and conscience against the dictates of common sense. Let the detectives think what they might, the girl's father must be allowed to carry through his plans without let or hindrance. "'Miss Beale,' said Thaden, gazing fixedly into the sorrow-laden eyes of the quiet little lady, whom he found seated where he had left her, "'I'm going to tell you something very important, very serious, something so far-reaching and momentous that neither you nor I can measure its effect. You heard the conversation on the telephone?' "'I heard what you were saying, but could not understand much of it,' said his visitor in a scared way. "'I have been trying to communicate with Mr. Forbes, but his daughter tells me that the murder of your niece seems to have affected him in a manner which is incomprehensible to her, and even more so to me, though I am acquainted with facts which her father and I have purposely kept from her knowledge.' Mr. Forbes has gone hurriedly to the home office. I suppose you know what that means? He is about to give the home secretary certain information, and it is not for you or me to interfere with his discretion. Now, if you tell the Scotland Yard people what you have told me, namely that Mr. Forbes was the intermediary through whom Mrs. Lester received the greater part of her income, he will be brought prominently into the inquiry. You see that, don't you? Yes, I suppose that something of the sort must happen. Well, I want you to suppress that vital fact until we know more about this affair. It will not be for long. 
Each of us must tell our story without reservation at some future date. Whether this afternoon or tomorrow or a week hence, I cannot say now. But I do ask you to keep your knowledge to yourself until I have had an opportunity of consulting Mr. Forbes. I undertake to tell you the exact position of matters without delay, and I accept all responsibility for my present advice. I know little of the world, Mr. Thaden, said Miss Beale, rising and beginning to draw on her gloves, but I shall be very greatly surprised if you are advising me to act otherwise than honorably. I shall certainly not utter a word about Mr. Forbes at Scotland Yard. When all is said and done, my statement to you was largely guesswork. You must remember that I have never seen Mr. Forbes, nor hardly ever heard his name except in connection with public matters in the press. Oh, yes, I make that promise readily. I trust you implicitly. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Number Seventeen by Lewis Tracy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Close Quarters. Thaden escorted Miss Beale downstairs. As they passed the closed door of Number Seventeen, the lady shivered. To think that within the next few days I would have been staying there with Edith and planning evenings at the theatre before going to Newquay, she murmured. There was a pitiful catch in her voice that told better than words how the remainder of her existence would be darkened by the tragedy. At best, she was a shrinking, timid little woman, for whom life probably held out but narrow interests. Such as they were, their placid content was forever shattered. The death of her niece had closed the one chief avenue leading to the outer world. She would retire to the quiet backwater of Ifley to become more faded, more insignificant, more lonely each year. Thaden commiserated with her deeply and did not hesitate to utter his thoughts while putting her into the cab. "'Have you no friends in London?' he inquired. I don't like the notion of sending you off alone into this wilderness. London is the worst place in the world for anyone in distress. The heedless multitude seems to be callous and unsympathetic. It isn't, in reality, it simply doesn't know and doesn't bother. I used to claim some acquaintances here, but I have lost track of them for years, she said. In any event... I shall have more than enough to occupy my mind today. The inquest opens at three o'clock, and I must face the ordeal of identifying Edith's body. The detective told me that this should be done by a relation. Well, the only other person who could act, Anne Rogers, has been nearly out of her mind since yesterday morning. Where are you staying? She mentioned a small hotel in the West End. I used to go there with my people when I was a girl, she added sadly. Then I'll get my sister to call. You'll like her. She's a jolly good sort. And a chat with another woman will be far more beneficial than the society of detectives and lawyers and such like strange fowl. Keep up your spirits, Miss Beale. Nothing that you can say or do now will restore the life so cruelly taken, but you and I, each in our own way, can strive to bring the murderer to justice. I am convinced that a distinct step in that direction will be taken this very day. You can count on seeing or hearing from me as soon as possible, after I have discussed matters with Mr. Forbes. Meanwhile, don't forget to have a lawyer representing you at the inquest. They parted as though they were friends of long standing. Thaden was genuinely sorry for this grey-haired woman's plight, and she evidently regarded him as a kind-hearted and eminently trustworthy young man. 
he stood and watched the cab as it bore her off swiftly into the maelstrom of London. He could not help thinking that seldom had he met one less fitted for the notoriety thrust upon all connected with a much-talked-of crime. When the press interviewers, the photographers, the hundred and one officials with whom she must be brought into contact were done with her, poor Miss Beale would retire to her Oxfordshire nook in a state of mental bewilderment that would baffle description. In one of his books, Thaden had endeavoured to depict just such a middle-aged spinster confronted with a situation not unholy like that which now faced Miss Beale. He smiled grimly when he realized how far fiction had wandered from fact. The woman of his imagination had acted with a strength of character, a decisiveness that outwitted and confounded certain scheming personages in the story. How different was the reality! Miss Beale, rushing across London in a taxi, reminded him of nothing more masterful than a caged bird turned loose in a tempest. He was about to re-enter the mansions, meaning to telephone to both the Fortescue Square house and the old Broad Street offices, and ask for instant news of Mr. Forbes in either locality. He was so preoccupied that he failed to notice an approaching taxicab, though the driver was signaling and even tooted a motor horn loudly in the endeavor to attract his attention. He did, however, catch his own name and halted. "'Beg pardon, sir, but you are Mr. Thaden, aren't you?' said the man. Then Thaden recognized Evans, the taxi driver who had brought him from Fortescue Square. "'Hullo!' he cried. "'Any news of the grey car?' "'Yes, sir, I think so,' was the somewhat surprising answer. When I dropped you last night, I got a fare to Euston, then I took a gentleman to the Langham, and as I felt like a snack, I pulled into the nearest cab rank. I was having some coffee and sandwiches when I happened to speak about the grey car to one of the chaps. That's odd, he said. A quarter of an hour ago, I had a theatre job to Langham Place, and a grey landlet stopped in front of the Chinese embassy came along from the east side, too. He didn't notice the number, sir, so there may be nothing in it, after all, but I thought you might like to hear what my pal said. Was the car empty? Did it call for someone at the embassy? That's the queer part of it, sir. I asked. Particular. The grey car brought a gentleman, a small, youngish man, who skipped up the embassy steps like a lamplighter, and went in afore you could say knife. Somebody might have been watching for him through the keyhole. The door was open that quick. Then the car went off. My friend wouldn't have given a second thought to it if the gentleman hadn't vanished like a jack-in-the-box. That's why he remembered the color of the car. Thaden tried to look as though Evans's statement merely puzzled him whereas his mind was already busy with the extraordinary coincidences which the haphazard events of a few hours had produced. Was the Far East bound up in some mysterious way with Mrs. Lester's death? Did the crime possess a political significance? If so, an explanation by Forbes was more than ever demanded. "'Your informant was not mistaken about the Chinese embassy, I suppose?' he said. "'No, sir. He's always in that district. His garage is at the back of Great Portland Street. He knows most of them there chinks by sight.' "'Then that grey car can hardly have been our grey car,' commented Thaden, deeming it wise to prevent the sharp-witted taxi driver from jumping at conclusions. "'Afraid not, sir.' Still, I just took the liberty. I'm very much obliged to you, of course. I said half a crown, didn't I? Here you are. Keep an eye open for XY1314, and let me know if you hear or see anything of it. Thank you, sir. Then Evans lifted his eyes to the block of buildings. 
Nasty business, this murder, which was done there the other night, sir, he went on. One would hardly believe it possible for such things to take place in London nowadays. Much as he was disinclined for gossip of the sort at the moment, Thaden saw that he must endeavour to dissociate the grey car and the crime from their dangerous juxtaposition in the man's mind. So he spoke about Mrs. Lester's attractive appearance, harped on the apparent aimlessness of the deed, hinted darkly at clues in the possession of the police, then finally got rid of the well-meaning chauffeur. Back he went to his telephone, and having ascertained that Mr. Forbes was fully expected to put in an appearance at the city office before noon, settled down to read the newspapers. They contained sensational but fairly accurate accounts of the tragedy. One enterprising journal had published an interview with Bates, whom the reporter described as a typical British man-servant, which was amusing, since Bates had retired non-commissioned officer written all over his square frame and soldierly face. The same journalists spoke of Thaden himself, and had even ferreted out the fact that Mrs. Lester was the widow of an English barrister who had died at Shanghai. On reaction, Thaden saw that there was nothing unusual in this statement. The connection between the metropolitan press and the bar is old and intimate, and scores of junior barristers must remember Arthur Lester's beginnings. Resolved to possess his soul in patience till twelve o'clock, the hour being yet barely 11.30 a.m., Aidan tackled a page of reviews, since there is always consolation for a writer in learning at second hand what sheer drivel others can produce. He was growling at the discovery that some hapless essayist had appropriated a title which he himself had marked down for his next book, when the doorbell rang. He did not give much heed, because so many tradesmen called during the course of each morning, so he was surprised and startled when Bates announced, Mr. Forbes to see you, sir. Had a powerful spring concealed in the seat of his chair been released suddenly, Thaden could not have bounced to his feet with greater speed. Forbes came in. He was pale, but self-contained and clear-eyed. Forgive an unceremonious visit, he said. I'm glad to find you at home. I meant to arrive here sooner, but I was detained on business of some importance. By this time Bates had closed the door, Thaden explained his presence in the flat by saying that, within a few minutes, he would have been telephoning again to Old Broad Street. "'Ah, did you speak to MacDonald?' said Forbes, dropping into a chair with a curious lassitude of manner, which did not escape Thaden. "'Yes, I have been most anxious to have a word with you,' Forbes broke in with a short laugh. "'You would get nothing out of MacDonald.' he said. He knows that my visits to the Chinese embassy are few and far between, and generally have to do with... But what is it now? Why should you be so perturbed when I mention the Chinese embassy? Thaden was literally astounded, and did not strive to hide his agitation. But he was by no means tongue-tied. Now, most emphatically, was he determined to have done with pretense. Whether by accident or design, Forbes had placed himself with his back to the window. The younger man deliberately crossed the room, pulled up the blind, thus admitting the flood of light which comes only from the upper third of a window, and sat down in such a position that Forbes was compelled to turn in order to face him. "'Before you utter another word, Mr. Forbes,' he said gravely, let me tell you that in my efforts to trace your whereabouts, I also called up Fortescue Square. Miss Forbes came to the telephone. She said you had gone to the home office. 
By some feminine necromancy, too, she divined the link which binds you with the death of Mrs. Lester. She was distressed on your account, and I was hard put to it to extricate myself from the risk of saying something which I might regret. I... What do you imply by that remark? interrupted Forbes, piercing the other with a look that was strangely reminiscent of his daughter's candid scrutiny. I imply the serious fact that I know who visited Mrs. Lester before she met her death. I not only heard her visitor's arrival and departure, but saw him at the corner of these mansions while on my way home from Daly's Theatre. And again, when he posted a letter in the pillar-box on the same corner. If such unwonted interest on my part in the movements of one who was then a complete stranger surprises you, let me remind you that only a few minutes earlier I had stood by his side at the door of the theatre and heard him telling his daughter that he intended to walk to the Constitutional Club. Forbes smiled, but uttered no word. His expression was inscrutable. His pallor reminded Thaden of the tint of ivory, of that waxen white Dutch grisaille, beloved of fifteenth-century illuminators of manuscripts. His silence was disturbing, almost irritating, his manner singularly calm. These negative indications conveyed absolutely nothing to Thaden, who, for the second time in their brief acquaintance, found himself in the ridiculous position of one explaining a fault rather than, as he imagined, arraigning a man under suspicion. "'So we had better dispense with ambiguities, Mr. Forbes,' he went on, speaking with a precision that sounded oddly in his own ears. "'It was you who called on Mrs. Lester on Monday night. You who posted the letter she wrote to Miss Beale at Ifley, Oxfordshire. You, for whom the police are now searching. I have contrived thus far to keep your secret, but the situation is passing out of my control. I would help you if I could. Why? The monosyllable, sharp and insistent, was as disconcerting as the unexpected crack of a whip. But... Thaden answered valiantly, "'Because of the monstrous absurdities with which fate has plagued me during the past two days, I appeal now for outspokenness, so I set an example. Had it not been for your daughter's remarkably attractive appearance, I should not in all likelihood have given a second glance at my neighbors on the steps of the theatre but I cannot forget that I did see both you and her. Indeed, Miss Forbes herself recalled the incident, and the close questioning of the Scotland Yard men who were here last night showed me the folly of imagining that I could deny all knowledge of you. I recognize now that some impish contriving of circumstances forced this knowledge upon me, the sudden downpour of rain, and the fact that I was delayed by a slight accident to my cab conspired with the apparently simple chance which led me to overhear the conversation between Miss Forbes and yourself. I tried hard to baffle the detectives. Again, I ask why. Thaden was rapidly being wound up to a pitch of excited resentment. Why? he cried. Was I not your guest? How could I come from a house where I had been admitted to a delightful intimacy and tell the representatives of the law that my host was the man they were looking for? During some seconds, Forbes bent his eyes on the floor, seemingly in deep thought. Thaden, he said at last, looking up in his direct way, I am your senior by a good many years am old enough, as the saying goes, to be your father. I may venture, therefore, to give you a piece of sound advice. Pack a kit bag, catch the afternoon boat train for Boulogne, and go for a walking tour, 
in Normandy and Brittany. When I was your age and a junior in a bank, I had to take my holidays in May, and each year I tramped that corner of France. I recommend it as a playground. It will appeal to your literary instincts, and it has the immeasurable advantage just now of being practically as remote from London as the Sahara. It must not be forgotten that Thaden was a romancer, an idealist. The lounge suit of the modern tailor hampers the play of such qualities no more than the beaten armor of the age of chivalry. If my departure for France will relieve Miss Forbes of anxiety on your behalf, I'll go, he vowed. Forbes regarded him with a new interest. I believe you mean that, he said. I do. But I cannot send you out of the country on a false pretense. It was your safety and well-being, not my daughter's, that I was thinking of. What have I to fear? I don't know. I'm like a man wandering by night in a jungle alive with fearsome beasts and reptiles. Yet you had some reason for suggesting my prompt departure? Yes, it is an absurd thing to say, but I believe I am putting you in danger of your life by coming here this morning. Can't you speak plainly, Mr. Forbes? What good purpose do you serve by holding forth these vague terrors? If, as Miss Forbes told me, you have visited the Home Office, I take it you made yourself clear to the authorities, assuming, that is, you went there in connection with the amazing conditions which seem to be bound up with this crime. There is a certain class of knowledge which is in itself dangerous to those who possess it, no matter whether or not it affects them in any particular. I recommend you in good faith to leave London today. If my own safety is the only consideration, I refuse as readily as I agreed before. Thaden's tone grew somewhat impatient. He really fancied that Forbes was trifling with him. Indeed, a queer doubt of the man's complete sanity now peeped up in him. Forbes was regarded as a crank by a large section of the public on account of his peace propaganda. If that opinion were justified, why should he not be eccentric in other respects? It was fantastic, almost stupid, to look upon him as responsible for Mrs. Lester's murder, but there was always a possibility that he might be utilizing the chance which led him to her apartments shortly before the crime was committed to cover himself and his movements with a veil of spurious mystery. In a word, though Thaden had likened his visitor's face to a mask of ivory, he had momentarily forgotten the ominous token found on Mrs. Lester's body and duplicated in Forbes's own house by the morning post. Forbes spread wide his hands with the air of one who heard but was allowing his thoughts to wander. When next he spoke, it was only to increase the crazy inconsequence of their talk. Later, perhaps today, perhaps it may never be necessary, I may explain myself to your heart's content, he said slowly. At present, I am here to ask a favor. In the first place, is Mrs. Lester's flat in charge of the police? I suppose so, said Thaden. Is there a detective or constable on duty there now? I'm not sure. I imagine there is not. When the Scotland Yard men and I came out after midnight, they locked the door and took away the key. The um, body is at the mortuary, awaiting the opening of the inquest at three o'clock. Ah, I hoped that would be so. Can you ascertain for certain? But why? Because I wish to go in there. And that brings me to the favor I seek. The secretary of these flats, even the hall porter, should have a master key. 
borrow it on some pretext. They will give it to you. Really, Mr. Forbes, gasped Thaden, voicing his surprise as a preliminary to a decided refusal. He was interrupted by the insistent clang of the telephone that curt herald which brooks no delay in answering its demand for an audience. Pardon me one moment, he said. I'll just see who that is. The inquirer was Evelyn Forbes. I've waited patiently, she began, but he stopped her instantly by saying that her father was with him. Please ask him to come to the phone, she said. Forbes rose at once. He merely assured the girl that he was engaged in important business and would be home soon after the luncheon hour. Meanwhile, she was not to go out, and his orders must be obeyed to the letter. Now, Thaden, he said, coming back to the sitting-room, what about that key? The most extraordinary feature of an extraordinary case was the way in which the mere sound of Evelyn Forbes's voice stilled any qualms of conscience in Thaden's breast. He knew he was acting foolishly in conducting a blind inquiry on his own account, an inquiry which might well arouse the anger and active resentment of the police. But he offered a sop to his better judgment by consulting Bates. Then came a veritable surprise. The fact is, sir, admitted Bates nervously, we have Anne Rogers' key in the kitchen. When she went away on Monday, she left it here, being afraid of losing it. Of course, she took it on Tuesday morning. After going from one fit of hysterics into another, she gave it to us again. Thaden's face was eloquent of the serious view of this avowal. Did you tell the police? he said. No, sir, my missus and me clean forgot all about it. So, while Mrs. Lester was being killed... The key of her flat was actually in your possession? I suppose it might be put that way, sir. By this time, Thaden was becoming exasperated at the veritable conspiracy which fate had engineered for the express purpose, apparently, of entangling him in an abominable crime. Why on earth didn't you mention such an important fact to the detectives? he almost shouted. Don't you see they're bound to think? Oh, plague on the detectives, and on what they think, broke in Forbes imperiously. It doesn't matter a straw what they think, and very little what they do. This affair goes a long way beyond the four-mile radius, Thaden. The vital point is that your man has the key. Where is it? Let us go in there at once. You offered me some advice, Mr. Forbes, said Thaden firmly. Let me now return it in kind. If you wish to examine Mrs. Lester's flat, why not seek the permission of Scotland Yard? My good fellow, I have spent a valuable hour this morning in persuading the Home Secretary that the less Scotland Yard interferes in my behalf, the more effectually shall I be protected. I don't want any detective within a mile of my house or office. But, as I have told you already, explanations must wait. You, Bates, look like a man who can hold his tongue. Do so, and with Mr. Thaden's permission, I'll make it worth your while when this storm has blown over. Now give me that key. Thaden was silenced, if not convinced. He realized, of course, that he must make a full confession to the Criminal Investigation Department before the sun went down, but argued that he might as well see the present adventure through. Soon he and Forbes were standing at the door of number 17. Forbes curbed his impatience sufficiently to permit of any one who happened to be in the interior answering the summons of the electric bell. Of course, no one came. The police had no reason to remain in charge of the place, and Anne Rogers would have become a raving lunatic if left alone there for a half hour. 
The aromatic odor of the burnt joss stick still clung to the suite of apartments, and Forbes noticed it at once. "'Where was the body found?' he asked. Faden led the way to the bedroom. He related Winter's theory of the crime, and pointed out its seeming aimlessness. So far as the police could ascertain from the half-crazy servant, none of Mrs. Lester's jewels was missing— even her gold purse, containing a fair sum of money, was found on the dressing-table. He did not know that the detectives had taken away a few scraps of torn paper, thrown carelessly into the grate, and had carefully gathered up a tiny snake-like curl of white ash from the tiled hearth, which on analysis would probably prove to be the remains of a joss-stick. Forbes gazed at the impression on the side of the bed, as though the body of the woman whom he had last seen, in full possession of her grace and beauty, were still lying there. The vision seemed to affect him profoundly. He did not speak for fully a minute, and when speech came his voice was low and strained. "'Tell me everything you know,' he said. The Scotland Yard men took an unusual step in admitting you to their conclave. They must have had some motive. Tell me what they said, their very words, if you can recall them. Thaden was uncomfortably aware of a strange compulsion to obey. His commonplace, everyday senses cried out in revolt and warned him that he was tampering dangerously with matters which should be left to the cold scrutiny of the law. But some subconscious instinct overpowered these prudent monitors, and he gave an almost exact account of his talk with Winter and Furneaux. Then followed questions, eager, searching, almost uncanny in their prescience, the little one, who strikes me as having more brains than I credit the ordinary London policeman with, spoke of evil deities of China. How did such an extraordinary topic crop up? In connection with the joss stick. Yes, yes, but I don't see the inference. Mr. Winter alluded to the habit some ladies have of burning such incense in their houses, whereupon Furneaux remarked that the Chinese use them to propitiate harmful spirits. Was that all? Thaden felt insensibly that his companion was hinting at something more definite, but he was bound in honour to respect the confidence reposed in him. I don't quite understand, he temporised. Was nothing said as to the finding of some object, such as a small article, obviously Chinese in origin, which might turn an inquirer's thoughts into that channel? The conversation I am relating took place the moment after we had entered the flat. We were standing in the hall. It was wholly the outcome of the strange smell, which was immediately perceptible. Forbes passed a hand over his eyes. "'I wonder,' he breathed. Then, turning quickly on Thaden, he repeated the question. "'Are you quite sure they did not mention the discovery in this room of any object which could be regarded, even remotely, as a sign or symbol left by the murderer to show that his crime was an act of vengeance or retaliation. Thaden hesitated. Unquestionably, he was in a position of no ordinary difficulty. But his doubts were solved by an interruption that brought his heart into his mouth, because a thin, high-pitched voice came through the half-open door. "'Are you thinking of a small ivory skull, Mr. Forbes?' End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Number 17 by Lewis Tracy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wherein Mr. Forbes explains himself. Even the boldest may flinch when confronted with that which is apparently 
a manifestation of the supernatural. Thaden and Forbes were standing in a chamber of death. To the best of their belief, they were alone in an otherwise empty flat, and those ominous words, coming from someone unknown and unseen, blanched their faces with terror. But Thaden was a healthy and athletic young Englishman, and Forbes was of the rarer order which combines a frame of exceptional physique with a mind accustomed to think imperially. Two such men might be trusted to display real grit if surrounded by a horde of veritable spooks. The door was thrown wide as they turned at the sound of the words, and Thaden recognized in a strange little figure wearing a blue serge suit, a straw hat, and brown boots, Ferno, the man whom he had looked on as somewhat of a crank and visionary, during their talk of the previous night. You, he gasped, and the note of recognition was sharpened by a sudden sense of dismay, almost of alarm, because of the overwhelming knowledge that now all his scheming had collapsed, while the representatives of Scotland Yard would regard him as nothing more than a poor sort of trickster. But Forbes was not in the habit of yielding to any man, no matter what his status, or howsoever awe-inspiring might be the Department of State which he represented. "'Who the devil are you, at any rate?' he cried angrily. "'And what right have you to spy on gentlemen in this manner, listening to their conversation, and breaking in with a cheap stage effect obviously intended to startle? Furneaux remained motionless, his feet set well apart and his hands thrust into his trousers' pockets. The trim, natty figure, the spruce and summer-like attire, the small, wizened face, with its cynically humorous and wide-awake aspect, Above all, a certain jauntiness of air and cocksure expression certainly did not suggest a comedian fresh from the boards. "'You tell,' he said, nodding to Thaden. "'This is Mr. Furneau of Scotland Yard,' said the latter nervously. He imagined he could detect in Furneaux's glance a mixture of amusement and contempt amusement at the notion that any amateur should harbor the belief that the two best men in the yard could be egregiously hoodwinked, and contempt of one who so far forgot himself as even to dare attempt such a thing in relation to a police inquiry into a murder. I don't know, and care less, who Mr. Furneaux of Scotland Yard may be, went on Forbes hotly. I resent his intrusion and wish to be relieved of his presence. Why? said Furneaux. I have given my reasons to the Home Secretary. That mere statement must suffice for you. Really, I must ask you to be more explicit. I visited the Home Office this morning and placed such evidence in the hands of the Home Secretary that Scotland Yard will be requested to suspend all further investigation into the death of Mrs. Lester. Do you mean that the Home Secretary has sanctioned the breaking off of this inquiry? In the conditions, because... If that is what your words imply, Mr. Forbes, I may tell you at once that I don't believe you. It is more than any Home Secretary dare do, and if you harbor any lingering doubts on the point, go to Mr. Thaden's telephone, ring up the Home Office, and tell the gentleman at the other end of the wire exactly what I have said. Of course, you don't really mean anything of the sort. By virtue of some special and inside knowledge of certain facts communicated to the Home Secretary, you may have persuaded him to promise that...
provided the ends of justice are not defeated thereby, every precaution will be taken to keep the main lines of the inquiry secret until the whole position can be laid before the law officers of the Crown. The Home Secretary may have gone that far, Mr. Forbes, but not one inch farther, and you know it. The two antagonists, so singularly disproportionate in size, were yet so perfectly matched in the vastly more important qualities of brain and nerve that the contest lost all sense of inequality. Thaden felt himself of no account in this duel. He was like an urchin watching open-mouthed a combat of gladiators. Forbes, not without a perceptible effort, choked down his wrath and recovered his poise. "'You have gauged the state of affairs accurately enough,' he said, speaking more calmly. "'May I then recommend you to consult your direct superiors before carrying your investigations any further, Mr. Furneau, Charles Francois Furneau. Just so, Mr. Charles Francois Furneau. I give you my full name because one of the peculiar features of this case is the inability of some persons mixed up in it to recall names, or even the mere salient facts and the detective's glance dwelt for an instant on Thayden, who, again, in his own estimation, shrank into the boots of a fourth-form boy detected by a master in an overt breach of college rules. But the little man was speaking impressively, and Thayden compelled his wandering wits to pay attention. "'It will clear the air, perhaps,' went on Furneaux, if I point out that if anyone here is playing the spy, carrying on some underhanded game, that is, it is not I. These apartments are in charge of the police. The manager of the whole block of flats and the porter of this particular section have been warned that no one can be allowed to enter number 17 on any pretext until our inquiry is closed. Now, Mr. Forbes, kindly explain how you contrived to get possession of a key. An experienced man of the world like Forbes could hardly fail to see that he was in a false position, and that any persistent attempt to browbeat the detective would not only meet with utter failure, but might possibly compromise him gravely. That was a simple matter, he said. Mrs. Lester's servant left her key in Mr. Thaden's establishment. Bates surprised both his master and me by producing it when I expressed a wish to examine the place. But why adopt such a clandestine method? Forbes's face, usually so classic in outline, assumed a certain rigidity, and his firm chin grew markedly aggressive. "'I don't answer questions put in that way,' he said. Furneaux laughed sardonically. "'You meet with greater respect in Capel Court, I have no doubt,' he snapped. "'There you stand on a pedestal.' with one hand flourishing a checkbook and the other resting gracefully on the neck of a golden calf. Here you are simply an ordinary citizen, behaving in a suspicious manner. If the uniformed policeman on the neighboring beat knew what I know of your recent movements, he would arrest you without ceremony and charge you with being concerned in the murder of Mrs. Lester. Between you and Mr. Thaden, the work of my department has been hindered and burked most scandalously. Don't glare at me like that. I don't care tuppence for your millions and your social position. What I do care about 
is the horrible risk you and each member of your family are incurring. You know why, and while you are still alive, I mean to force you to speak the truth. Tell me now why Mrs. Lester was killed. Tell me, too, why the same hand which thrust a little ivory skull into the dead woman's underbodice caused a similar token to be delivered to you by this morning's post. Ah, that touches you, does it? Now, my worthy financier and philanthropist, step down from your pedestal and behave like a being of flesh and blood. Forbes positively wilted under that extraordinary attack. His white face grew wan and his eyes dilated with surprise and terror. The detective's words seemed to have the effect of a paralytic shock. Thenceforth he was underdog in the fight. How do you know, he gasped, that I received an ivory skull this morning? Have you been to my house? Did my daughter tell you? Furno chuckled. You're ready to listen, eh? Well, I don't mind telling you that I have not stirred out of this flat since seven o'clock this morning, and I question if your letters were delivered in Fortescue Square at that hour. I give in, said Forbes curtly. Need we remain here? The smell of that cursed joss stick oppresses me. Then Thaden found his tongue. If Mr. Furneaux cares to abandon his vigil... My flat is entirely at your disposal, he said. My vigil, as you accurately describe it, has ended for the time being, said Furneaux, apparently mollified by the millionaire's surrender. I was sure that if I remained here long enough, I would clear away some of the fog attached to a case which promises to be one of the most remarkable I have ever investigated. Come, gentlemen, let us be amiable to one another. I'm sorry if I lost my temper just now, but I regard myself as being the only detective in existence who uses other sections of his brain than those governed by statutes made and provided and it riles me when men of superior intelligence, like yourselves, treat me as though my mission in life was to direct the traffic and keep a sharp eye on mischievous juveniles. Mr. Thaden, can that soldier servant of yours make coffee? His wife can, said Thaden. Will you be good enough, then, to set her to work thus far? Since the sun rose, I have stayed the pangs of hunger with an apple and a glass of water. By this time, Thaden had thoroughly revised his first estimate of the diminutive detective. Indeed, he was beginning to look on him as quite a noteworthy person, a man whose mental equipment it was most unwise to assess at any lower valuation than the somewhat exalted one which Furneaux himself had set forth with such refreshing candor. As for Forbes, the millionaire seemed to have sunk into a species of stupor since Furneaux spoke of the ivory skull. He uttered no word until the three were seated in Thaden's room, and his expression was so woe-begone that it stirred even the mercurial Jerseyite to pity. I imagine that a cup of coffee will do you also a world of good, he said. Then, whirling round on Thaden, he stuck a question into him as if each word was a stiletto. Where do you get your coffee? At the grocer's was the surprised answer. Is that all you know about it? Yes. Singular thing, isn't it? mused the detective aloud. How idiotic men and women can be in their attitude toward the supreme things of life. What is of greater importance 
than the food we eat and the liquors we drink. Through them, the body reconstitutes itself hourly and daily. Providence gives us a perfect engine, yet we clog and choke its shafts and cylinders by supplying it haphazard with any sort of fuel and lubricant, no matter how unsuited either may be to its purpose. Take coffee, for instance. The physiological action of coffee depends on the presence of the alkaloid caffeine, which varies from 0.6% in the Arabian berry to 2% in that of Sierra Leone. Again, the aromatic oil, caffeine, which is developed by roasting, increases in quantity the longer the seeds are kept. Unfortunately, coffee beans lose weight during storage, so you have a clear commercial reason why grocers should not sell the best coffee unless under compulsion of an enlightened public opinion. Now you, Mr. Forbes, would never dream of putting your money into an investment without full and careful inquiry into the history and scope of the proposed undertaking, while our young friend here would snort furiously at a split infinitive or a false rhyme, yet when I submit the vital problem of the sort of coffee you imbibe, the very essence and nutriment of your brains and bodies, you hear the kind of answer I receive. All this, of course, was excellent fooling, intended to dispel the brooding horror which had suddenly descended upon Forbes, since it was borne in on him that the demoniac wrath wreaked on Mrs. Lester was now directed with equal ferocity against his family and himself. To an extent, Erno's scheme succeeded. A gleam of interest shot from the millionaire's eyes. They lost their introspective look. He even smiled wistfully. "'You are a man after my own heart, Mr. Furneaux,' he said. "'I had no idea that the Criminal Investigation Department employed philosophers of your caliber. I suppose that you and I are about to swallow coffee containing indeterminate percentages of the chief constituents you named.' One does not look at gift coffee in the cup, grinned the little man, obviously well pleased with himself. But if ever you two gentlemen favor my obscure dwelling with a visit and partake of a meal, you will have a strict analysis with every bite and sup. There is a grocer in Battersea who used to tremble at the sight of me. Now, he has learned wisdom and has quadrupled his trade by publishing learned disquisitions on the nature and quality of each principal article he sells. You ought to read his treatise on butter. He is an authority on the dietetic value of jam. The nutritive properties of his cheese are ruining the local butchers. Furneaux's efforts were rewarded when the really excellent beverage provided by Mrs. Bates was disposed of. Forbes seemingly atoned for his earlier secretiveness by placing every fact in his possession fully and fairly before his auditors. Nearly seven years ago, he said, I made a very large sum of money by amalgamating certain shipping interests at a favorable moment. Thus, as it happened, I had, at command, practically unlimited resources when I was asked to finance the cause of reform in China. The wretched lot of the Chinese nation had always appealed to my sympathies. Some hundreds of millions of the most industrious and peace-loving people in the world have been exploited for centuries by a predatory caste. Given a chance to expand, freed from the shackles of the Manchus, the Chinese, in my opinion, contained the elements which go to form a great race. But the Manchus held them in bondage, body and soul and so powerful is self-interest, there has never been an emperor or statesman 
who strove to elevate the masses, who was not mercilessly assassinated as soon as he allowed his intent to become known. The only path to freedom lay through revolution, and I had reason to believe that the ruling faction could be overthrown by a well-organized and properly financed movement without the appalling bloodshed which often accompanies such dynastic changes. At any rate, I entered the conspiracy heart and soul, but I met with two difficulties at the outset. I could not exercise efficient financial control in London, and I could neither go and live in the Far East nor transact my business through ordinary banking channels. So I had to find a substitute, and my choice fell on a rising young barrister named Arthur Lester, whom I had known since he was a boy, who had married the daughter of an old friend. He had a taste for adventure, and was alive to the magnificent career which lay before one who helped materially in the rebirth of China. In a word, he went to Shanghai as my agent, and the outcome of his work there is the present Chinese constitution. Of course, as holds good in all human affairs, events did not follow the precise track mapped out for them. But, on the whole, he and I were satisfied. China is awake at last. The giant has stirred, and if his first uncertain steps have deviated from the open road of reform, Manchu arrogance and domination, at any rate, are shadows of the past. But, unhappily, the conquerors, who have been so efficiently thrust aside, have now embarked on a secret campaign of vengeance and reaction. A society which calls itself the Young Manchus is inspired by one principle and one only, and that is death to the reformers. I don't suppose you gentlemen follow closely the trend of affairs in China, but you must have read of the assassinations of prominent men reported occasionally in the newspapers. Furneaux clicked his tongue so loudly that Forbes stopped speaking and looked at him, thinking, apparently, that the little detective meant to say something. He did, but it was Thaden whom he addressed. I'd give a week's pay if Winter was here now, and I could see those big eyes of his bulging out of his head, he cackled. Thaden nodded. He understood perfectly. Then he caught Forbes' inquiring glance and explained matters. Mr. Furneaux hinted last night at some such development as that which your present statement conveys, and his colleague, Mr. Winter, pretended to scout it, he said. Pretended? shrieked Furneaux, instantly in a rage. That was how it struck me, said Thaden coolly. Didn't I drag the Chinese aspect of the crime out of him with pincers? came the indignant demand. Unquestionably, I only remark that your large-sized friend had it tucked away all the time at the back of his head. Furneaux pounded the table so viciously that the cups rattled. Of course, he has a nose to smell joss sticks and eyes to see an ivory skull. But didn't he say I was talking nonsense when I spoke about Shang-Ti scowling from a porcelain vase? He shrilled. Yes, for all that, I don't think he missed the least hint of your meaning. Furneaux gazed at Thaden fixedly. Sorry, he said with an acid tone that was almost malicious. I imagined you were so busy throwing dust in our eyes that you wouldn't have noticed such fine shades of perception on Winter's part. But Thaden was now able to measure this strange little man with some degree of accuracy. He only smiled. As a thrower of dust, I was a most abject failure, he said. Furneaux smiled and turned to the millionaire. 
Pardon the interruption, he said. Like every artist, I am pained when my best efforts are scoffed at by heedless mediocrity. You, at least, will understand what a big thing it was to deduce even the vaguest outline of the truth from the facts at my command. I certainly do, agreed Forbes. Until this morning, I was convinced that Mrs. Lester's death removed the one person in England who knew of my connection with the revolution in China. To revert to the young Manchus, they have secured far more victims than the world at large is aware of. I am sure that they poisoned Arthur Lester, and his wife held the same view. They aim at nothing less than the extinction of the democratic cause by the murder of every prominent man connected with it. But they never yet have been able to obtain a full and authentic list of the reform leaders. They suspected poor Lester of complicity in the movement and killed him. It was through Mrs. Lester that I first became aware of their existence as an active organization. And I hoped that when she had returned to England and was living quietly in London, she would be lost sight of, ignored, in fact. Nevertheless, both she and I thought it prudent that our acquaintance should cease until the turmoil in China had subsided. For that reason, I never visited her, nor did I permit the growth of friendship between her and my wife and daughter, a friendship which, in happier conditions, would have been natural and inevitable. But we were woefully mistaken. An oriental vendetta neither slackens nor dies. By some means wholly unknown to me, the young Manchus must have discovered, or guessed, that in leaving Lester's widow out of their reckoning, they had lost a promising clue. Be that as it may, they followed her to London, and by a singular fatality, I was the first to know of it. Last Monday, while driving home from the city, my car was held up in Piccadilly for a few seconds. Looking idly out at the passing crowd, I saw a Chinaman in European clothes. He was waiting to cross the road, so I was able to scrutinize him carefully, and owing to a scar on the left side of his face, recognized him. His name is Wang Li Fu, a Manchu of the Manchus, a Mandarin of almost imperial lineage. Some years ago, he was a young attaché at the Chinese embassy here. Suddenly, while on the way to my house, I recollected that certain members of the Revolutionary Committee had spoken of this very man as being one of the ablest and most scrupulous adherents of the Manchu faction in Peking. Somehow his presence in London was disconcerting and menacing. Who, more likely than he, I argued, to be a leading spirit among the young Manchus? In any event, London was not big enough to hold both Mrs. Lester and him, and I decided to visit her that very night, telling her I had seen Wang Li Fu, and advised her to go away into the country, leaving no record of her whereabouts. I happened to be taking my daughter to Daly's Theatre, and contrived to slip away on some pretext after the performance. I found Mrs. Lester alone in her flat, and she fell in with my views at once, because she, too, had heard of this very man, and the mere sound of his name terrified her. I was half inclined to urge that she should go to an hotel for the night, but the lateness of the hour, and the seeming fact that, if danger threatened, she was safe at least till the morrow, prevented me. Fernot, sitting on the edge of a chair, his head bent forward, his piercing black eyes intent as those of a hawk, a hand resting on each knee, his attitude curiously suggestive of a readiness to spring forward at any instant, 
now leaned over and tapped the millionaire decisively on the shoulder. You couldn't have saved her, Mr. Forbes, he said gravely. She was marked down as the first warning. Didn't the letter you received this morning tell you something of the sort? Agitation gave place to utter astonishment in Forbes' face. In heaven's name, how do you know anything of that letter? he cried. I will tell you later, but am I not right? Yes, you are. Where is it? May I see it? Forbes took a creased and soiled document from a small flat cardboard box, which he carried in the breast pocket of his coat. But first he withdrew from the box a little object and placed it on the table. It was an ivory skull, and the very presence of such a sinister token brought some hint of the charnel house into the cosy and sunlit room. For no, a creature oddly constituted, either of all nerves or of no nerves, disregarded the skull. He had eyes only for the few words typed on a single sheet of note paper. They ran. James Creighton Forbes, if you are willing to come to terms, announce the fact by advertisement in Thursday's Times. Address your reply to Y.M. and sign it, J.C.F. Yield, and you will hear further. Refuse, and no other warning will be given. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Number 17 by Lewis Tracy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The First Counterstroke Furneaux apparently made up his mind with reference to the contents of a somewhat enigmatic message after one quick, unerring perusal. The man who wrote that took a great many things for granted he said. He assumed, firstly, that you knew of Mrs. Lester's death and understood its significance. Secondly, that you are aware of the nature of the terms he will offer. Thirdly, that you may hesitate between compliance and threatened death. Y.M., of course, can be read as young man choose. Even there, the writer exhibits artistic reticence. Frankly, Mr. Forbes, I wish you had come straight to Scotland Yard on Monday evening, instead of wasting those precious hours at Daly's Theatre. Forbes was moved to energetic protest. How was I to deduce the true nature of these hellhounds' mission from a casual glance? vouchsafed of one who may or may not be their leader, he cried. Yet you treat your discovery as serious enough to warrant a prompt visit to the woman with whom association was dangerous. Yes, I wanted to act secretly. Just so? You were afraid the police would bungle the job? Between you and Mr. Thaden, you have exhibited remarkable skill in heading us off the scent. Fortunately, we were able to dispense with your assistance, having other matters to occupy our brains. You were two ripe nuts waiting to be cracked and have the contents extracted at leisure. There were a few freshly broken shells lying about, which invited immediate attention. For instance, some four months ago, a well-known and reputable firm of private inquiry agents was instructed from Canton to secure all possible information about Mrs. Lester and you. Yes, you, Mr. Forbes. Your household, friends, 
method of living, servants, tradesmen, every sort of fact, indeed, which might be useful to a thoroughgoing and well-organized society of cutthroats like the young man choose. The inquiry agents did their work well and were handsomely paid for it. I haven't the least doubt that Wang Li Fu knows what brand of cigars you favor and what you eat for breakfast. His informants sent us a copy of their notes an hour after the murder was announced in the newspapers. Mr. Lester is removed in Shanghai. His widow comes home. The inquiry agents receive instructions. They forward their report to Canton, and Wang Li Fu turns up in London. The program is a tribute to the excellence and regularity of the mail service between England and the Far East. While the detective was speaking, Forbes's face, already haggard, had grown desperate. I care little for my own life, he said. But I shall stop short of no measures to protect my wife and daughter. I certainly recommend that an armed guard should be on duty day and night in any house where you may happen to be living at the moment, replied Furno airily. I really think that if your safety alone were at stake, I would do you a good turn by arresting you on suspicion. Of what crime? Of killing Mrs. Lester, to be sure. I regard you as a clever man, Mr. Furneaux, so may I remind you that this is neither the time nor the place for a display of gross humor. Thaden expected that Furneaux would flare into anger at this well-deserved rebuke, but much to his surprise, the detective treated the matter argumentatively. Personally, I have looked on you from the outset as an innocent man, he said placidly. But just to show how circumstantial evidence may be twisted into plausible error, let me point out that nearly all the known facts conspire against you. Have you considered how dexterously a prosecuting counsel would treat your admission that Mrs. Lester was the only one person in England who knew of your connection with the Revolutionary Party in China? And how would you set about convincing a stolid British jury that you were acting in the interests of law and order in concealing your visit to Number 17 on the night of the murder? These fine-drawn speculations, however, are a sheer waste of breath. Suppose we concoct an advertisement for the Times. Do you mean that I am to parley with these ruffians? Of course you are. But the Home Secretary agreed with me that no action should be taken until the Chinese legation had considered the matter. And pray, what can the legation do? They have their own sources of information. When all is said and done, Orientals are best fitted to deal with Orientals. Furneaux laughed sarcastically. If I remember rightly, the way in which the Chinese embassy dealt with one of your pet reformers some years ago, did not win general approval. No, Mr. Forbes, we must try and circumvent the wily Chinese by other methods than torture and imprisonment. Of what avail will it be if this fellow, Wang Li Fu, is laid by the heels? Isn't it more than certain that he has plenty of determined helpers? Do you imagine that he killed Mrs. Lester? Not a bit of it. He will be able to produce the clearest proof that he was miles away from Innismore Mansions on Monday night. 
Now, let's see how we can get him to show his hand a little more openly. And how would this be? YM terms can be arranged. JCF. The terms are, of course, that the whole gang be hanged or sent to penal servitude and deported. One moment, struck in Thaden. I have something to say before you decide on any definite action. I need hardly inflict on you, Mr. Furneaux, an explanation of my silence hitherto. I don't even apologize for it. Faced by a similar dilemma tomorrow, I should probably take the same line. But to adopt your own simile, now that Mr. Forbes has come out of his shell and admits his presence here on Monday night, my self-imposed restrictions cease. In the first place, then, Miss Beale came here this morning. Excellent. I wondered who the lady was. And secondly, the grey car which pursued me on Monday seems to have been partly identified later. A car resembling it in every detail deposited someone at the Chinese legation in Portland Place at an hour which corresponds closely with its presence here. Ah, that is important. I like that. I wasn't far wrong when I sensed you as an absolute carrier of clue germs in this affair, cried Furneaux. The Chinese embassy? gasped Forbes. What car? And why should any car pursue you? Do you mean that you were followed on leaving my house? It was lamentable to watch the inroad which each successive shock was making on Forbes's physical resources. But Thaden affected to ignore the new fright in his eyes and told him what had happened. Although he could see that Furneaux was in a fever of impatience to learn the later news, he thought that Forbes should know the facts in view of the remarkable statement that he had visited the Chinese embassy that morning. In one respect, the recital was a test of the millionaire's professed readiness to deal candidly with the police. Thaden was half inclined to believe that the other was still wishful to conceal that part of the day's doings. But he was mistaken. When he had finished his own story and given the taxi man's version of the grey car's appearance in Portland Place, Forbes threw out his hands in a gesture of despair. If the embassy people are playing me false, I do not know whom to trust, he said brokenly. I have just come from there, and they assure me that if Wong Li Fu and his gang are in London, they are absolutely ignorant of the fact. Phew, cried Furneaux, snapping a thumb and finger. Don't worry about that. Put yourself in the position of the Chinese ambassador. He can't even guess who may be the ruler of China from one day to another. Yesterday it was an old wise woman, today a dictator, tomorrow the mob. Who can foretell what shape the lava erupted from a volcano will take? Bet you a new hat, Mr. Forbes, that the minute the embassy hears of Mrs. Lester's murder, they put two and two together and keep a sharp eye on these mansions and on your house. That gray car is nothing more nor less than a red herring accidentally drawn across the trail. Some cute Chinaman said, Hallo! That murdered woman is the wife of Forbes's agent in Shanghai. Now let's see what Forbes is doing, and who visits him, and perhaps we'll learn something. Want a bet? Forbes could not help but recover some of his shattered nerve in view of the detective's airy optimism. Still, he was shaken and dubious. Don't forget that the Chinese ambassador has no knowledge whatsoever of my share in the revolution, he said. And don't forget that for ways which are dark and tricks which are vain, 
the heathen Chinese is peculiar, retorted Vernot. How can you be sure that there is not in the embassy at this moment a full statement of your payments into the reformers' funds, as well as the list of conspirators which our friend Wang Li Fu is in search of? I think that such a thing is almost impossible. Is there really anything impossible? We used to believe that, once a man was dead, he could not be brought to life again. A Frenchman has just demonstrated that by a judicious application of galvanism to the heart and salt water to the veins, any average corpse can be revived. Evidently, Fernot was enjoying himself. He sat there, absorbing new impressions and irradiating scraps of irrelevant knowledge in a way that would have been full of significance to Winter had he been present. Fernot was never so mercurial, never so ready to jump from one subject to another as when his subtle brain was working at high pressure. He actually reveled in a crime which lay on the borderland of the exotic and the grotesque. Like the French philosopher in Poe's Tales of Mystery and Imagination, the savant who read his newspaper in a dingy Paris room and solved by sheer force of intellect extraordinary criminal problems which baffled the shrewdest official minds he felt, in relation to this particular tragedy, that he required only to be brought in touch with certain contingent forces bound up with it, Forbes, for instance, and in a minor degree Thaden, and in due course he would be able to go forth and find the master wrongdoer. Suddenly the millionaire seemed to cast off the cloak of despair which clogged his energies and impaired his brilliant intellect. He rose to his feet and involuntarily squared his shoulders. Surely we are wasting valuable hours which should be given to action, he cried. I am going to the city and shall arrange for a prolonged absence from my office. Then I'll hurry home, perfect my defenses, and defy these murderous curs. My wife must come to London. In a crisis like this, I must have my loved ones under my own personal supervision. I can still shoot straight and quick, and woe betide any man, white or yellow, who enters my house unbidden. As for this infernal symbol... He raised a clenched fist and would have pounded into fragments the thin fabric of the ivory skull, still lying where he had placed it on the table, had not Furneaux snatched it into safety. No, no, protested the detective. I want that for purposes of comparison. Kindly give me that typed note, too, Mr. Forbes. It may bear finger marks, you can never tell. The cardboard box in which it was posted also, thank you. Now a few more questions before you go. How much money did you provide for the revolutionaries? Two millions sterling. As a gift or as a loan? If they failed, I lost every farthing, of course. If they succeeded, I was to recoup myself by financing the new government. But I gather that they have neither failed nor succeeded. China has a constitution, but the presidential election was conducted hmm, online suspiciously akin to those recently adopted in Mexico. Nevertheless, negotiations are now on foot for a big loan. If you died, what would become of the two millions? They would be lost irretrievably. Furneaux sat back in his chair. That gives one furiously to think, he said. The grey car comes back into the picture. What do you mean? I don't know, but I'll tell you what. 
The man who first spoke of a Chinese puzzle as a metaphor for something downright bewildering knew what he was talking about. Forbes put a hand to his forehead in an unconscious gesture of hopelessness. My brain is reeling, he muttered, to think that in the London of today we should live in abject terror of a band of Mongolian ruffians. Why do you remain here, man? You vaunt the prowess of your department. Why are you not scouring every haunt of Chinamen in the East End? Spread your net widely, and you will surely get hold of some minor scoundrel who will talk for fear or money. Bribe him to the point where he cannot refuse to speak. Wang Li Fu is the only man I fear. Put him where he can accomplish no mischief, and the rest of his crew will be powerless. When you come to count up the achievements of my friend Winter and myself, in the face of stupid but nonetheless disheartening obstacles, we have not done so badly in two days, said Furneaux complacently. Can I drive you anywhere? My car is waiting. No, thanks. The truth is, Mr. Forbes, I look on you as a disturbing influence. A man who can talk as calmly as you about dropping two millions on a crazy project to introduce Western methods into China is not fitted for the phlegmatic and judicial atmosphere of Scotland Yard. If I want any money, I'll come to you. If not, and all goes well at number 11 Fortescue Square, the next time I'll trouble you will be when you are asked to identify Wang Li Fu, dead or alive. Forbes seemed hardly to be aware of Furneaux's words. He went out. Thaden accompanied him, and as they descended the stairs together, the older man said brokenly, It is my wife and daughter for whom I fear. I can hardly control my senses when I think of these yellow fiends contemplating vengeance on me through them. Thaden, do you believe in that detective? He is either a vain fool or a genius. By the way, I forgot to ask him how he found out that I had received the warning delivered by this morning's post. I'll try and worm an explanation out of him. If he tells me, I'll telephone you later. He is an extraordinary creature, but abnormally clever at his work, I am sure. For my own part, I feel disposed to trust him implicitly. I wish you had met his colleague, Chief Inspector Winter. He is the sort of man whose mere presence inspires confidence. Forbes halted on the step of the automobile and glanced at his watch. I shall be home in an hour, he said. After that, I shall not stir out all day. Telephone me if you have any news. Why not dine with us tonight? Thaden's eyes sparkled. He was longing to meet Evelyn Forbes once more, but a wretched doubt diminished the glow of gratification which the prospect brought. Should he, or should he not, tell the girl's father of the rather indiscreet admissions she had made during their brief talk that morning. That minor worry, however, was banished suddenly and forever. Furneaux, taking the three steps which led from entrance hall to pavement with a flying leap, cannoned right into Forbes, whom he grasped with both hands, quite as much by way of emphasis as to check the impetus of his diminutive body, in with you, he piped. Tell your chauffeur to obey my orders, no matter what they are. Action, determination, were as the breath of the millionaire's nostrils. He aroused himself instantly. You hear, Downs? he said to the chauffeur. Downs was one of those strange beings who have been evolved by the age of petrol, 
an automaton compounded seemingly of steel, springs, and leather. He had long ago lost the art of speech, having cultivated delicacy of hearing and quickness of sight at the expense of all other human faculties. The old-time coachman possessed a certain fluent jargon which enabled him to chide or encourage his horses and exchange suitable comments with the drivers of brewer's drays and market carts, but the modern chauffeur is all ear for the rhythm of machinery, all an eye for the nice calculation of the hazards of the road fifty yards ahead. At any rate, Downs mumbled something which resembled, yes, sir. Forbes sprang in and slammed the door. Fernot raced round the front of the car and perched himself beside Downs, and the heavy automobile was almost into its normal stride before it had travelled twice its own length. Faden was left gaping on the pavement. He saw that the car turned west and caught a glimpse of Furneaux's outstretched hand, with forefinger pointing like a barrel of a pistol. "'Fool!' he cried in bitter self-apostrophe. "'Why didn't I jump in after Forbes? Now I'm out of the hunt. I wonder what the deuce Furneaux saw or heard.' That concluding thought sent him back to the flat two steps at a time. "'Bates!' he shouted. Has Mr. Furno used the telephone, or did anyone ring up? No, sir, said Bates, coming hurriedly at the urgent call. Fust thing I knew, he was tearing out and running downstairs like mad. Oh, double distilled idiot that I am, growled Faden again. Why didn't I go with them? As though the gods heard his plaint and meant to crush him with their answer, the telephone bell sounded at his elbow. Mechanically, he lifted the receiver off its hook and immediately became aware of Tomlinson's voice with some element of flurry and distress in its unctuous accents. "'That you, Mr. Thaden?' said the butler. "'Yes.' "'Have you had any news of Mr. Forbes, sir?' "'Yes, he has just left me.' "'Ah, if only I had known and had given you a call before ringing up the city. "'What is it? Can I do anything?' "'It's Miss Evelyn, sir.' "'Yes, what of her?' "'She's gone, sir.' Thaden's heart apparently stopped for a second and then raced madly into tumultuous action again. "'Gone? Good Lord, man, what do you mean?' he almost groaned. A telegram came from Mrs. Forbes at Eastbourne, saying she was ill and wanted Miss Evelyn. I tried all I knew to persuade Miss Evelyn to wait until she had just spoken to her father, but she wouldn't listen. She just threw on a hat and a wrap and took a taxi to Victoria.' Some membrane or film of tissue, which might have served hitherto to shut off from Frank Thaden's cheery temperament any real knowledge of the pitfalls which may beset the path of the unwary, seemed in that instant to shrivel as though it had been devoured by flame. He knew, how or why he could never tell, that the girl had been drawn into the plot which had already claimed so many victims and sought so many more. All doubt vanished. He spoke and acted with the swift certainty of a man tackling an emergency for which he had prepared during a long period of training and expectation. Mr. Forbes may arrive at any moment, Tomlinson, he said. Tell his office people to let you know if he goes to the city first. When you hear from or see him, say that I have either accompanied or followed Miss Evelyn to Eastbourne. If I do not catch the same train, I shall take prompt measures in other respects. Got that? Yes, sir. It was easy to distinguish the relief in Tomlinson's utterance. 
relief mingled doubtless with astonishment that a comparative stranger should display such an authoritative and prompt interest in the family affairs that is all write down my message lest you omit any part of it thaden rang off come he said to bates who had not retired to his den but was listening discreet yet rabbit-eared to these queer proceedings followed by the manservant he darted into the sitting-room and did several things at once he unlocked a drawer and took from it a considerable sum of money which he kept there for emergency journeys also pocketing an automatic pistol pouncing on an a b c timetable he looked up the trains for eastbourne a fast train left victoria at one twenty five p m the hour was now one o five meanwhile he was talking bates he said i promised miss beale the lady who came here this morning that my sister mrs paxton would visit her this evening say about six miss beale is staying at smith's hotel german street go to mrs paxton and see her waiting at her house if she happens to be out tell her everything you know about mrs lester's death and ask her to take care of miss beale this evening she will understand I'll wire her at Smith's Hotel before the dinner hour, if possible. If anybody calls here, I leave it to your discretion and your wife's, whether or not they should be informed of my movements. Mr. Forbes or the police, of course, must be told everything. Miss Forbes is probably in the 1.25 p.m. train for Eastbourne, and I am going with her. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I'll wire or phone you later. Grabbing a straw hat and a bundle of telegraph forms, Thaden vanished, not even waiting to slam the outer door. Bates, who had seen service, knew that men in time of stress and danger acted just like the detective and his own employer. By jingo, he muttered, beginning to assemble the empty coffee cups on a tray. Things is waking up here, and no mistake. Thaden was fortunate in finding a taxicab depositing a fare at a neighboring block. Just before he reached the vehicle, a gentleman hurried out of the building and forestalled him. Thaden dashed up and caught the other man by the arm. My need is urgent, he said. Let me have this cab. The stranger smiled good-humouredly, He was an American and had not the least objection to being hustled by a Britisher. Indeed, he rather appreciated this exhibition of haste as a novel experience. "'I'm on a hair-trigger myself,' he said pleasantly. "'I want to make Victoria pretty quick. Can I give you a lift?' "'I'm in with you,' cried Zayden. "'Now, cabby, half a sovereign if you get us to Victoria, Brighton Line.' in fifteen minutes. I'll pay all fines. Then they were off, and the transatlantic cousins were banged against one another as the cab whirled around in sharp semicircle. Say, cried the American, this reminds one of home. I've been here a week and had a kind of notion that London air was half fog, half dope. But you're awake all right. Bet you a five-spot. You're after a girl. I pay, said Satan, his eyes glistening. And such a girl. Her portrait on the paper wrap of a fifty-cent novel would sell it in millions. Gee whiz, is it like that? Go right ahead, Augustus. Never mind me. Take this old bus all the way to Paris. I'll find the fares and hold your hat, but kindly shift that gun into your opposite pocket You've dug it into my thigh quite often enough. If you want to get first drop on the other fellow, shove it up your sleeve. End of chapter 8「Nine of Number 17 by Lewis Tracy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Sharp Work The Americans' easy-going badinage provided the best sort of tonic. Thaden laughed as he transferred the pistol from one pocket to the other. My motto is defense, not defiance, he said. I hope sincerely that I shall not be called on to shoot, or even threaten anyone. Using firearms, although for self-protection, is a very serious matter in this country. May I ask your name? Mine's Thaden. I live in those mansions we've just quitted. And I'm George T. Handyside, 21097 Park Avenue, Chicago, was the answer. Is that your telephone number? No, sir, it's my home address. Well, Mr. Handyside, if ever I come to Chicago, I'll travel along Park Avenue and give you a call. How many days' journey are you from the center of the city? Say, Mr. Thaden, I'm real glad to make your acquaintance. I haven't been joshed that way since I left the steamer. This little island of yours is all right as a beauty spot, but I do wish your people wouldn't carry such a grouch again life generally. Great Scott, it'll do em a heap of good to try a real chesty laugh occasionally. Tell me where I can drop across you in London later in the week, and I'll see if we can't find a smile somewhere. The American scribbled the name of a Strand Hotel on a card, which Thaden disposed in his pocketbook, at the same time producing one of his own cards. You'll hear from me, he said. Now, Mr. Handyside, pardon me for the next few minutes. I have to write telegrams. The first was to Forbes, addressed in duplicate to Old Broad Street and Fortescue Square. It ran... If this message is not qualified by another within a few minutes, I am in the 125 train for Eastbourne. Then to Winter, young lady summoned to Eastbourne by telegram, stating that her mother is ill, suspects the message as bogus, and emanating from Y.M. See for no. He will explain. I am hoping to travel by the same train. If disappointed, we'll wire again immediately. Faded. He read each slip carefully to make sure that the phraseology was clear. The speed at which the cab was traveling rendered his handwriting somewhat illegible, but he thought he saw a means of circumventing that difficulty. Which place are you going? he inquired of his unexpected companion. To a place called Sutton. What time does your train leave? Guess it's about one thirty. You have five more minutes at your disposal than I have. Will you hand in these three messages at the telegraph office? I'll read them to you in case the counter clerk is doubtful about any of my words. Sure thing, Mr. Thaden. You've interested me. I don't care a row of beans if I drop out of Sutton altogether. I'm greatly obliged, but that is not necessary. You'll have loads of time. We're in the park already, and our driver has a clear run to Victoria. Now listen. Mr. Handyside did listen, and pricked his ears at the mention of Scotland Yard. Gosh, he exclaimed. This is better than a lifeline movie. For the love of Millie, let me in by the early door. Now, how's this for a proposition? You send those telegrams, and I'll fix the cab and buy the transportation to Eastbourne for the pair of us. I'm not healed, but I may be useful, and I'll jab any fellow in the solar plexus that call. Thaden gazed at this self-avowed knight-errant in surprise. Handyside was a man of forty, whose dark hair was flecked with grey. He was quietly dressed, a wide-brimmed, high-crowned hat of finely plaited white straw, providing the solo note of markedly American origin in his attire. 
The expression of his well-molded features was shrewd but pleasing, and the poise of a spare but sinewy frame gave evidence of active habit and some considerable degree of physical strength. "'Pon my honour," said the Englishman, "'I'm half inclined to take you at your word, except in the matter of expenses, which, of course, I must bear. You see, if my services are called for, I may need help. "'Go right ahead,' said the other calmly. "'Tell me as much or as little as you like. "'Where's this place, Eastbourne? "'On the south coast, I guess.' "'Yes. I thought it would be. "'A man on the steamer asked me to come and see him at Westgate, "'which is about as far east as you can go in England without getting your feet wet. "'I'm getting the hang of things here by degrees. "'Southport, of course, is away up north, "'and Northamptonshire in the Midlands.' "'Thaden grinned.' but the taxi was passing Buckingham Palace, and the hour was one seventeen p.m. "'I cannot give you any sort of explanation now, Mr. Handyside,' he said. "'Later in the week, perhaps, I may have a big story for your private ear. All I can say at this moment is this. I have reason to believe that a young lady, a daughter of Mr. James Creighton Forbes, a well-known man in the city of London, is being decoyed to Eastbourne in the belief that her mother is ill. Now, I may be wholly mistaken. Her mother may be ill. If that is so, I am making this trip under a delusion. At any rate, my notion is to try and fall in with Miss Forbes, accidentally, as it were, and watch over her until I am quite sure that she is with her mother. You follow me? "'Seems to me,' said the American imperturbably, "'it's the most natural thing in the world "'that Mr. Thaden should want to show his friend "'Mr. Handyside of Chicago, "'England's most bracing and attractive seaside resort, "'if that's the right way to describe Eastbourne. "'Both the plan and the description are admirable. "'A plan sounds all right,' As for the description, I have been looking up a selection of posters, and those seven words apply to every half-mile strip of beach in the island. When it comes to a real showdown, your poster artists have got our real estate men skinned a mile. How much did you promise the taxi man? Half a sovereign. Two fifty. Gee, that's the nearest thing to New York I've struck yet. And the railway tickets. First class, of course? Yes. The cab stopped. Thaden sprang out and raced to the telegraph office, where, as he anticipated, there was a slight delay. Handyside awaited him at the correct barrier, and together they walked down a long platform. Thaden, peering into every carriage, though convinced that Evelyn Forbes would not travel other than first class, thus not being a detective, but only a very anxious and perplexed young man, he had eyes only for such ladies as were already seated in the train, and failed to note the immediate interest his appearance aroused in a man who occupied a window seat and who was watching, unobtrusively, everyone who passed. Oddly enough, after the first wondering glance, this observer was more closely taken up with Handyside. It was as though he said to himself, Thaden, I know, but who in the world is his companion? And why are they travelling by an Eastbourne Express today of all days? The train was well filled. There were only a few seconds to spare when Thaden came across Evelyn Forbes in a compartment which held two other passengers, a lady and a gentleman. Recognition was mutual, and Thaden flattered himself that he betrayed just the right amount of pleasurable astonishment. Miss Forbes, 
he cried, raising his hat. Well, of all the unexpected meetings, don't say you are going to Eastbourne. But I am, she said, and though she smiled, her eyes were heavy with unshed tears. She was deeply attached to her mother, and the thought that the loved one was too ill even to communicate with her by telephone was distressing beyond measure. Just imagine that, went on Thaden, determined to rush his fences and travel with her, unless openly forbidden. I'm taking an American friend there for the afternoon. May we come in your carriage? Is there room for two? Now, although Evelyn Forbes had been attracted to Thaden during their vivacious conversation overnight, she would vastly have preferred the comparative solitude of a journey with strangers. Still, she could hardly refuse such a request, and common sense told her that a pleasant chat with a man who could talk as well as Thaden offered a better means of whiling away two and a half hours than brooding over the nature and extent of her mother's unknown illness. "'There's plenty of room,' she said. Without further ado, Thaden entered, and Handyside followed. The compartment held six seats. The two remaining occupants were worthy Britons who neither invited nor received any special attention. Mr. Handyside was introduced and promptly said the right thing. I guess I knew what I was doing when I forced Mr. Thaden to take me out of London today, he said with a smile which left the girl in no doubt as to the nature of the implied compliment. But it is hardly an hour since I spoke to my father at Mr. Thaden's flat, she said. Were you there too, Mr. Handyside? No, in the next block. That was the nearest I got to Mr. Thaden before we met and took a cab for Victoria. Thaden was pleased with his ally, no diplomat, trained during long years to conceal material facts, could have headed the girl off more deftly without uttering a single untrue word. Ah, she said, glancing meaningly at Thaden, we are all the sport of fortune, then. How strange. Of course, Mr. Thaden, you don't know why I am here. I have had a telegram from my mother, or one sent in her name. She has been taken ill suddenly. That is bad news, was the sympathetic answer. If the message has not come direct from Mrs. Forbes, may it not be rather exaggerated in tone? Some people can never write telegrams. The knowledge that each word costs a half penny weighs on them like a nightmare. As he hoped and anticipated, she produced the message itself from her handbag. This is what it says, she said and read. Mrs. Forbes, ill and unable to communicate by telephone. Come at once, manager, Royal Devonshire Hotel. Then she added, with a suspicious break in her voice, That sounds serious enough, in all conscience. Is it addressed to you personally? said Thaden, racking his wits for some means of lessening the girl's foreboding, without tickling the ears of the other people in the compartment, by suggesting that she might have been brought from her home by some cruel ruse of her father's enemies. Yes. But isn't that somewhat singular in itself? One would imagine that such a significant message would have been sent to your father. Why? Well, men are better fitted to withstand these shocks, for one thing. It was heartless, or to say the least thoughtless, to give you such news with the brutal frankness of a telegram. I cannot understand it at all. Mother wrote this morning, telling me that she was going to Beachy Head this afternoon with a picnic party. I am convinced, said Thaden gravely, that someone has blundered. 
I shall not be content now, Miss Forbes, until I have gone with you to the Royal Devonshire and learnt what the extent of the trouble really is. Then, if Mrs. Forbes needs your presence, perhaps you will allow me to telephone to your father, as he will be greatly disturbed when he returns home and learns the cause of your journey. But I can't think of allowing you two to break up your afternoon on my account. I'm sure when we reach Eastbourne I shall see an array of golf clubs among your luggage. No, smiled Thaden. My friend here refuses to play until he has seen something of the country. He knows that the golfer's vision is bounded by the nearest bunker. Handyside took the cue. That's the exact position, Miss Forbes, he said. I was warned by the horrible experience of a friend of mine. He left Newark, New Jersey, on a sightseeing tour of Europe, but unfortunately took his clubs with him. Now, if you ask him what he thought of Westminster Abbey or the Wye Valley, he tells you he hadn't time to look em up, but that the fifth hole at Sandwich is a corker while the 13th at St. Andrews has been known to restore the faculty of speech to a dumb man. You see, some poor mute had either to express his feelings or bust. Evidently, Miss Evelyn Forbes would not be allowed to mope during the run to Eastbourne. As between Thaden and herself, the situation was curiously mixed. On the one hand, Thaden had now a remarkably close insight into the peril which threatened Forbes and each member of his family. The girl, on the other hand, knew well that her father was bound up in some way with the tragedy at number 17 in his Moor mansions. Nevertheless, an open discussion was out of the question, and the two accepted, cheerfully, the limitations imposed by circumstances so that the strangers in the compartment little suspected what grave issues lay behind an apparently casual meeting between a pretty girl and two men that summer's afternoon in the Eastbourne Express. The American played his part admirably. When not passing some caustically humorous comment on British ways and manners, he was being even more critical of his fellow countrymen. As he himself put it, he guessed New York society was mighty like London society with the head cut off, and proved his contention with many wise saws and modern instances. Thus the journey south passed pleasantly enough. When they alighted, the girl reverted to the topic uppermost in her mind. "'You gentlemen will have to look after your own luggage,' she said, I'm sure you will forgive me if I hurry to the hotel. If you come there, Mr. Thaden, I'll take care that I see you at once. It is exceedingly kind of you to bother with my affairs. But Thaden had a scheme ready, having foreseen this very difficulty. Mr. Handyside will attend to everything, he said glibly. Please let me come with you. I shan't have a moment's peace until assured that Mrs. Forbes is suffering from little more than a slight indisposition. Evelyn looked puzzled, but was willing to agree to anything, so long as she reached her mother quickly. Handyside, too, made matters easy by lifting his hat and walking off in the direction of the luggage van. Well, she said, I really don't care what happens, if only I lose no time. Suiting the action to the word, she hurried toward the exit, and was murmuring something that sounded like an apology for her seeming brusqueness as they passed the ticket collector. Here a momentary difficulty arose. Thaden had forgotten to ask Handyside for his ticket. The girl, of course, had her own ticket, but her companion was not allowed to pass the barrier. He began an explanation to which a busy official paid no heed. In desperation, he produced a sovereign and his card. Here, he said, 
You can hold this as a guarantee that my ticket will be given up. This lady has been called to the bedside of her mother, who is said to be dangerously ill, and I simply must be allowed to take her to the Royal Devonshire Hotel. Luckily, the railway man had the wit to see that this earnest-eyed passenger was speaking the truth. That's all right, sir, he said. We have to be very particular about tickets, you know. Evelyn Forbes was a few yards in advance, and impatiently awaiting her escort, when a gentleman approached and spoke to her. "'Miss Forbes, I believe,' he said, raising his hat. "'Yes,' she answered breathlessly, because the man's garb suggested, before he uttered another syllable, that he was a doctor. He had a curiously foreign aspect, and spoke with a pronounced lisp. "'I am assistant to Dr. Sinnott, he said, and he has sent me to take you to the hotel. This is his car. Will you come quick? He pointed to a smart limousine drawn up near the exit, and in his eagerness to be polite, almost pushed the girl toward the open door. Insensibly, she resisted, and turned to explain matters to Thaden, who had just placated the Cerberus at the gate, and was running after her. Mr. Thaden, she began. There is no time to wait, I assure you, said Dr. Sinnott's assistant imperatively. At that instant, Thaden came up. His temper was ruffled, and he did not scrutinize the doctor's appearance as closely as might be looked for in one who was actually on his guard against foul play. What is it now? he asked. This gentleman has been sent by Dr. Sinnott to take me to the hotel, said Evelyn. Now, Mr. Thaden, perhaps it will be better that you wait for Mr. Handyside and come on at your own leisure. I'm a stiff-necked person, said Thaden, trying to smile unconcernedly. I've made up my mind to see you safely to your destination, and I refuse to leave you on any account. I am sure the doctor will let me sit beside the chauffeur. Then, for the first time, he glanced at the newcomer and was almost stupefied to discover that the man, despite his faultless professional attire, was a Chinaman. Moreover, this Chinaman bore a livid scar down the left side of his face, and his eyes were set horizontally a sure sign of Manchu descent, because all southern Chinese have the oblique Mongolian eye. Though prepared for treachery of some kind, the very simplicity of this scheme almost disconcerted him, and he blurted out the first words that rose to his lips. Is your name Wang Li Fu? Half unconsciously, a hand dropped to the pocket containing the revolver, for answer, he was struck a violent blow in the throat and sent sprawling. The attack was so sudden that he was nearly unprepared for it, nearly not quite, because a flicker of baffled spite in the dark eyes gave him the ghost of a warning. It was fortunate that he saved himself by a slight backward flinching, since he learnt subsequently that his assailant was a master of jiu-jitsu, and that vicious blow was intended to paralyze the nerves which cluster round the cricoid cartilage. Had he received that punch in its full force, he would have at least been disabled for the remainder of the day, and there was some chance of the injury having proved fatal. The Chinaman instantly seized the terrified girl in an irresistible grip, and was about to thrust her into the automobile when a big, burly man flung himself into the fray and collared the desperado by neck and arm. "'Stop that,' he said authoritatively. "'Let go that young lady, or I'll shake the life out of you.' By this time, Thaden was on his feet again and rushing to the assistance of Chief Inspector Winter, 
who seemed to have miraculously dropped from the skies at the right moment. The Chinaman, seeing that he was in imminent danger of capture, released Evelyn, wrenched himself free by another jiu-jitsu trick, swung the girl into Winter's arms, thus impeding him, and leaped into the car, which made off with a rapidity that showed how thoroughly the chauffeur was in league with his principal. Naturally, the people coming out from the station, reinforced by the mob of semi-loafers, always in evidence in such localities, gathered in scores around Evelyn Forbes and her two protectors. Such an extraordinary scuffle was bound to attract a crowd. Few had seen the commencement of the fray, because nothing could be more usual and commonplace in a fashionable place like Eastbourne than the sight of a frock-coated and top-hatted gentleman handing a well-dressed lady into a motor-car. The first general intimation of something bizarre and sensational was provided by Thaden's fall. After that, events travelled rapidly, and the majority of the onlookers imagined that it was Winter who had knocked Thaden off his balance, while the rush made by the latter to intercept Wang Li Fu was actually stopped by a well-intentioned railway porter. Worst of all, Thaden was quite unable to speak. He indulged in valiant pantomime, and Winter fully understood that the Chinaman's escape should be prevented at all hazards. But the chief inspector accepted the inevitable. The limousine was equipped with a powerful engine, and the only vehicles available for pursuit were some ancient horse-drawn cabs. He noted the number on the identification plate, and that was the limit of his resources for the moment. Moreover, Evelyn Forbes, finding herself clutched tightly by a tall, stout man whom she had never seen before, was rather more indignant than hurt. Disengaging herself from the detective's hands, she looked to Thaden for an explanation. "'Has everybody suddenly gone mad?' she said vehemently. "'What is the meaning of this? Did you know who that man was? And why did he try to force me into the car?' Thaden, slowly regaining his breath, stammered brokenly that he would make things clear in a minute or so. Then he gasped to Winter, "'That is Wang Li Fu, the man wanted at number seventeen. "'We'll get him all right,' was the grimly curt answer. "'Meanwhile, are you and Miss Forbes going to the hotel?' Hardly less surprising than Winter's appearance on the scene was his seeming knowledge of the purpose of their journey. "'We must get out of this,' he went on, gazing around wrathfully at the ring of curious faces. "'Here, you!' he cried, singling out a policeman who was forcing a passage through the crowd. "'Clear away this mob and get us a cab.' The policeman seemed inclined to resent the masterful directions, but a word whispered in his ear when he reached winter acted like magic, and he soon had the gapers scattered. A cab was called, and Evelyn Forbes was already inside when Thaden remembered the American. He looked around, but could see nothing of him. "'Where is Mr. Handyside?' he said, still finding a good deal of difficulty in articulating his words. "'Is that the man who came with you from London?' inquired Winter. "'Yes, he's an American.' "'Well, he may have been scared and made a beeline for the States. He's not anywhere in sight. Oh, please, Mr. Thaden, do let us go to the hotel, pleaded Evelyn. She was pale and yielding to reaction after the excitement of the fracas. Unwillingly, since he was certain now that there was absolutely no ground for the girl's alarm on her mother's account, at any rate so far as illness was concerned, Thaden entered the cab, and Winter followed. The first thing to do, 
said the chief inspector, when they were en route, is to assure this young lady, whom I take to be Miss Forbes, that she has probably been brought to Eastbourne by a lying telegram, and that her mother is quite well in health. Secondly, why should Wong Li Fu be described as the man wanted in the Innismore Mansions inquiry? And thirdly, how does Mr. Handyside come into the picture? I can't talk just yet, wheezed Thaden hoarsely. In a few minutes, I'll tell you everything. Evelyn had not realized earlier that her self-appointed champion had been seriously hurt. She was deeply concerned, and wanted to take him straight to the nearest doctor. But he smiled and essayed to calm her fears by whispering that he would soon be fully recovered. It was pleasant to know that he had succeeded in rescuing her from some indefinable, though nonetheless deadly, peril. Yet the insistent question in his subconscious mind was not connected with Evelyn's escape, or the flight of her assailant, or the mysterious presence of the chief inspector, but with the vanishing of Mr. Handyside. What had become of him? It was the maddest of fantasies to imagine that he could be bound up in some way with the young Manchus. Yet why did he fail to turn up at the station? Thaden could not even guess at a plausible explanation. He leaned back in the cab and closed his eyes. Really, there were times in life when it would be a relief to faint. End of chapter 9、Chapter、Ten of Number Seventeen by Lewis Tracy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Captures on both sides. Though Thaden was in first rate athletic trim, that blow on the throat had nearly stunned him. The effort to rise promptly and bear a hand in the imminent capture of one whom he regarded as something akin to a homicidal maniac had imposed a further strain on his resources, and it was possible that he did actually lose his senses during a couple of seconds. In all likelihood, too, he changed color slightly. Because the next thing he was aware of was the note of alarm in Evelyn's voice when she cried excitedly, Mr. Thaden is really very ill. I'm sure we ought to try and revive him. At that, he reopened his eyes and looked at her whimsically. Nature, in fact, had put forth a supreme effort. From that moment, he recovered rapidly. Winter took a calmly professional view of the younger man's collapse. There's nothing to worry about, Miss Forbes, he assured the agitated girl. Our friend has just escaped, being knocked insensible, if not killed. He was hardly prepared for such a vicious attack, I fancy. Most certainly that scoundrel took me by surprise. Or he would not have slipped through my fingers like an eel. Next time, either Mr. Thaden or I may be trusted to balance matters. Thaden grinned and nodded. He signaled with his eyes that Winter was to make Evelyn Forbes understand that she had just escaped being the victim of an extraordinary outrage. Muddled as his thoughts were, He grasped the essential fact that Scotland Yard was better posted in the secret history of the Innismore Mansions crime than he had given the department credit for before the dramatic meeting with Furneaux that morning. And indeed, the chief inspector lost no time in justifying that belief. You must have imagined that the world had suddenly turned topsy turvy. He said, smiling at the mystified and distraught Evelyn, as though the whirl of events outside the station were part and parcel of the humdrum routine of life. 
When Mr. Thaden regains his speech, he will tell us how he came to suspect that an attempt would be made to kidnap you today. In my own case, intervention was the outcome of sheer and simple logical deduction. You see, I represent the Criminal Investigation Department, or Scotland Yard, as it is familiarly described, and I have reason to believe that your father is, and has been for some time, the object of unpleasant attentions by a political society in China, whose members are nothing more nor less than criminal fanatics. Probably this is the first you have heard of the matter, Miss Force. Your father would wish, no doubt, to keep any such disquieting knowledge from you and your mother. But the policy of concealment must cease now. Today's daring attack is a warning. Other efforts may be forthcoming. If you are to be protected efficiently, the police must have your loyal cooperation. I admit candidly that I myself, with all my experience, was taken off my guard a few minutes ago. If Mr. Thaden had not delayed that Chinaman, whose name he has got hold of from Mr. Forbes, I expect, I don't think I could have reached you in time. Is that the meaning of the little ivory skull which my father received at breakfast this morning? said Evelyn breathlessly. Winter's eyes twinkled. No question could have thrown a more vivid light into the somber depths of a crime which promised to transcend in interest and importance any similar occurrence in Great Britain during the previous decade. Doubtless, he said. Of course, I have not yet seen Mr. Forbes, but we have a mine of information here, and he laid a friendly hand on Thaden's arm. So far as I am concerned, I have had your house unobtrusively watched for the protection of the inmates, I hope you understand, and I arranged also that anything unusual in the shape of telegrams or telephonic messages, here he glanced amusedly at Thaden, should be communicated to the yard. I heard, therefore, of Mrs. Forbes's sudden illness almost as soon as you did, and travelled with you to Eastbourne, intending to reach the hotel at the same time as you, and ascertain whether or not your mother was really ill. I saw you on the platform at Victoria and guessed your identity. But in my profession we never take anything for granted, so I left that matter until I could interview the hotel manager. And here we are. I advise you not to say a word about Mrs. Forbes being ill. If, as I firmly believe, you find that she is in the best of health, you can explain your sudden visit by saying that Mr. Thaden and I have something of importance to communicate, which will be perfectly accurate, as a means to urge strongly that we all return to London by the next train. The cab stopped, to show that Richard was himself again. Thaden, nearest the door, opened it, got out, and helped Evelyn to alight. Reassured on his account, the girl smiled, and a wave of color leaped to her cheeks. Anyone happening to watch their arrival would put them down as ordinary visitors. Evelyn Forbes was just a charming young woman, plainly but expensively dressed, Thaden an attentive cavalier, and Winter a prosperous city man, probably with a taste for coursing and pheasant shooting. Subtly observant, indeed, would be the theorist who gathered from their demeanour that they had just emerged, practically unscathed, from a situation rife with the elements of tragedy. Nevertheless, Winter kept a sharp eye on Thaden after Evelyn Forbes had run up the steps to the hotel and was relieved at seeing that he could walk without assistance. 
Keep nothing back, he said under his breath, as they followed the girl with sedater pace. These women must be frightened into complete obedience. Did Ferno get hold of Forbes? Thaden nodded. That's right, don't talk. I can pretty well guess what took place. But look here, who's handy side? A mere acquaintance? Another nod. You just contrived to pick him up and used him as an excuse for coming to Eastbourne? I see. That removes a troublesome pawn off the chessboard. But it doesn't, wheezed Thaden. He ought to be here. Can't make out what has become of him. He will turn up. An American, isn't he? I thought so. The indications were slight but certain. Features, walk, figure. You can buy clothes, but the genuine citizen of God's own country is as distinct a type as a Highlander, all wool and a yard wide. Inside the hotel, they came on Evelyn, talking to the manager. She hailed them at once. Mother has gone to Beachy Head, she cried. She and her friends are expected home about six o'clock. Shall we have some tea? There is no use in following her. She will be starting back before we could get there. Mrs. Forbes is quite well, I hope, put in Winter casually. Yes, sir, in the best of health, said the manager, indicating with a flourish of both hands that nothing else was to be expected as to the condition of any among the numerous patrons of the Royal Devonshire Hotel. Evelyn asked that tea should be served in her mother's sitting room. When they were screened by the closed door, Winter examined Thaden's throat. Beyond a slight swelling and external soreness, the cricoid cartilage, known to the multitude as Adam's apple, was seemingly uninjured, while Thaden himself now made light of the blow, though a certain hoarseness was perceptible in his voice, and he deemed it advisable to speak in a low-pitched tone. Evelyn Forbes listened with ill-repressed bewilderment, while he related the day's doings. At first, she hardly grasped the significance of the story, but Winter's occasional questions and comments, and a parenthetical sentence or two introduced by Thaden for her benefit, quickly revealed the astounding nature of the plot of which her father was the chief object. At this crisis, she displayed a self-control and reticence which were admirable. She seemed to realize intuitively that any gaps in the recital could be filled in later, whereas it was all important that the detective should be made acquainted as speedily as possible with the developments brought about by the morning's fuller disclosures. As for Winter... He was keenly interested in Furneaux's behavior at the moment of Forbes's departure from Innismore Mansions. Glancing at his watch, he rose when Thaden's revelations came to an end. "'I'll just go and ring up the yard,' he said. "'There may be news. When Furneaux starts off in full cry, it is a wary fox that escapes him.' I only wish you and I had traveled from Victoria in company, Mr. Thaden. Wong Li Fu would now have been in custody. However, we'll get him. If, as I imagine, he is making for London in that car, there is even a chance of intercepting him in the suburbs. I'll see to it. Left alone with Evelyn Forbes, Thaden suddenly grew tongue-tied. This man, who could invent all manner of glib conversation for the characters in his novels, now cudgeled his brains vainly for something to say that would dwell in her memory when they parted. And he knew why a cloud was thus effectually befogging his wits. 
He had only seen Evelyn three times in as many days, had spoken to her but twice, yet was hopelessly and irrevocably in love with her. He, who had so often and so thrillingly described the grand passion of a man's life, had now fallen a victim to it, only to feel how unutterably ridiculous and impossible was the wild longing that had sprung up in his heart. Here by his side, wistfully sympathetic and friendly in manner, sat the one woman in the world. Yet he felt awkward and constrained, and took refuge in a vague expression of anxiety on behalf of Handyside, a man who at least might be trusted to extricate himself safely from the labyrinth of Eastbourne. The girl, of course, attributed these disjointed remarks to physical suffering. In reality, he was contrasting her wealth and his own comparative poverty, and bidding himself fiercely not to be a vain fool. "'Don't you think you ought to call in the doctor?' she inquired tenderly. "'No, no,' he hastened to assure her. "'The effects of the blow are passing rapidly. "'In another hour I shall hardly feel it at all. "'I'm afraid, Miss Forbes,' he ventured to add, "'that when this piratical gang is broken up, "'as certainly will be the case "'now that the English police are tackling it, "'you will associate our brief acquaintance "'with the only dark days in your existence.' "'Why do you say that?' she demanded. "'Because I am bound to admit that if I had not dined at your house on Monday evening, many, if not all, of the amazing events of the past thirty-six hours could not have happened. "'I don't agree with you, not one little bit,' she protested emphatically. "'Why, the detective man himself said that the young Manchus have been searching ever since the beginning of the year for proof of Dad's connection with the revolutionaries, and he was candid enough to tell us that if it hadn't been for you, that horrid Wong Li Fu would have got me into the car. No, Mr. Thaden, our meeting has proved most fortunate for me. Suppose I had really been captured." Would he have gagged me and taken me away to some lonely place where I would be kept a prisoner, or even killed? Thaden had no desire that her mind should dwell on such a harrowing topic. He shuddered to think of her fate if ever she fell into the hands of the miscreants who had not scrupled to murder Mrs. Lester. She evidently regarded the crime in number 17 in his more mansions, as the sequel to some political disturbance in far-off Shanghai. It had not occurred to her that a hapless woman had been done to death merely as a warning to her father of the fate in store for him and his if he did not yield to the demand of the reactionary party in China and deliver over to their vengeance some hundreds of the leading men in that distressed country. I doubt whether Wang Li Fu and his associates would have dared to offer you any real violence, he said. At worst, I suppose, they might have retained you as a hostage. A hostage for what? For their claim against Mr. Forbes. But what has he done? He has never been in China. He is a power in the financial world. If the Reform Party cannot borrow money, the movement will collapse. At any rate, that is what the Manchus believe, and they will strain every nerve to effect their purpose. But why did they kill poor Mrs. Lester? Thaden felt that he was getting into deep water. This clear-sighted girl would soon have the various threads of the enigma in her hands, and then she could not fail but discover the true meaning of Edith Lester's death. That phase of the problem has yet to be solved, 
was his non-committal reply. Winter rejoined them somewhat hurriedly. He looked puzzled and rather irritated. Furno has made an arrest, he said. A Chinaman, described as Len Shi, is lodged in the cells at Bow Street on a charge of being concerned in the Innismore Mansion's murder. Furno is out, and that is all they know at the yard. What I cannot understand is why no inquiry has been made, by telephone or otherwise, concerning Miss Forbes's flight to Eastbourne. The words had hardly left his mouth when the bell of a telephone on the table jangled. The coincidence was so peculiar that Winter laughed. Some other person shares my opinion, I fancy, he said. May I answer, Miss Forbes? Please do, said the girl, and the chief inspector lifted the receiver from its hook. Trunk call from London. You're through? announced the hotel operator. After a slight pause, an agitated voice said, Is that you, Evelyn? Miss Forbes is here, said Winter. Who is speaking? Her father, was the reply. Oh, I'm Chief Inspector Winter of Scotland Yard. Your daughter is quite safe, Mr. Forbes. Mr. Thaden and I accompanied her from London. She will speak to you in an instant. Would you mind telling me what happened at one o'clock when my colleague, Mr. Furneaux, jumped onto your car and went in pursuit of someone? First, is Mrs. Forbes there, too? She is out with a picnic party on Beachy Head. We expect her back before six o'clock. I propose bringing her and Miss Forbes to London tonight. They will be safer in your house than in Eastbourne, as you will probably agree when you hear what a narrow escape your daughter had this afternoon from being kidnapped by Wong Li Fu. Great heavens! Evelyn in danger from that scoundrel. Yes, but all is well, believe me. Owing to Mr. Thaden's promptitude and pertinacity, Wong Li Fu's scheme was defeated. Your daughter will make everything clear. Give me the barest summary of events after your departure from Innismore Mansions, and I'll get out of the way. We pursued a car which led us a pretty dance nearly as far as St. Albans. It seems that Mr. Furneaux, looking out of the window of Mr. Thaden's flat, while Thaden and I were going downstairs, saw a Chinaman watching us from a closed car standing in the cross street at the end of the garden. He gave chase instantly, but as soon as the man realized that he had attracted notice, he tried to escape. At least that was Mr. Furneaux's first impression. Later, he convinced himself that the supposed spy was little more than a red herring drawn across his trail, and that the man's real motive was to take me out of London, or waylay or detain me in some fashion, since it was manifestly impossible that my presence in the mansions should be known to anyone. I see now, of course, what the project was, if, as I gather from you, an attempt was to be made to capture my daughter on arriving at Eastbourne, it was all important for the conspirators that I should not know of her absence from home until after the arrival of the train, so that I could not communicate with the hotel and take measures to protect her. But that explanation was hidden from Mr. Furneaux, and the first glimpse of it vouchsafed to me was when I reached my office and was horrified to learn that she had gone away without my knowledge. However, in a desperate matter like this, I must not waste time by describing my agony and foreboding. As I have said, by some phenomenal method of reasoning beyond my comprehension, Mr. Furneaux did arrive at a sound conclusion. 
I suppose he was alive to the ridiculous aimlessness of the race across country. My car is powerful and speedy, but the Chinaman had a thoroughly up-to-date conveyance, too, and drove without paying the least heed to traffic conditions. There was only one man, then? Yes. Didn't I make that clear? Perhaps not. But there can hardly be any doubt that this fellow was alone, and acting as a sort of scout, or vedette. We had the utmost difficulty in following him along Oxford Street, and I am sure that my chauffeur has been reported by a score of constables on point duty for exceeding the speed limit and disregarding signals to halt. To come to the material facts, the chase took us up the Edgware Road. We tore along at a tremendous rate after passing the Welsh Harp, overhauled the fellow we could not, until, on the outskirts of St. Albans, when he deliberately slowed up as though to allow us to pass. Mr. Furneaux flew at him like a terrier grappling a rat, but the man made no resistance. He is undoubtedly a Chinaman, though attired in a chauffeur's livery, and he could handle a car in first-rate style, too. His pidgin English was difficult to understand, and Mr. Furneaux shared my view that he did not try to render himself intelligible. We gathered that he was obeying his master's orders in trying the car, a new one, before purchase, but Furneaux bundled him off to the nearest police station, borrowed handcuffs, and brought him back to London, leaving the car in a garage at St. Albans. That is a bald but accurate summary of the facts. I dropped Mr. Furneaux and his prisoner at Bow Street, and was on the way to my city office, when I suddenly felt faint for want of food, as I ate hardly any breakfast this morning and only drank a cup of coffee in Mr. Thaden's place. So I returned to the Carlton, where I met a friend, a business associate, who remained for a chat while I had a meal. This trivial accident prevented me from telephoning to my house, though naturally I had no misgivings as to my daughter's well-being. Even then, I was detained unduly, because my friend and I went to another office in the city, and two more hours elapsed before I reached my own place. Then, and not till then, did I hear of Evelyn's journey and its cause. "'Thank you, Mr. Forbes,' said Winter quietly. "'We seem to have made a forward move today.' Before calling Miss Evelyn to the phone, I want to tell you that, in disobeying your orders to remain at home, she did my department a good turn. Wang Li Fu and I were brought face to face. He is not a myth. My word might be regarded as sufficient proof of that fact. Certainly, Mr. Forbes, if given earlier— was the inevitable retort. But here is your daughter. She can plead her cause far better than I can. Evelyn took the woman's way. To defend, she attacked. Dad, dear, she complained, why didn't you give me your confidence? If I had had the least notion of the dreadful things that were going on, I should certainly have telephoned to Eastbourne before starting. But don't you see the diabolical cleverness of the scheme? The telegram arrived just in time to allow me to catch the 1.25 p.m. train, and rendering it idle to think of making a trunk call if I would only obey an urgent message from my mother. Then again, when I reached Eastbourne, why should I suspect a foreign-looking gentleman who said Dr. Sinnott had sent his car to take me to the hotel? There isn't a Dr. Sinnott in Eastbourne at this date, but how was I to know that? Of course, both you and I have suffered a good deal, each in a different way, 
but all is well that ends well, and I shall have such a lot to tell you when we meet tonight. What time? I don't know yet. I'll wire or phone when Mother returns, and we settle about the train. Goodbye, darling. See, you don't go anywhere alone until I come back. For some reason, Winter's manner was not so placid as usual. He looked so obviously perplexed and troubled that Thaden, searching for a cause, suddenly remembered that the chief inspector was a great smoker. "'Won't you have a cigar?' he said. "'That is, unless Miss Forbes has any objection.' "'Me?' cried the girl. "'I don't object in the least.' But the Royal Devonshire Hotel's best Havana did not wholly banish the frown from Winter's forehead. More than once he glanced at his watch and consulted a timetable. At last he voiced one of his anxieties. "'What can have become of that American?' he said. "'He knew what hotel you were making for?' "'Oh, yes,' they laughed." Quite a cheerful air possessed two members of the little party, at any rate. Perhaps he has forgot the name, went on Evelyn. Americans never forget the names of hotels or railway stations or steamers, said Winter. The average Englishman can tell you what will win the derby, but the average American will be a good deal more accurate concerning next Saturday's mail steamer. So, I frankly confess it, that man's prolonged absence supplies a riddle which I can't answer. What do you say if we give a look along the front? He may be shy, though I told the hall porter that any inquirer was to be shown up at once. No, Mr. Handyside was not to be seen on Eastbourne's spacious marine promenade. A couple of well-dressed men caught sight of Winter and decided that they had instant and urgent business elsewhere, but he only smiled. His quarry that day was not the swell mobsman, but much more dangerous game. Lightning darted from a summer sky, when the picnic party returned from Beachy Head in three cars, but without Mrs. Forbes. Evelyn was hardly anxious at first. The hall porter informed her who the occupants of the cars were, and she watched the lively and chattering groups forming on the pavement and breaking up again to enter the hotel and dress for dinner. At last... Realizing that her mother was not among them, she singled out a lady whom she knew and asked for an explanation. The lady, a Mrs. Montague, was very much surprised. "'But, my dear Evelyn,' she said, "'didn't you yourself send for your mother?' The girl blanched. Some premonition of evil gripped her very heart. "'What do you mean?' she said and the other woman could not help noting the distress in her voice. "'If you didn't send, who did?' came the immediate response. "'We were just going to have tea when a gentleman, a stranger, came and asked for Mrs. Forbes. We saw him arrive in a car which halted at the foot of the path, nearly a quarter of a mile away. Your mother answered,' and he said that you were in Eastbourne and had sent him to bring you to the hotel. He said the car belonged to a doctor, somebody, but he himself looked like a foreigner. A few others had gathered around, attracted by Evelyn Forbes's pallor and distress. Winter, too, had drawn near, and it was he who said, "'Did you see this stranger who brought the message?' Oh, yes, plainly, said Mrs. Montague. Had he a scar down the left side of his face? Yes. Then Evelyn Forbes, for the first time in her vigorous young life, fainted. Her mother was in the power of Wang Li Fu. 
All the terrors which imagination had painted in her own behalf were redoubled as to her mother's fate. Her brain reeled. Merciful oblivion came. Thaden and Winter were just able to catch her before she fell like a log. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Number 17 by Lewis Tracy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reappearance of Handyside. Consternation reigned for a while at the entrance to the Royal Devonshire. Men craned their necks, and women uttered nervous little shrieks. But Evelyn Forbes was endowed with a vigorous frame and a splendidly vital spirit and she recovered her senses before she could be carried into the vestibule. The fact that she had fainted, too, brought to the aid of her waking senses the innate horror of her race and class for anything approaching a scene, and she was almost unnaturally collected in speech and demeanour within a few seconds after her eyes had reopened. "'Did I give way like that?' she said with a valiant smile. How excessively stupid. That sort of behavior doesn't help at all, does it? Thank you, I can walk quite well. I'll just go to Mother's room and telephone home. There has been some silly mistake. By this time it will be rectified, I'm sure. Come, Mr. Thayden, where is Mr. Winter? Here, said the detective. I'll follow in a minute or so. Please don't communicate with London till I arrive. His quiet, insistent tone was meant rather for Thaden than for the half-demented girl, who was stumbling anywhere but in the right direction, until Thaden caught her arm and led her to the lift. She contrived to remain outwardly calm until she reached the seclusion of the sitting-room, when she broke into a flood of tears, while in disjointed and hysterical words she blamed her own rashness for the fate which had overtaken her mother. If only she had used better judgment when the telegram came, if only she had hired an automobile and driven straight to beat she had, if only she had done a dozen other things which no one would possibly have dreamed of doing, she might have safeguarded her darling mother. Thaden, meanwhile, was nearly frantic with the indecision of ignorance. Never had he felt so helpless, so utterly childish and unhinged in the face of disaster. He had heard that it was good for a woman to be allowed to cry when overwhelmed with misery. Again, he remembered reading somewhere that the feminine temperament should not be allowed to yield to a too tempestuous grief, or the delicate and finely balanced female organism might suffer irreparable injury. Should she be given water or a stimulant? Should one leave her alone or endeavor to soothe her? Heaven only knew. He didn't. So he did exactly what any devout and despairing lover might be expected to do, put an arm round her shoulders and murmured a frenzied assurance of his willingness to die several times and vanquish a horde of young Manchus in the process ere she could be allowed to endure one needless hour of distress on her mother's account. Somehow this sort of nonsense was helpful, the girl raised her swimming eyes to his. She placed two appealing hands on his shoulders and said brokenly, Mr. Thaden, I am ready to trust you next to my own father. Where shall we go? What can we do? I'll come with you anywhere. Only my dear one must be rescued. He believed afterwards that he answered her by a kiss. He was not certain. The delirium of the moment was such that he could never recall its words or acts 
with that precision which a well-regulated mind should display even under the stress of intense emotion. In any event, the crisis was interrupted by the clamor of the telephone bell. Withdrawing from what was perilously near an embrace, so colorable an imitation of the real thing that winter, entering at that instant, could make no distinction, and was secretly amazed at these strenuous methods of consoling the lady, Thaden lifted the receiver and heard, as one in a trance, the telephone operator's conventional announcement, "'Trunk call from Croydon. You're through.' "'Who is it?' demanded the chief inspector gruffly. Even he, veteran fighter in the unceasing battle between the law and the malefactor, was feeling the strain of the Homeric struggle ushered in by the death of Edith Lester. "'I don't know yet,' Thaden managed to say collectedly. "'Someone from Croydon. Bend close. You'll hear.' A quiet, drawling voice reached them, the vibrating wire lending its measured accents a metallic accuracy. "'That you, Mr. Thaden?' "'Why, it's Mr. Handyside. Yes, I'm here. Where are you speaking from, Croydon?' "'That's so. Well, I don't understand, but I'm sure you'll pardon me. We are in a deuce of fix at this end, so if you'll arrange to call tomorrow—' "'You've lost Mrs. Forbes, I guess.' Is that the lady's name? If it is, I've kept track of her. I... Thaden was so astounded that he looked at Winter in blank amazement. The pressure of his fingers on the circuit key relaxed, and the American's voice trailed abruptly away into silence. He put matters right at once and heard the continuation of a new sentence, whereupon he broke in excitedly. One second, Mr. Handyside, Miss Forbes is here. I must tell her your news. He turned to Evelyn. Hooray, he almost yelled. Your mother is all right. She is with Mr. Handyside. Some sort of miracle has happened. Come and listen. Aroused from a stupor of grief, as though she had received a galvanic shock, Evelyn sprang up. Naturally, she had to place an arm on Thaden's back to permit of her head approaching near enough to the telephone. Thus the three heads were almost touching each other. If an artist had been present, he would have obtained a study in facial expressions worthy of Phil May or Gerido. Handyside, of course, had heard Thaden's gleeful exclamation. He chuckled pleasantly. "'Your digest goes a little too far, Mr. Thaden,' he said. "'But, compared with the newspaper placard facts in your possession, "'my story is a full-sized novel. "'Anyhow, I'll condense it, so here goes. "'I was back of the crowd when the circus started outside the Eastbourne Depot. "'As I anteed up your ticket and collected your deposit of a sovereign, "'I saw what took place.' and sized up the results pretty accurately. The kidnapping proposition had failed, but the guy in the silk hat had got clear away in a bully good car. How good, I know now. It seemed to me that, next to rescuing that charming young lady, it was important something should be known about the thug who wanted to carry her off. And when my eyes lit on a workmanlike motorbike with a sidecar rig standing close to the curb and well clear of the arena, said I to myself, George T. Handyside, this is where you take a flyer, and maybe Illinois will score one. The man who owned the outfit was watching the commotion when I dug him in the ribs. Take me after that car, I said and I'll pay you a shilling a mile, with five pounds on account, if it's only a hundred yards. I pressed a note into his hand, and say, you Britishers wake up all right when you see real money. We were doing thirty per in less than ten seconds. No car on four wheels can lose any decent motorcycle on a switchback track. 
and jackson the owner of this one says it's good enough for sixty on a fair stretch of road anyhow we held the thug dead easy but didn't press him any and i had no call to butt in had i mr handyside said thayton i won't waste time now by telling you how grateful we are get on with the knitting sir i've had the time of my life a rip-snorting movie with george t on the film from a to z no go away exchange i'm renting this line for the next quarter of an hour well we made a bee line for beachy head so jackson told me and when the automobile pulled up we got under a hedge and i did a bit of scout work on my feet i saw a silk hat pick out a lady from a bunch of people who seemed to be taking the view with sandwiches and it was simple as falling off a log to follow the position of affairs silk hat urging lady to come with him lady astonished not able to size up exactly bearings of the yarn but finally yielding now if miss forbes hadn't told us that her mother had written saying she was going to beachy head with a picnic party this afternoon i would have gotten off at the wrong address because i could hardly have failed to believe that silk hat was picking up a female accomplice but as things stood i suspicioned that failing the daughter he was putting up a bunco tail for the mother a situation new i believe in the realm of romantic fiction i thought it was up to me to play a strong hand so i threw a few facts on the screen for jackson's benefit and he straightway hit the pike in pursuit where the country was open we kept well in the rear but crept closer in villages and towns we had to stop at tunbridge wells for petrol but that didn't cut any ice because jackson knew the country like a book and we sighted the automobile within five minutes though the milestones were pretty numerous during that run after that nothing particular happened except to a hen and a dog until we came near croydon that is i knew it was croydon because jackson said so and i have considerable faith in him in between whiles where there was nothing doing he and i fixed up an automobile tour well outside croydon there's a new road with a half-built villa at the near end and a way back farmhouse at the other end the villa was the one thing needed when the thug made a bee-line for the farm i jumped out told jackson to find something to do to his machine at the corner of the next block and i hurried into the alpine chalet from a top back room i watched silk hat carrying a lady into the farm eh what's that yes he was carrying her i guess he'd given her a dope so as to stop any cry for help made me feel pretty mean to be standing there without taking a hand in the deal but i forced myself to believe that another hour or two couldn't make such a heap of difference to the lady while it would be better to leave things to the police i waited just twenty minutes i have all the time scheduled until the car came back by hurrying downstairs i was able to look inside as it passed and silk hat was alone he took the london road i strolled out didn't dare to hurry you know in case anyone might be watching from the farm and put in some hard thinking while walking to jackson's stand there were two courses open either to send jackson after the auto and try myself to get in touch with you and the police or put jackson on guard near the farm whether i decided rightly or not i haven't a notion but i let the car go and for this reason we know where the lady is and so does the thug if the police put up a hard game they can rescue her without his knowledge and spread a web for the fly to walk into later but they must get a move on this phone is nearly a mile from the farm and jackson is tightening nuts outside the villa i spoke of now what's the next item on the program
Winter grabbed the receiver unceremoniously. "'I'm a representative of Scotland Yard, Mr. Handyside,' he said. "'If ever you want work, come to me, J. L. Winter, and I'll find you some. "'Miss Forbes is vexed with me because I have stopped her from thanking you, "'but compliments must wait.' Will you go as quickly as possible to the chief police station at Croydon? By the time you get there, I'll be in touch with the inspector in charge, and he will do the rest. You understand? Goodbye. Winter rang off. He smiled blandly at Evelyn. There's no opportunity now for sentiment, he explained. Our American friend will appreciate quick action far more than talk. Then he tackled the telephone again and asked to be put through to the Croydon police station. There must be no delay, he added. This is an official call. He was in touch with Croydon in a remarkably short space of time and soon was in communication with a police inspector. What's your name? he demanded. Inspector Wilkins, came the surprised answer. Were you a sergeant at the time of the Surrey Bank robbery? Yes, but what the... I am Winter of Scotland Yard. Do you recognize my voice? Well, er... Uh, do you remember that nip of old brandy I gave you while we were freezing in a drafty warehouse at three o'clock in the morning waiting for the smasher to come home for his plant? Yes, you are Mr. Winter, right enough, sir. Good. I want you to believe what I'm going to tell you, as there is a big job ahead. A gang of Chinese cutthroats have kidnapped a lady, wife of the London banker, Mr. James Creighton Forbes. In a few minutes, an American, a Mr. Handyside, will be with you. He will point out the house near Croydon, to which the lady has been taken in a motor car. Collect half a dozen plainclothes men and two in uniform, and go with Mr. Handyside, without attracting attention, of course. Surround the house, and arrest anyone, especially any Chinaman, who attempts to leave. Release the lady, and ask Mr. Handyside to escort her to her home, 11 Fortescue Square, Belgravia. If she's very ill, which is improbable, she should be taken to a hospital. In that event, Mr. Handyside should telephone Mr. Forbes. Occupy the farm and arrest anyone who comes there, no matter what the pretext, until Mr. Furneaux or I arrive. I'll be with you in two hours. Tell Mrs. Forbes that her daughter will set out from Eastbourne by the next train, leaving after 6.30. Got all that? Yes, sir. Are these Chinamen likely to show fight? Better be prepared. But after posting your sentries, I advise you and the uniformed constables to rush the place. By the way, it will save me some trouble if you phone the yard and tell them exactly what I've told you. Ask for Furneaux. If he's not in, instruct them to leave a written record for him. I'll see to it, sir. Is that all? Yes. Goodbye. Meet you in two hours. He whirled round on Thaden. Tell the manager to supply at once the best car to be had in Eastbourne for love or money, he said. I want something that is sure to go and go fast. The chief inspector, with full steam up, was energy personified. His bulging eyes, his firm chin, his round fists, one clenching the telephone instrument, the other resting on the table, were eloquent of the man of action. His pride had been sore stricken by the escape of Wang Li Fu when that master scoundrel was actually in his grasp. But those powerful hands of his were far-reaching, and it would go hard with the jiu-jitsu expert when next they gripped his lithe frame. Almost before Thaden had quitted the room, Winter snapped, there is no other word for it, literally snapped a question at Evelyn. What's your telephone number? She told him, 
and again the Eastbourne Exchange was bidden to exert itself. "'That you, Mr. Forbes?' said the chief inspector, after a short wait. "'Yes. I am Winter of Scotland Yard. I want to assure you that your wife and daughter will be under your roof within the next three hours. Mrs. Forbes will probably be escorted by a gentleman named Handyside, an American. You owe him all possible thanks, because it is due to his action alone that Mrs. Forbes will soon be rescued from captivity. Yes, she was carried off from Beachy Head this afternoon by Wong Li Fu, but by the rarest good fortune this Mr. Handyside, a friend of Mr. Thaden's, was able to follow the trail, and steps are now being taken to free her. Your daughter will speak to you. I intervened merely to vouch for it that an almost incredible story is true. By the way, let no one know that Mrs. Forbes is in London. Warn your servants not to speak of her return. One more word. Have you heard anything of Furneaux? I have not heard from or seen him since we parted outside Bow Street Police Station. But for heaven's sake, what is this you tell me about my wife? Miss Forbes will give you all the particulars we possess. Be calm and remain at home. You can best assist us by stopping within call. Mrs. Forbes and the American should arrive first, possibly before 7.30. If there is any hitch, which is unlikely, Mr. Handyside will telephone you. Your daughter will tell you the hour she and Mr. Thaden should reach Victoria. She will speak to you now. Excuse my abruptness. A lot of things may happen before I retire for the night, and I have no time to pick and choose my words. Evelyn, able at last to pour out her soul in thanksgiving, nearly broke down when she heard her father's voice. "'Oh, Dad!' she wailed. "'I've passed through a dreadful time since I spoke to you shortly after five o'clock. I dropped as if I'd been shot when Mrs. Montague, who was one of the picnic party, told me that a man of foreign appearance with a scar on the left side of his face and who said he was a doctor— came to Beachy Head and told poor mother that I had sent for her. She went on to relate such facts as were known to her, and was in the midst of a sensational narrative, when Thaden announced that a high-powered touring car was in readiness. "'Won't you take us with you?' he said to Winter. "'There is no train from here till seven-thirty, and in a motor we should be well on the way to London by that time.' Winter had anticipated some such request, and a prompt refusal was on the tip of his tongue when he recalled that he would pass through Tunbridge Wells, whence an earlier train might be available. A glance at the timetable showed that a train left Tunbridge Wells at 7.15. Yes, he said, I'll take you part of the way. Tell your father, Miss Forbes, that you will arrive at London Bridge at 8.40. If you two reach London by a different route, I think you should be tolerably safe. If any Chinaman shows up between here and Fortescue Square, I'll shoot him at sight, Thaden said, producing an automatic pistol. I wouldn't do that, smiled Winter. You might bore a hole in some perfectly innocent celestial. But you won't be troubled. Wang Li Fu carries out his own plans, and at present he is congratulating himself on the possession of a valuable hostage. But come along. How about a wrap for you, Miss Forbes? We'll create a breeze, you know. She ran into her mother's bedroom and came out with a fur coat and a motor veil, articles which, she had guessed correctly, her mother would not be wearing for the short run to Beachy Head. The hotel manager lent coats to the men, and they started, not without hearty congratulations from several people in the porch, whose fears on Mrs. Forbes's account Thaden had dissipated when he went out to order the car. 
Winter gave their thoughts a new direction when Thaden inquired what means the authorities would adopt to rid the country of the pestiferous gang which carried on its vendetta with such scant respect for the law and order of Great Britain. Once we have Mr. and Mrs. Forbes and this young lady safely housed in Fortescue Square and protected, not only by their own servants, but by the Metropolitan Police, we will devote ourselves to routing out the whole crew, he announced. My idea is that when we lay hands on the ringleader, the rest will be easy. Furno's prisoner, Len Shi, may be got to talk when a Chinese interpreter tackles him. Again, there is every prospect of an important capture being made in Croydon House. Most important of all is the prolonged absence from the yard of Furneaux. He is busy, or he would have put in an appearance hours ago, if only to get to know my whereabouts. That means something. Furneaux never wastes time. Usually we hunt in couples— Today, by the fortune of war, we are separated, and perhaps fortunately so. It is all your fault, Mr. Thaden. Mine? was the astonished cry. Yes, we had to try all sorts of tricks on you before you would speak. Just imagine Scotland Yard being compelled to tap the telephone of a respectable and well-known author before he would own up to such knowledge as he possessed of the murder in number 17. So that was how Furneaux had played the necromancer, and was able to mystify Thaden that morning. The chief inspector, by raising the question, was touching on dangerous ground, as he was well aware, but he was determined now that all barriers should be thrown down. Evelyn Forbes was no bread-and-butter miss from whose cognizance the evil things of life must be sedulously averted. A woman of spirit and intelligence, who had already run the dreadful risk of sharing Mrs. Lester's fate, should be made to understand every phase of the difficulty with which the criminal investigation department had yet to deal. British law and Chinese anarchy would soon grapple in a life-and-death conflict, and it was idle folly to suppose that, no matter how reticent her friends might be, this sharp-witted girl would not find out for herself the exact nature of the link which bound the fortunes of her own family with those of the dead woman. Thaden tried to pass off the detective's retort with a careless laugh, but Evelyn reverted to the topic when they were seated in the London-bound train after Winter had dropped them at Tunbridge Wells Station. "'What did the chief inspector mean when he said you refused to help him at first? she inquired. "'There are gaps in my history of this affair.' How did you come to know that my father was acquainted with Mrs. Lester? Why did you seem at one time to be taking sides with my father against a public inquiry by the police? Then, seeing there was no help for it, Thaden began at the beginning and told the girl the full, true, and unexpurgated story of events on the Monday night. Once or twice, when he hinted at the cause of his otherwise inexplicable actions, which quite obviously lay in his interest in the girl herself, she blushed a little and averted her eyes. But she listened in silence, and did not speak during many seconds after he had ceased. Then she simply murmured, "'Poor dear Dad!' How worried he must have been, and how well he concealed it from me. After another pause, she added, We are deeply in your debt, Mr. Thaden. When this ordeal is ended, and those horrid men have been put in prison or driven out of the country, our next difficulty will be to, to thank you adequately for what you've done. Surgit amari aliquid. 
Even in life's pleasantest hours, something bitter arises. Thaden was in the company of the woman he loved, yet no word of love could rise to his lips. In the first place, he dared not woo the daughter of a millionaire. In the second, were his suit even possible, he was far too honorable-minded to take immediate advantage of her disturbed state and the services he had undoubtedly rendered and given the slightest hint of his passion. So he sighed, and looked out of the window at a fast-flying vista of Kentish hillside, and contented himself by saying, For what little I have done or attempted to do, I am already rewarded far beyond my wildest dreams. Even that was more than he had meant to say, Glancing timidly at Evelyn to see whether or not she resented his words, he was astounded to find that she had blushed scarlet, and in her turn was absorbed in the landscape. Then he remembered that in the frenzy of the moment following the report of her mother's capture by Wang Li Fu, he had kissed her. Had he? Or had he not? If not, why not now? But that way lay madness, and wretched doubt. Was she already the promised bride of another man? It was a relief when the train stopped at Seven Oaks. When it moved on again, they were normal young people once more, and discussed various features of the young Manchu's raid on society as though the extermination of political adversaries were a commonplace occurrence in modern England. At last, after a journey which lived long in their minds, since even a prosaic train may follow the path to Wonderland, they arrived at London Bridge and hummed in a taxi through streets of gaunt warehouses until the light of Westminster flashed on a Thames veiled in the blue mystery of a summer gloaming. The cab had hardly halted outside the Fortescue Square mansion when the door was thrown wide open, and Tomlinson appeared, flanked by two stalwart footmen. The butler's face was aglow with pleasure. "'It's all right now you've come, Miss Evelyn,' he said joyfully. "'Mrs. Forbes arrived more than an hour ago.' But Tomlinson was in error. He did not know what tribulations loomed already through the haze of the future, or he would have laid to heart the time-honored advice to venturesome travelers, never hello till you're out of the woods. End of chapter 11《ャプター十一》の十二、by Louis Tracy。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。No surrender。Mrs. Forbes, a slim, elegant woman, looked as if she were her daughter's elder sister. Although driven by hay fever to the seaside regularly at the beginning of the London season, she was far from being a malade imaginaire. She did not go willingly. Each year she hoped against hope that the annoying ailment would not make itself felt. Yet no sooner was the month of May well established than for six or seven weeks she had either to drag her husband and daughter away from the metropolis or live by herself in some South Coast hotel. She had tried Brighton, whence Mr. Forbes could travel to the city, but soon discovered that the daily train journey was not good for his health. After that, she insisted on adopting the self-denying ordinance of leaving Evelyn with her father in the townhouse from the middle of May till the end of June, when all three went to the Highlands. She, of course, had not the remotest knowledge of the terrors threatening her household, a thunderbolt out of a summer sky would have astonished her less than the indignities she endured when hailed away from Eastbourne in the luxurious car 
which Wang Li Fu had at his command. Thaden had been in the house nearly half an hour and was exchanging experiences with Forbes and Handyside, the latter, by virtue of his extraordinary share in the day's adventures, being admitted to the full confidence of the others, when Evelyn brought her mother into the library. "'Here is someone who positively refuses to retire for the night until she has met you, Mr. Thaden.' said the girl, radiant with joy and relief, now that the shadow of death had passed, apparently forever, leaving her dear ones unscathed. Mrs. Forbes, an aristocrat to the fingertips, greeted her guests with marked cordiality. "'I have been living during the past few hours like one of the characters one sees in the fearsome little plays produced on the stage of the Grand Guignol in Paris, she said, gazing at him with frank brown eyes, singularly like her daughter's. But I have contrived to gather one definite impression among the whirl of things, and that is that were it not for Mr. Frank Thaden, my daughter and I would now be in as bad a predicament as two women could possibly face anywhere. I was lucky enough to be of some little use, but Mr. Handyside is the lion of today's contest, said Thayden. I am grateful to both of you. How grateful, I can never find words to tell. But Mr. Handyside rivals you in modesty, Mr. Thayden. He assured me that you were the deus ex machina, though he obtained the machine itself and rode sixty miles to rescue me from my dragon. By the way, where is the motorcyclist? What is his name? Jackson, ma'am, put in Handyside. He went back to Eastbourne, thought nothing of it. I fixed him all right. He's coming to London next week. I've hired him for a trip round the island. In the sidecar, laughed Evelyn. No, I guess we'll run to something more roomy. Jim, dear, said Mrs. Forbes to her husband, get Mr. Jackson's address. Our thanks to him, at least, can take a tangible form. No, Evelyn, I'm not going to bed. I mean to sit up and talk. I want to hear everything. You men must smoke big, strong cigars, please, if I breathe tobacco smoke, I shall not fancy I want to sneeze. I, for one, am simply aching to hear what happened to you, said Thayden. Mrs. Forbes was equally ready to retail her trials. When a man who resembled a tall and well-built Japanese came to me on the downs, she said, I really believed him to be what he said he was assistant to an Eastbourne doctor. I never dreamed he was Chinese, not that it mattered at all where I was concerned. Only one becomes quite accustomed to meeting well-dressed Japanese men in society, but hardly ever a Chinaman. I thought, too, I remembered his face, which is quite possible, since my husband tells me that this Wang Li Fu was once an attaché at the Chinese embassy. He spoke excellent English, with a strongly marked lisp. When he said that my daughter wished to see me at the Royal Devonshire Hotel, and that a Dr. Sinnott had sent a car for my convenience, I was mainly concerned in getting him to admit the real cause of his presence, because I naturally assumed that Evelyn had met with an accident. No sooner had the car started than he seized my wrists and gave them a queer twist, which seemed to render me powerless for a few seconds. If you scream or resist, I hurt you. So, only very bad, he said. I was that astonished. I hardly realized what was taking place before he had my wrists and ankles strapped tightly, but not painfully and had placed a gag in my mouth. Now you keep quiet, he said, and showed me a horrible-looking knife, which he put on the seat between us. If you move at all when we pass through towns, he went on, 
I stick this into you very deep. Somehow I knew that he meant to carry out his threats to the letter. At first I was more angry than hurt or even alarmed. Then I began to believe that I had fallen into the clutches of a lunatic and grew horribly afraid. I saw that we were following the London road, and it oppressed me like a dreadful sort of nightmare to be speeding through a familiar district, a countryside dotted with the houses and estates of personal friends, and be unable to stir or utter a sound. It seemed to be almost stupid to see policemen in the streets of Tunbridge Wells, one of whom gazed into our car sharply, because I suppose we were traveling rather fast, and feel that no one could begin to guess at my predicament. You all appreciate the fact, of course, that I knew nothing whatever of any quarrel between my husband and a faction in China. Your husband adopted the policy of the ostrich, Helena, said Forbes grimly. It may or may not be a fable as regard to ostriches, I don't know enough about them to feel certain, but it is unquestionably too often true of mankind. I believed my head was hidden and imagined the remainder of my body was safe in consequence. Now I learn that my opponents have been tracking me steadily for half a year. The one fact which stands out clearly above all others during the past forty-eight hours is the phenomenal range and completeness of Wang Li Fu's plans. I didn't mean my comment as a reproach, dear, and Mrs. Forbes gave him a look which told plainly that these two were lovers after many years of wedded happiness. Thank God we have all escaped thus far. Oh, mother, laughed Evelyn nervously, you are not anticipating more horrors, are you? A few hours ago, I would have scoffed at anyone who said that a handful of Chinese could tear aside our cloak of civilized security as though it were a spider's web, was the serious reply. But I have interrupted my own story. I began to think that I would be taken to some awful den in the East End and held there till some huge sum of money was paid by way of ransom when the car suddenly quitted the main road and bumped over a rough surface. I knew I was near Croydon, the last place I would have suspected as a brigand's stronghold. Then we halted, and that wretched man lifted me out, carried me into a back room of an old-fashioned house, put me in a fairly comfortable chair, tied me in with ropes, and left me. I couldn't speak, I was looking at a blank wall and smoke-stained ceiling. I was sure then that he was after money, and began to calculate the time which must elapse before my husband would hear from him and arrange for my release. I wondered how much he would ask. Ten, twenty, fifty thousand pounds? How much would you have paid him, Jim? Mrs. Forbes took her trial so cheerfully that they all laughed. "'That's hardly a fair question, is it?' she continued, stealing another glance at her husband. "'At any rate, being a banker's wife, I knew how extraordinarily difficult it would be to raise any considerable sum of gold at such a late hour, and I resigned myself to remaining a prisoner all night. Then I think I wept a little, but not for long, because I felt that they meant to keep me alive.' and as I look more delicate than I really am, even a Chinaman would see that he was taking some risk by denying me food and all liberty of movement. Then, very soon, it seemed, I heard an outer door being forced off its hinges and English voices, and the door of my room was broken open, and I saw a police inspector and some constables, Hitherto, I have never properly appreciated our policemen. From this day, I become their most ardent admirer and enthusiastic helper. I could have gone down on my knees to those big, kind-looking men in uniform. In fact, I nearly did. When they released me, I could hardly stand. 
After that, Mr. Handyside came and accompanied me here, with a detective sitting next to the driver, and my husband and Evelyn have told me something of the extraordinary things which have been going on in London while I was gadding about at Eastbourne. Was the detective a man named Furneaux? inquired Thaden. Mrs. Forbes hesitated, and her husband answered for her, as he alone, among the members of the household, had met the Jersey man. No, he said. He belonged to the Croydon force, and was sent as an escort. Furneaux seems to have been swallowed alive since three o'clock. Everybody is inquiring for him, and no one appears to know anything about him. I wonder whether Wang Li Fu is aware I have been liberated, said Mrs. Forbes. It's rather odd, is it not, that nothing has been heard from him or his gang, if I was to be held a prisoner in order to extort terms? I fancy he meant to add significance to his demand for a reply by advertisement in tomorrow's times, said Forbes. You see, Helena, he meant to carry off Evelyn as well as you. Mrs. Forbes smiled again at that. What in the world should each of us have thought if we had both been bound and gagged in that car, she cried. I know what I think, said her husband emphatically. You are going straight to bed now, and you'll take ten grains of bromide before lying down. Evelyn, I appoint you nurse. Don't leave your mother till she's sound asleep. Mrs. Forbes rose at once. She admitted, though reluctantly, that a night's rest was necessary to steady her nerves. Ah, she sighed, I shall be so glad when all this turmoil is ended and we are settled for the season in Sutherland. Sutherland, ma'am, inquired Handyside, isn't that in the far north of Scotland? Yes. It would be, just as the North Foreland is in Kent. Thaden explained his friend's theory of geographical names in the British Isles, and on that lightly humorous note the ladies disappeared. When they were gone, Forbes quickly gave a sinister turn to their talk. He produced a letter from his pocket. Listen to this, he said. Y.M. is pleased to inform James Creighton Forbes that Mrs. Forbes is a prisoner and will remain, without food or drink and unable to move, in an empty house until Y.M.'s demands are granted. His face was white with fury while he read, and his fingers moved convulsively, as if he could feel them twining around Wang Li Fu's throat. The other men maintained a sympathetic silence. They understood why that ghastly message had been withheld from the cognizance of the lady who had just quitted them. It was delivered by a messenger boy shortly before you arrived, Thaden, said Forbes, when his passion had subsided and he could trust his voice again. Have you informed Scotland Yard? said Thaden. No. I dared not use the telephone. I could not leave my wife. She is far more shaken than she thinks. Ever since her return, she has followed me if I even walked across the room. It was pitiful. I had to lie to her when the butler brought this infernal note. She saw it was typed and believed my explanation that it was a mere record of an office cablegram. Give it to me, said Thaden. Mr. Handyside and I must leave you now. We'll take it to Scotland Yard. Mr. Winter ought to know of it. In all likelihood, he is arranging to remain in the Croydon house tonight, and if Wang Li Fu is telling the truth, which is highly probable, the local police can watch the place adequately. Yes, you're right, of course. I should have seen that an hour ago. But my brain is on fire, owing to the torture these fiends have devised. Are you quite safe here? It is an absurd question, but I would like to feel assured on that point. Shall I return and strengthen your guard? 
I'm exceedingly obliged to you, but in addition to two of my servants, thoroughly trustworthy men, a detective sergeant and constable have come from Scotland Yard. They are now having supper. When the household retires for the night, two will remain in this room with the door open and two in the butler's room, which commands the other staircase. Moreover, a constable will patrol this side of the square and a second one the back of the premises until long after daybreak. "'Tell you what,' said Handyside, when he and Thaden were in a taxi and had made certain that they were not being followed. "'Tell you what, son, you've struck a bonanza in this Chinese drama.' "'What do you mean?' said Thaden. "'Well, I guess you're the curly-haired boy where Miss Evelyn is concerned. "'Like most Americans, you jump at conclusions,' was the ungracious reply. "'And like most Americans, I'm right nearly all the time,' said Handyside dryly. "'Surely one can hardly discuss such a matter. "'Why not? "'If a proposition sounds hard, chew on it, "'and maybe you'll get your teeth into it somehow.' Thaden nearly allowed himself to become angry. "'Was his hopeless admiration for Evelyn Forbes so patent "'that a sharp-eyed stranger could discern it "'after a brief hour in their company? "'Millionaires' daughters marry poor men only in novels "'and on the stage,' he said bitterly. "'In real life and in England, "'they take unto themselves titles and landed estates. "'I guess Wang Li Fu will have to round you up some more.' was the cryptic answer, and Handyside forthwith plunged airily into some wholly different topic. At Scotland Yard they inquired for Furneaux, and were told he had not reported at headquarters since the early afternoon. So Thaden was introduced to another representative of the department, and handed over the typed note the detective promised that its purport should be telephoned to Croydon without delay. When the two reached the embankment again, Thaden felt unaccountably tired, and was minded to take leave of his companion then and there. But Handyside placed an unerring finger on the cause of his weariness. "'Say, Mr. Thaden,' he cried, I don't know what food product arrangements you've made all day, but I couldn't have eaten less since breakfast if Wang Li Fu was sitting over me with a pistol. How about a square meal? Come to my hotel, and I'll start the chef on a nice little menu while we're having a wash-up and a brush-up. By Jove, now I know what is the matter with me, was the astonishing answer. I have lunched and dined on a cup of tea at Eastbourne. Guess I'm fifteen years older than you, so I knew my trouble all the time. Those people in Fortescue Square were so rattled that they never thought of asking us to eat. Come right along, it's only a step. I'll come with pleasure. I owe you some money, too, which I was nearly forgetting. What do you owe for? "'Railway tickets and taxis and motorcycles, to begin with.' "'No, sir,' said the American, decisively. "'I've had the cheapest day's amusement I've ever dreamed of. "'On balance, I owe you one sovereign. "'As for those half-tickets from Eastbourne, "'I wouldn't sell them for dollars and cents. "'When I get back to my home, 21097 Park Avenue, Chicago,' I'll have those bits of cardboard framed, and when some particular friend asks the reason, I'll tell him, suppressing names, of course, and he'll go away thinking that George T. Handyside is the biggest liar in the state of Illinois, which is some pumpkin, you bet. What beats me, rejoined Thaden, is how you remember where you live. You must have a marvelous head for figures. So they dined well and whined moderately, and Thaden walked to Innismore Mansions, thinking of little else in the world, except of the moment when he held Evelyn Forbes in his arms, almost in an embrace, and he had dared 
nearly, if not quite, to kiss her. As he drew near Ismore Mansions, however, he kept his wits about him. One of the most remarkable features of a series of remarkable crimes was the thorough command of the resources of civilization exhibited by the young Manchus. A few days earlier, he would not have dared to introduce into a story of his own an association composed exclusively of Chinamen, which adapted to its needs the motor car, the messenger boy, perhaps the telephone and telegraph, to say nothing of the advertising columns of the daily press. It was monstrous to imagine that a number of Orientals, marked men every one, no matter what disguises they might adopt, should dare bid defiance to the forces of the British Constitution in order that they might wreak vengeance on those more enlightened compatriots who wished to see their country rescued from the effete control of a puppet emperor. But Thaden was now some days older and many degrees wiser. He knew that the wildly improbable had become dogged fact, that Chinese fanaticism, tigerish in its crafty and utter cold-bloodedness, was setting at naught not only the ordinances of the law, but the brightest intellects whose duty it was to make that law respected. It behooved him, therefore, to lend a sharp eye to his own safety, and never a vehicle or pedestrian came near while he traversed the quiet streets in the neighborhood of Innismore Mansions that he did not give the closest attention to cab or wayfarer, as the case may be. As it happened, that quarter of London was singularly deserted. The first flight of people homeward bound from the theatres was well over. The later contingent, supping in restaurants, had not begun to arrive. Save for the slow-moving figure of a policeman, the long front of the mansions themselves was devoid of life. Nevertheless, it was with a feeling of relief that he turned the key in the lock of number 18, and heard the scraping of a chair on the kitchen floor as Bates rose to meet him. "'Hello, Bates,' he cried wearily. "'Here I am again, you see. Anything new or interesting during my absence?' "'Mrs. Paxton,' began the valet, stopping when his master uttered a sharp exclamation. Thaden had completely forgotten Miss Beale and his sister. "'Yes,' he said. "'Sorry I interrupted you. What of Mrs. Paxton?' "'I saw her, sir, as you ordered, and she promised to call on Miss Beale. She came here about an hour ago. Who, my sister?' "'Yes, sir. She was anxious to see you. From what I could gather, sir, the two ladies had been putting their heads together.' and agreed that this Chinese business has a nasty look, and you'd better keep out of it. What Chinese business, Bates? Well, sir, Miss Beale will have it that Mrs. Lester was killed by a Chinaman, and one of the police on duty in this district told me a little while ago that he saw no less than three Chinamen prowling round here last Monday between dusk and dark, Thaden drew a deep breath. If there was gossip going on about Chinamen in connection with the murder in number 17, the newspapers would soon be getting hold of it. The arrest of Len Shi by Furneaux must be reported. Possibly some newspaper correspondent in Eastbourne would hear of the kidnapping exploit and describe the eastern aspect of its chief actor, Mrs. Forbes's name would transpire in the paragraph, and by putting two and two together, the lynx-eyed journalism of London would ferret out a good deal of the truth. Ladies very often talk nonsense about such things, he said sharply. Why should any Chinaman single out poor Mrs. Lester as a victim? I think the inquiry may be left safely to Scotland Yard, have you seen the evening papers? 
I'll bet you sixpence nothing was said at the inquest concerning Chinaman. No, sir, that's true. However, Mrs. Paxton wants you to ring her up. Why? She wants to be sure you are safe at home. Faden laughed. How can I? he cried. She is not on the telephone. Mrs. Paxton left a number, sir. If you give them a call, it will be taken to her. Faden shook his head good-humoredly, but obeyed. A voice at the other end answered. "'Will you oblige me by telling Mrs. Paxton that I took an American friend to Eastbourne this afternoon and returned by a late train?' he said. "'Who is it, please?' "'Mr. Thaden, Mrs. Paxton's brother. "'Oh, I have a message for you. "'Miss Beale is staying with Mrs. Paxton tonight. "'There was a Chinaman in her hotel, and she didn't like it.' "'Thaden controlled his feelings sufficiently to thank his informant. "'He really wanted to say something crude. "'Gad!' he muttered when he had rung off. "'These women have Chinamen on the brain.' "'Look here, Bates,' he added emphatically. "'I hope you won't lend an ear to this nonsense. "'You've seen no Chinamen, I suppose?' "'No, sir. "'If you do see one, tell me, "'and I'll get to know his business pretty quick.' "'Yes, sir. "'Any letters?' Three, sir, and a small parcel. "'I put them on your table. "'Shall I get you something, sir?' No, thanks. I've just had a huge supper. Good night. Good night, sir. Any orders for the morning? Let me sleep as long as I like, unless I'm wanted. Thaden entered the sitting room. He opened the letters. Two were of no moment. The third was a request from the editor of a magazine that the copy of his article on the Forbes Peace Propaganda should be forwarded as speedily as practicable. What a mad world it was, to be sure. Here was an important periodical waiting impatiently for the views of the millionaire on the best means of securing peace on earth and goodwill to all men, while that same mastermind was obsessed with fear of a few Chinese bandits. Society was looking to Forbes for a promised panacea against war and its evils. Forbes himself was wondering whether bolts and locks and armed servants and policemen would protect him and his from the claws of the young Manchus. Thaden heard Bates locking and bolting the outer door of the flat with a certain thankfulness. He was thinking of the sheer impossibility of any marauder gaining access to number 18 when he opened the small parcel which the valet had spoken of. He speculated idly as to the nature of its contents because he could not remember having ordered any article which would be contained in so tiny a package. He took out a piece of stout paper folded twice and a little white object fell to the table and rolled over several times, finally coming to rest with a curious suddenness. It was a small, carved, ivory skull. End of chapter 12「「This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. » Some new moves in the game. Faden gazed dazedly at the skull for the best part of a minute. His state of mind was that of a man utterly incredulous, who nevertheless thinks he sees a ghost. Then he recovered himself and laughed angrily, harshly, because he had not succeeded better in controlling his nerves. He examined the paper. It bore no writing of any kind. It was precisely similar in color and texture to the two typed slips which Forbes had received, but the sender had evidently thought that the skull was symbolic enough of deadly intent without troubling to add a written threat. 
the ivory skull was an exact replica of its predecessors. The set teeth, the scowling grin of the gaunt jawbones, the dull menace of the empty eye sockets were equally convincing, equally disconcerting. Lighting a cigarette, Thaden scrutinized the address and postmarks. In a sense, it was ludicrous to find Francis B. Thaden, Esquire, 18 in his Moore Mansions, W.C., typed in plain script on the wrapper. What an unholy alliance of modern science and medievalism. The mind almost refused to focus itself on the tragic aspect of the affair, yet the hour at which the package was posted, 5.30 p.m. in the West Strand, showed conclusively that Wong Li Fu, at any rate, had not sent the death's head by his own hand, but had entrusted it to a confederate. The notion brought in its train the departure of Miss Beale from her hotel because she had seen a Chinaman there. Every little helps, mused Thaden. I must let Scotland Yard know. He went straight to the telephone and was pleased to hear that Mr. Winter had reached headquarters. The chief inspector was feeling grateful and said so. It was very thoughtful on your part to deal so promptly with the message received by Mr. Forbes, he said. I meant remaining in Croydon all night. No one came to the house, of course. Wang Li Fu's note explained why. Callous and calculating demon, isn't he? Yes, even more calculating than you are aware. He has included me in the count now. When I reached home ten minutes since, after gormandizing with Mr. Handyside, I found the totem of the tribe awaiting me. The what? An ivory skull. You don't say. And there was a genuine thrill in Winter's voice. Anything else? There was no written legend. I have no doubt the enemy believes that such a work of art speaks for itself. It does. I am to be exterminated, I suppose. A marked pause ensued. When Winter spoke again, his tone was grave. This is a very serious business, Mr. Thayton, he said. The worst part of it is that it seems to be spreading in an ever-widening circle. If it goes much further, we'll be obliged to run in every Chinaman in London and sift out the decent ones from the heap until we reach the unpleasant residuum. Are you worried about things? If so, I'll send a man to mount guard tonight. Not at all, thanks. Bates and I will take care that there isn't even a joss stick in the flat before we go to bed. But I say, there's another matter. Have you met Miss Beale? Yes, she came here this morning. She gave evidence at the inquest, I'm told. What of her? I asked my sister to spend the evening with her, and she was so alarmed at finding a Chinaman as a fellow guest in her hotel that she is spending the night in my sister's house. A plague on all Chinamen, cried Winter wrathfully. After this, I'm dashed if I don't drink Indian tea. However, we'll look him up. Sleep soundly. Your earlier sins of omission are forgiven you, because you have done us several good turns today. I'll tell your local police station that if any pigtail or squint eye is found within half a mile of Innismore Mansions tonight, it is to be jugged without the slightest hesitation. Keep the skull safely. Furno is collecting them. Have you seen him, then? No, but I've heard from him. He has gone home suffering from opium poisoning. Great Scott! Oh, that's only pretty Fanny's way. He means that he is sick of the reek of Chinamen. You know his particular views with regard to tobacco. 
If he has been prowling around among opium dens in the East End all evening, I'm sorry for him. But he'll turn up all right in the morning, looking like a skinned weasel. By the way, it'll interest you to hear that we have cleared up one minor issue. You remember that Anne Rogers, Mrs. Lester's maid, was called away by a telegram saying that her father was ill? Yes. The old fellow, who is a bit of a sponge, admits that he was given two pounds by a foreign gentleman for sending that telegram and shamming illness during the night. I wish I could put the hoary old rascal in jail, but his action probably saved Anne Rogers from sharing her mistress's fate. Mr. Winter, has it struck you that the man who devised this scheme, beginning with the murder of Mrs. Lester and ending, heaven alone knows when or where, is an organizing genius of a very high order? You would be surprised if you knew the real extent and scope of this affair, said Winter. Some day soon I'll be more outspoken. Good night. If you go out in the morning, leave word with Bates where you can be found if wanted. Thaden turned from the telephone and found Bates standing beside him. That stolid and worthy ex-non-commissioned officer was armed with a red-hot poker. Henceforth, his employer saw pretense was useless. "'Beg pardon, sir,' said the valet, apologetically, I couldn't help overhearin' what you were sayin', and if there's any blinkin' Chinee hidden in this place, I'll put a mark on him he won't forget in a hurry. Thaden could not help laughing, but Bates was in earnest. Once I was stationed in Cork, sir, he said solemnly, and we had to stop a riot. It was then I learnt the real valley of a red-hot poker. It's as good as a bayonet any time. I've kept this one handy since Mr. Furneaux ran out. I do believe he saw a Chinaman. He did, and what is more, arrested him. Well, come on, Bates. There are not many hiding places in one of these flats. I only hope we find a celestial. It would be the fitting finale to a busy day. But their search was in vain though they succeeded in scaring Mrs. Bates badly. It was almost inconceivable that two such men, one a powerfully built athlete and the other an ex-soldier, should even imagine that any marauder could be secreted in a flat. But the European insensibly credits the Oriental with occult powers, and they took their task quite soberly. Singularly enough, it led to a discovery bearing directly on the problem of Mrs. Lester's death. Lending out of the kitchen was a narrow scullery, here a lift, worked by a wheel on the ground level, delivered coals by the sack and other heavy parcels. Thaden glanced at the sliding panel which gave access to the lift. Obviously, he seldom, if ever, visited this part of his domain, "'Can that thing be operated only from the ground?' he inquired. "'Oh, no, sir,' said Bates. "'I often pull it up when I want to lower the dustbin.' "'Can you do it now?' Bates looked surprised at first, then thoughtful. Thaden's words had suggested a new idea. He opened the panel, tugged vigorously at the rope, and soon the lift itself, a sort of large cupboard, open at the side, came into view. By gum, he muttered, gazing at its spacious depths. I never thought of that. You see what I'm driving at, then? Why, of course, sir. A moderate-sized man could stow away inside there and host himself to any floor. It'd be perfectly easy and safe as nails. A hundred weight of coal is nothing to it. I think we see now at least one method whereby the man who killed Mrs. Lester could have entered the flat without her knowledge. Not a doubt about it, sir. 
nearly noiseless, too. And if you heard it working, you'd imagine it was meant for the flat beneath, because there's a whistle to warn us when it's coming here. They surveyed the lift in silence for a little while. Then Bates caused it to descend again, and Thaden examined the rather flimsy device which fastened the panel. I'm not what you might describe as a nervous individual, he said at last. But it wouldn't be fair to your wife and yourself, Bates, if I didn't tell you I have just received an ugly reminder that the gang which killed Mrs. Lester has a grudge against me now. Wouldn't it be a reasonable thing if we drove a couple of screws into that door tonight? Bates stroked his chin. The long dormant spirit of combat kindled in his eye. Better still, sir, he grinned. Let's drive a screw into anyone who comes up in the lift. But how? By tying your pistol firmly to the dresser, putting it on a hair trigger. I know how to do that, of course. And letting it plug a bullet into the right place when the panel's half open. Are we justified in taking the law into our own hands? Is anyone justified in trying to get up here and cut our throats while we're asleep, sir? Thaden weighed the pros and cons of this thesis very carefully. He dreaded the possibility of taking a human life, even in self-defense. Yet, against the wretches who had strangled Edith Lester and coolly prepared to leave Mrs. Forbes to starve in an empty house until their revengeful scheme was perfected by full knowledge of the identity of every man in China who had assisted in the downfall of an effete monarchy, what code of conduct would apply, unless it were that which holds sway in the jungle? Couldn't we contrive matters so that, if the pistol were fired, it need not necessarily inflict a fatal wound, he said? Let's see what we can do, sir. And Bates set to work gleefully on the arrangements. There was not the slightest difficulty in devising an efficient means of pressing a trigger with a reduced pull by opening the door. Any schoolboy could adjust a piece of string to act unfailingly. By measuring distances and careful sighting of the pistol when fixed in position, they arrived at a line of fire which would strike a body crouched in the lift about the region of the right shoulder. Then Bates locked the scullery door, put the key in his pocket, and assured his trembling wife that she might sleep like a top, since no bloomin' Chinaman could get at her that night. Thaden himself retired soon afterwards. He was as tired as though he had been trudging steadily along country roads since daybreak. When he awoke, it was broad daylight. Around the corners of the drawn blinds in his bedroom, he could see strips of golden sunshine. Glancing at a clock on the mantelpiece, he was amazed to find that the hour was ten o'clock. So not only had there not been a raid on the premises, but Bates had taken the overnight instructions literally and allowed him to sleep far beyond the usual hour. He rose hurriedly, raced to the bathroom, and shouted for breakfast in fifteen minutes. He was splashing in his tub when the telephone bell rang, and Bates answered. Within a few seconds, the valet was knocking at the door. A Mr. Handyside has rung up, sir, was the announcement. I think he's an American. He wants to know if there is anything doing. He said you would understand. Tell him I'm alive and will call at his hotel at 11.30. Yes, sir. When Bates brought in the breakfast, Thaden was glancing hurriedly through the morning papers. Some of them contained an allusion to the Eastbourne incident, but no names were mentioned. A reference to developments 
in connection with the Innesmore Mansions murder, however, caught his eye. Appended to a brief account of the inquest were the following paragraphs. It may be taken as certain that the police are not altogether at sea as to the motive of this atrocious crime. Strange as it may seem, the victim being a young and attractive lady, living unostentatiously and taking little, if any, part in the social life of London, there is some probability that Mrs. Lester's death was the outcome of political revenge rather than an incident in an interrupted burglary. At first, every indication pointed to the act of some ghoul surprised by the unfortunate lady in her bedroom, but we have reason to believe that graver issues to the community at large will be revealed when Scotland Yard's inquiry is completed. It must not be forgotten that her husband died suddenly some six months ago, in Shanghai. Oddly enough, the police are now keeping a close surveillance on Chinese quarters in London, not only in the neighborhood of the docks, but in the fashionable West. It may or may not be a mere coincidence that a Chinaman was arrested yesterday at St. Albans and lodged in Bow Street. There are not wanting other similar coincidences in places so far apart as a well-known South Coast seaside resort and South Croydon. At present, the whole matter is nebulous, but striking developments may take place at any hour, and the murder of Mrs. Lester may yet figure as one of the most sensational crimes of recent years. Thaden was reading these discreet but exceedingly well-informed sentences with much care when he noticed that Bates had closed the sitting-room door before beginning to arrange the contents of the tray on the table. Such an unusual action meant something. "'Well, what is it now?' he inquired, lifting his eyes to the manservant's impassive face. When the milkman came this morning, sir, he told me that a policeman was found lying insensible on the road outside the mansions shortly after three o'clock, was the answer, conveyed in a low note that suggested a matter better kept from the cognizance of Mrs. Bates. That's a bad job for the policeman. It is nothing very remarkable otherwise, said Thaden. But the milkman heard he was set about by three swells, young gentlemen in evening dress, sir, who ran away when another constable appeared. Very likely there was a row, and the law got the worst of it. Anyhow, we were not disturbed during the night. No, sir, I was only thinking of what might have happened if the police were not on the job. Look here, Bates, and Thaden's manner was most emphatic. If you and I begin seeing shadows, we'll soon collect a fine show of Chinese ghosts. I'm astonished at you, a man who has been under fire. Sorry, sir, I thought you'd like to hear the lightest, that's all. Thaden ate a hearty breakfast thus proving that the marvels and portents of the previous day had not begun to undermine his constitution. Finding he had time, after attending to his correspondence, to walk to Handyside's hotel in the Strand, he did so. The American was waiting him at the end of a long, thin cigar. "'Any news?' said the Chicagoan after a cheerful greeting. Yes, the feud continues. You heard about those ivory skulls yesterday? Yes, sir. They reminded me of the tales of my youth. Well, I got mine last night. Here it is. Gee whiz. Handyside took the small object which Thaden produced from a waistcoat pocket. He examined it with minute care. I've never crossed the Pacific, 
he said, after apparently satisfying himself as to the exact nature of the unpleasant token. But one of my hobbies is the collection of ivories. In my home, 21,097 Park Avenue, interrupted Thaden. Just so, four doors short of 211th Street. Well, sir, when you blow in there, you'll see a room full of curios. I'm not exactly a connoisseur, but I know enough to tell Japanese work from Chinese. This was made by a Jap. And that reminds me, you said last night that Wang Li Fu put you off your balance by a jujitsu trick and handed that husky detective some, too. Very few chinks have ever even heard of jujitsu. I have a notion that a bunch of Japs is mixed up in this business. Surely not. It's possible. You good people here are crazy in your treatment of the Japanese. You think they're civilized because they dress in good shape and can put up a mighty spry imitation of Western ways. But they ain't. They're the greatest menace to Europe that has yet to come up on the tape. Do you believe they want China to wake up and organize before they're ready to take hold? No, sir. Anyhow, that skull was carved by a Japanese artist, and a bully good one at that. The two were standing near the fireplace of a square and spacious foyer. There were plenty of people in the place, some conversing with friends, others writing or doing business at the various bureaus. It chanced that Thaden faced the two swing doors which led to the street, and he was returning the bit of ivory to his pocket, when, somewhat to his surprise, Fernot entered. The detective saw him, too, of that he was quite certain, but ignored him completely. After one sharp, comprehensive glance around, as though he were seeking someone who was not visible, the little man went to a desk, scribbled a note, handed it in at the inquiry office, walked swiftly in the direction of an anteroom and restaurant, and disappeared forthwith. Thaden was puzzled by Fernot's behavior, but was quick to perceive that if the latter had not wished to be left alone, he would at least have made some sign of recognition. A page approached Mr. Handyside. Note for you, sir, he said. The American opened the envelope and read a few lines, scribbled on a sheet of note paper. He passed it to Thaden. The circus is now about to commence, he said, and the meaning of this enigmatical remark was made clear when Thaden saw what was written. Dear sir, it ran, take Mr. Thaden to your room. I'll join you there immediately. C. F. Furneau. If this is the little sleuth who was missing yesterday, I guess we've gotten our call, commented Handyside, with an amused grin at the expression of bewilderment on his companion's face. I was just about to tell you that Furneau had come in and crossed the hall. Well, let's beat it to the third floor. I have the key in my pocket. They were walking through a long corridor when Furneaux appeared at the other end. Beyond the three men, not another person was visible in that part of the hotel, and in a few seconds they were behind the closed door of Handyside's room. "'So you're still on the map?' said the detective, surveying Thaden with an air of professional interest. "'Yes,' But I have received a notice to quit, was the retort. So I hear. The executioner was quick on the heels of the warrant, too. If it had not been for the precautions Winter took last night, the newsboys would have been bawling a second in his Moore Mansion's tragedy during the past couple of hours. Thaden smiled. 
I'm not joking, snapped Furno. In fact, I feel rather bad about it. I woke up at eight o'clock and pictured you and Bates and his wife lying about in number 18 in very uncomfortable and ungainly attitudes. I was so worried and miserable that I telephoned your hall porter to learn the worst, and was quite astonished when he said that Bates had just been chatting with him. You don't understand, of course. I forgot to tell you about the lift. Wong Li Fu's special delegate climbed into number 17 by that means, and three of them would have reached you last night in the same way if a policeman hadn't met them in the street. My man heard about the row. He guessed, too, that it had something to do with us. The policeman was badly injured, he was told. Yes, nothing broken. He was put to sleep by some confounded Japanese wrestling trick. Japanese, you say? Precisely. The young Manchus are being backed up by a second gang, which calls itself the Sons of Nippon. I don't know what London is coming to. We've entertained anarchists, nihilists, and dynamite hearts for years. Now we have the yellow peril with us. I wish I were king for a few days. There would be a bigger clearance of reptiles out of England than St. Patrick made in Ireland. Mr. Handyside here told me only ten minutes since that he was convinced there were Japs in league with the Chinese. How did you know? And Furno whirled around on the American instantly. By using the gray matter at the back of my head, was the reply. No chink ever taught Wang Li Fu how to put away two chesty individuals like Mr. Thaden and your partner, Mr. Winter. But I couldn't be sure till I'd seen the ivory skull. Then I knew. So did I know yesterday morning, said Furno. And a deuce of a time the discovery gave me. Anyhow, the street fight outside Innsmore's mansions at daybreak today settles the matter. There were two Japanese and one Chinaman. The Japs outed the policeman. Fortunately, he and another man made a five-minute point at each end of the mansions, and as number one failed to turn up, Number two went to look for him. He saw the end of the row and ran to help, blowing his whistle for assistance. Unfortunately for us, two of the three confounded blackguards escaped. Oh, you've got one, then? cried Thayden. Yes, a Jap. The constable was wise enough to give him the point of his truncheon in the gullet, and that settled him. I wonder if he is the one who would have been shot had he broken into my flat, said Thaden musingly. Shot? Man alive, you'd never have heard him. Not till he had a bullet lodged securely in his inside. It is true. Bates and I surveyed that lift last night, Mr. Furneaux, and regarded it as the weak part of our defenses. So we arranged that an automatic pistol should live up to its name and fire at anyone who opened the sliding panel. Did you now, said Furno admiringly, whose brainy idea was that, yours or Bates's? A joint effort, he said with a self-satisfied smile. Well, I'm glad it didn't come off. British law is a fearsome and wonderful thing. You might both have got ten years for fixing a man-trap to it, a lethal engine. However, during the next few days, you're going to change your abode. Tell Bates and his wife that they need a holiday and ought to visit relatives in Yorkshire or North Wales. Pack what you need for a week at least, and make straight for Fortescue Square. Are you joking? said Thaden, genuinely astounded. 
Do I look it? And indeed the detective did not. Winter has just settled that program with Mr. Forbes. You see, you're in this affair now, neck and crop, and it's easier for us to safeguard one place than two. You're pleased, aren't you? Doesn't a pretty girl live there? Sir, said Handyside, he's tickled to death, and that's a fact. I'm the only one to make a kick. I kind of reckoned on being allowed to play a walking-on part in this drama, but I look like being cut out in the new shuffle. I can make good use of you, said Furno promptly. You've seen Wong Li Fu and would know him again? Yes, sir. And you can tell a Japanese from a Chinaman at sight? Yes, sir. Good. You're enrolled. Next thing, you'll be receiving an ivory skull, too. These beggars are the smartest crowd I've come across in twenty years. I think they would have beaten us if it hadn't happened that Mr. Thaden and you, each of you strangers to the Forbes family, were selected by fate to intervene at psychological moments. The young Manchus and their allies had the ground surveyed thoroughly. They even had us of the yard marked down. Oh, it's a plot and a half, I can assure you. And the worst thing is that the real struggle is yet ahead. All that has happened before is mere skirmishing compared with what's to come. Is that why you covered up your tracks, even in this hotel, before you came to my room? inquired Handyside. It is, and let me tell you that you're a living example of a contradiction in terms. You use your brains, Mr. Handyside, yet you smoke a cigar calculated to atrophy the keenest intellect. You, an American, chewing a vile Burmese cheroot. Crénon de pipe. When this bubble has burst, I must reason with you. End of chapter 13